you look before you launch. If you have one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, you would have a public crisis. Space Tourism, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Listen to the My Life of Crime podcast with me, Erin Moriarty. We aim every night to be factual and fair. That's our goal. Everyone Sunday morning, actor Kirsten Dunst, plus Wayne Brady on Broadway, and a beloved cherry tree named Stumpy. Hey there, friends. Thanks for joining us here on CBS News. We appreciate you spending some of your day with us. I'm Errol Barnett. Let's make it count. Here's a look at the top stories we're tracking for you right now. Key inflation numbers head in the wrong direction, prompting fears interest rates will not be cut anytime soon. President Biden welcomes the Prime Minister of Japan for an official state visit with one of the country's most important allies. And the EPA unveils the first ever national safety standard to keep drinking water free of potentially dangerous chemicals. Also coming up for you all later this hour, former exchange student Amanda Knox, remember her? Well, she faces a new trial in Italy years after her murder conviction was thrown out. We'll break down this latest case and whether it will be the end of her ongoing legal troubles. And abortion rights move front and center in the 2024 campaign. How a ruling from Arizona Supreme Court is having ripple effects all over the country. We start with this. President Biden is hosting his Japanese counterpart in Washington today for a critical state visit. The arrival ceremony for Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida happened on the south lawn of the White House, as you see here, this morning. Shortly after the Japanese leader's arrival, he sat down with the president for a meeting in the Oval Office. President Biden said the alliance between the U.S. and Japan has, quote, never been stronger. Today, I look forward to discussing how we can even deepen it more, <laughs> including increasing defense and then technology and cooperation across the board. CBS News White House reporter Willie James Inman has more on this for us. Willie, great to see you. We know President Biden and the Japanese Prime Minister are expected to discuss a wide variety of topics today, including during um, uh, press availability, the military partnership, space, education. Uh, what can you tell us about what we should expect to hear? Hey there, Errol. Good to be with you. Well, there are over there are some 70 deliverables, the White House says, that will be announced during this official visit and uh, this state dinner that the president is hosting the prime minister of Japan for. Uh, and I'll just take through a few of those major items that we're going to see. They will include increased military cooperation with Japan producing some of those military goods as well. Now, they'll work behind the scenes to uh, come up with a plan for that. The Secretary of Defense will be heavily involved in that particular piece of this announcement. There will also be increased university and research and exchange opportunities for students. On top of that, a major lunar agreement that would call for a Japanese astronaut being on a U.S.-led moon mission, a mission to the moon. So that mm -hmm. will be an interesting part of this agreement and this announcement that we anticipate. And one of the things I thought was very interesting and is, of course, of interest to folks here in Washington, D.C., perhaps around the world who travel here for those the, to see those cherry blossom trees, uh, there will be some saplings that Japan will provide to the United States to replace hundreds of cherry blossom trees that are on and along the National Mall. In fact, the Prime Minister of Japan, he'll participate in a tree planting ceremony while he's here visiting Washington, D.C. as well. So a lot on the plate and a lot to talk about during this press conference that's happening in the next couple of hours, Errol. All right, so everything from deliverables to, you know, symbolic um, uh, uh, displays of cooperation. Talk to us, though, about what's happening in the background of these conversations, the role China is playing in this visit. Yeah, China is really the elephant in the room. In fact, uh, there'll be a meeting between uh, President Joe Biden, Prime Minister Kishida, and also President Marcos of the Philippines. They'll have the first trilateral, trilateral meeting between those three leaders on Thursday. And a U.S. official essentially said that China remains a top concern, but also that the hostility would not deter the Philippines. There have been some incursions in the South China Sea, some maritime uh, incursions between the Chinese vessels and Philippine vessels, and they want to make sure that that not only does that not happen, but they stop that from happening in the future. And that's certainly been a top concern for not only Philippine officials, but U.S. officials as well. They want to make sure that everybody is peaceful 
along the South China Sea. That's been a top concern for U.S. officials here. I anticipate that'll be something that they will talk about fiercely during that trilateral meeting that's happening on Thursday. And yet again, another reason for the U.S. to not only uh, talk about China, but also to talk about the peaceful uh, coexistence of its allies in countering Chinese actions in the South China Sea. All right, a lot of interesting things to come both today and this week. Willie James Inman, thank you. And we should let our viewers know that President Biden and the Japanese Prime Minister will hold a press conference jointly uh, later this hour. And of course, we will take you there live as soon as it begins. President Biden is stepping up his criticism of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's approach to the ongoing war with Hamas. He told CBS News contributor Enrique Acevedo there needs to be total access to food and medicine in Gaza. The president also said he disagrees with Israel's operations in the enclave, calling it a, quote, mistake. Do you think at this point Prime Minister Netanyahu is more concerned about his political survival than he is in the national interest of his people? What I will tell you is I think what he's doing is a mistake. I don't agree with his approach. I think it's outrageous that those four or three vehicles were hit by drones and taken out on a highway where it wasn't like it was along the shore. It wasn't like there was a convoy moving here, et cetera. So I, what I'm calling for is for the Israelis to just call for a ceasefire allow for the next six, eight weeks total access to all food and medicine going into the country. Vice President Harris met with the families of American hostages being held by Hamas yesterday. Keep this in mind, they've been in captivity in Gaza for more than six months. All right, this hits your pocketbook. The latest Consumer Price Index report shows inflation is running hotter than expected. The Labor Department says prices rose 3.5% year over year in March. They're up nearly half a percent from the month before. In a statement, President Biden notes inflation is still much lower than its peak, but he says there's more work to do to lower costs. CBS News senior business and tech correspondent Joe Link Kent joins us now from our Los Angeles bureau to speak about all of this. And what I appreciate, Joe Ling, is that you join us with a smile while you report on information, which reflects that people are frowning as they realize that these increasing prices are really making stuff uh, expensive. But what's driving the price increases we're all feeling? Yeah, more than half of what we're seeing in this hotter than expected inflation is driven by gas prices and rent. That is the harsh reality. So even though inflation remains below 4%, it is well above the 2% target that the Federal Reserve is looking to when it comes to deciding if and when they're going to cut rates later this year. At the last Fed meeting, it was telegraphed that we'd get three rate cuts, right? And now when you have hotter than expected inflation, you can expect a re-evaluation at the Fed in Washington as to what they're going to do. Now, inflation across the board has been really stubborn and sticky. That is the fundamental problem. In fact, if you look at some of the most persistent high cost items, their monthly expenses. We're talking about auto insurance. Over the last year, if you've been feeling it, you're not wrong. It's been up 22.2% overall from just a year ago. So even though the Biden administration is saying, look, we're off the peaks of 9% inflation in 2022, prices are still going up and they're still going up by 3.5%. And that really hurts people in their pocketbooks, Errol. And it's important that you point to things like car insurance. These are must-haves. You can't choose not to uh, be covered. Yeah. I know that you've been looking at how it impacts what folks can buy in the grocery store, now having to make more difficult decisions about what they can and cannot purchase. How is this changing what people can afford? Yeah, so we wanted to not just look at the last year, but the last five years. And mm. so we got some great data from Nielsen IQ looking at what groceries cost pre-pandemic in the year leading up to 2020 and then now post-pandemic, yeah. right? And so if you take that five-year horizon, you take a look at a $100 grocery budget, say you're spending that on your you're targeting and you're trying to spend that on your family every week. Well, Five years ago, a $100 grocery budget would buy you about 30-some items. I can go into the details of what those are if you want. But you fast forward five years. To spend $100, you'd then have to subtract 33%, about 10 items out of your grocery bag. And we're talking about taking out big items like milk, chicken, cereal, bread, and 
four or six other items to hit and stick with your $100 budget. So even though food inflation isn't as bad as it was in 2022, perhaps 2023, it's still incredibly expensive and prices are going up just at a slower rate, but it still means that prices are going up. And so we don't expect prices ever to come back down, so to speak, unless there's a major economic event. But when you're talking about groceries, and as you point out, car insurance, 90% of Americans own a car. So you have to have car insurance. Not to mention repairs are up. Elder care, if you're caring for an elderly person, is up way over 10% over the last year. These are major costs that are taking huge amounts of money out of your paycheck. And even even though wage growth does outpace inflation by some, it is still a very significant crunch that you're feeling when you're paying for your monthly expenses, Errol. Yeah, no, so well put. So viewers at home can know that while it's painful, misery loves company. We're all feeling it. Jolene <sighs> Kent, thanks for breaking it down for us. Appreciate it. Thanks, you. Errol. All right, another wave of severe weather right now is sweeping through parts of the south and the Mississippi Valley. Look at that. This will continue throughout the afternoon. In fact, we have some video to show you from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, harsh thunderstorms there, downing trees and utility poles. That's happening beneath the radar images you're seeing. Some homes have been destroyed, and while around thousands of people in Mississippi uh, at this moment also are without power. This is quite serious. CBS News correspondent Tom Hansen is covering the storm in Jackson, Mississippi, getting soaked. Tom, what else are you feeling and seeing on the ground there? Errol, this storm has been powerful and fast moving. You know, I flew through this storm, in fact, last night as I was getting into Jackson. It tossed our plane around like a toy. Now we are seeing some of the impacts on the ground. I want you to take a look around me. You can see that there are downed power lines, something that is happening in many neighborhoods across Jackson. You can see the yards here littered with branches. And then take a look at this house. A massive tree fell on this house, essentially splitting the house in two. Now, we've talked with emergency management here in Jackson. They say that they are watching the Pearl River very closely. The primary concern here, of course, is flooding. Elsewhere, the concern are those powerful tornadoes that we have already seen, one overnight in Houston that leveled a church, and then another tornado in Louisiana. So this storm is packing a punch, certainly nothing to balk at. Errol? Yeah, and with those down power lines, uh also provide a danger. We want everyone to remain safe, including you and the crew there. We know the power is out, but how long will folks in this part of the country experience this severe weather, Tom? We are nowhere near out of the woods just yet. This storm system is expected to last throughout the day, possibly into the night. And if you zoom out, just to get a context of how powerful this storm system is and how much of a concern there should be, if you look at the Torcon map, there is a large portion of pink in southern Louisiana, southern Alabama, Mississippi, uh, and that is a level seven. That basically means that there is a very strong likelihood of tornadoes, not just in that area that is pink, but also in a 50-mile radius surrounding that area. Officials are urging people not to go out in this storm and to seek shelter if there is a tornado on the ground. We've already seen other precautions being taken. Louisiana closing all state offices today, and schools here in Jackson are remote. So people are taking this storm very seriously, Errol, and we are certainly nowhere near out of the woods just yet. All right, great warning there, Tom. We want everyone there to stay safe. Thank you very much. Still to come for you here on CBS News, six former Mississippi officers received new sentences in state court for the brutal beating of two black men. We'll discuss the punishments that were just handed down. And the EPA has unveiled the first of its kind regulation aimed at making water safer to drink. We'll walk you through the new standards and the risks they're designed to reduce. Stay right there. You're streaming CBS News. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. Does this carrier strike group stand ready? It's just incredible to see there's an active search and rescue operation going on 12 hours after this accident. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell.
I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm gonna use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. People with developmental disabilities were once sequestered by the hundreds of thousands in institutions. Many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because lack of attention, lack of imagination, lack of uh, adequate manpower. Disability activists have since torn down barriers blocking them from living at home or in the community. We conclude that Title II of the ADA requires states to provide community-based treatment for persons with mental disabilities. But of the 16,000 people who remain in state-operated institutions, half are in five states, and Illinois is one of them. I don't want to live in the institution. It makes me feel discriminated against. Do you think there are people living in institutions in Illinois that don't need to be living there? Yeah, because they're proving it as soon as they get out. Right now, House Republicans are inching towards another potential speaker battle. Representative Marjorie Taylor Green, Marjorie Taylor Green, excuse me, posted on social media this morning that she's still looking to oust House Speaker Mike Johnson. Green is rebuking Johnson for working with Democrats on passing a bill to avoid a partial government shutdown last month. CBS News congressional correspondent Nicole Killian joins us from Capitol Hill. You're following every aspect of this. Nicole, how much support uh, does Congresswoman Green really have to vacate the speaker? Well, it remains to be seen. Republicans met for their weekly conference meeting, and some of them did say that they didn't necessarily feel that there was an appetite to move forward, that it was a mistake to oust uh, Speaker McCarthy last fall. Of course, those were more uh, Mark McCarthy allies speaking, but even those who supported the motion to vacate uh, last fall against McCarthy, uh, lawmakers, for instance, like Congressman Nancy Mace, uh, also uh, telling reporters this week that they don't think that uh, this is the right time to try to move to oust Speaker Johnson. That being said, Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, says that she still uh, has this motion at her disposal. She wouldn't outline if there's any kind of red line, per se, that would trigger her to bring this motion up. We do know that she is meeting with Speaker Johnson today, and the Speaker also addressed the status of their relationship. Take a listen. She's a colleague. I've always considered her a friend. Marjorie and I don't disagree, I don't, I don't think, on any matter of uh, philosophy. Um, we're both conservatives, you know, but uh, we do disagree sometimes on, on strategy. So the speaker, you know, putting some distance between this motion to vacate, uh, not letting it him not letting it stop him from uh, proceeding with his job and defending, you know, passing that appropriations package uh, before the Easter recess, which is in part what triggered Marjorie Taylor Greene to bring up this potential motion in the first place. And on another topic, Nicole, House Republicans delayed sending Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas's impeachment articles to the Senate. What's happening there? 
Well, this was really a matter of trying to allow some more time for the Senate to consider this. Of course, many Senate Republicans have been pushing for a trial, although Leader Chuck Schumer has made clear that he wants to resolve this issue quickly and he doesn't believe that impeachment is the vehicle to resolve what he believes are policy differences uh, with respect to a Republican's position uh, against uh, Secretary Mayorkas. But uh, Speaker Johnson's office did issue a statement uh, late yesterday saying that they decided to put this on hold until next week so that the Senate does have adequate time to uh, do its constitutional duty. So uh, we do expect at some point next week that this process will move forward. But probably, uh, to put it bluntly on the part of Utah Senator uh, Mike Lee, he suggested that it probably wasn't wise to bring forward these articles on a Wednesday leading into a Thursday when senators are trying to get out of town and maybe subject to jet fumes intoxication. Of course, you know, that smell of jet fumes is always a quick um, accelerant to uh, lawmakers eager to get out of town. And so by bringing it up next week, the hope is that they can really uh, be very deliberate about their consideration of these articles when they're brought over from the House. Very interesting point that, Nicole. Uh, we understand that Secretary Mayorkas is actually on Capitol Hill today testifying about border funding and other major issues our viewers care about. What, what are we hearing from him? Yeah, well, this is part of the annual hearings or set of hearings around appropriations and the budget for President Biden and the Department of Homeland Security. So uh, the secretary is appearing before subcommittees, both uh, in the House Appropriations and Senate uh, Appropriations subcommittees. But he continues to make the argument that it really is up to Congress to fix what he believes is a broken immigration system. And he continues to defend uh, the administration's policies around this, despite uh, this uh, looming article of impeachment and potential trial that the Senate could consider. You know, he has previously said that he's going to keep politics out of this and focus on his job, but uh, he did stress the importance of, of the budget being fully funded so that uh, they can make more uh, advances and progress at the border, but ultimately he said that it's up to Congress to act. All right, Nicole Killian with all the latest for us on Capitol Hill. Nicole, thank you. You bet. Former exchange student Amanda Knox is on trial once again in Italy, this time for slander. She's charged with wrongly accusing a Congolese man of murdering her roommate back in 2007. Now, you may remember Knox was convicted for that murder and uh, served four years in prison for being, before being exonerated. During her interrogation, Knox pointed the finger at the owner of the bar where she worked. She later recanted that claim in a note she wrote the following afternoon. CBS News foreign correspondent Chris Livesay joins us now from Rome with the latest on this. Chris, I think I've basically tried to give the broad brush strokes, but explain better in detail what this trial is really about. Hey, Earl. Yeah, you know, you have to remember this happened when Amanda Knox was just 20 years old. Uh, she barely spoke Italian at the time. She was living in Perugia on, on a college a study abroad program. Just imagine the circumstances. She finds out that her housemate, her, her roommate, has been murdered. And then after sleepless nights, she has to give testimony. And then in the midst of that testimony, speaking in very broken Italian, sometimes without an official interpreter on hand, she wrongly accuses somebody, uh, putting them at the scene of the crime who absolutely was not there. But that person still had to spend two weeks under arrest as a result of that accusation. So this is what this case is all about. She was found guilty of slandering this other person. Now is an opportunity for her to finally clear her name and, and set the record straight as she sees it and show the circumstances that she was under. At the time she issued, there was a four page statement that was taken by police, but that's since been ruled inadmissible because of those circumstances. Now she has an opportunity to submit a 20 page letter that she's written herself, we can only presume in perfect Italian, because she was able to perfect her Italian in the four years that she had to spend in prison. I bet. And that's a really interesting uh, detail. We know that Knox is not in court for this. What do we know about how she's living her life now? Yeah, you know, so ever since then, she's 
been able to pull the pieces of her life back together and, uh, you know, start a family. She's married. She has two children. She's 36 years old. And today she works mostly as an advocate, uh, specifically for people who are caught up in the same types of circumstances that she was, you know, wrong people who have been wrongly accused or people who have been victims of forced confessions. Um, you know, she's also spoken out about this at length. Uh, she has made a podcast. Uh, she continues to work on a podcast with her husband. Uh, she's also made uh, a series on a meditation app where she talks about resilience. So she's definitely not gone anywhere. She seems to have turned this massive setback into something that gives her more and more energy to move forward and turn it into a strength. And perhaps next she'll do a language translation app. Who knows? Uh, Chris Livesay, appreciate the update on this. Thank you very much. Coming up for you all, an Idaho teen is facing a judge today after he was arrested by the FBI for allegedly planning to commit multiple terror attacks. We'll discuss what officials found when they searched his home. And Arizona's governor's calling on lawmakers to repeal a 160-year-old near-total abortion ban just hours after the state Supreme Court said it could be enforced. What does this all mean? We'll look at the political fallout and what this will change about this year's elections. You're streaming CBS News. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Nate has one of the quickest minds I've ever seen. Tony has a way of making people feel comfortable. Gail has this unbelievable knack to ask the question that you're asking at home. I've been told I could talk to a tree, and that's pretty much true. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. It didn't seem like anything could happen because nothing ever happens in East Palestine, but it did. Authorities released toxic fumes from five derailed train cars. Resident, please evacuate. Acute bronchitis due to chemical fumes. Did you ever have these problems before the derailment? No, ma'am. This neighborhood's not safe no more. We can assure the community that there's not vinyl chloride entering their communities. Then why are there so many people feeling these various symptoms of bloody noses or difficulty breathing and bronchitis? That's a hard question to answer. We're talking about one of the most blatant releases of a mixture of some of the most toxic chemicals that we've seen in America. I feel like now I have a duty to warn other communities. If my daughter has to watch me die of cancer, at least it saves someone else. This case. It's like a screenplay, something straight out of Hollywood. But it's not fiction. It's 48 hours. Human remains found this week. Four families shattered. There's no physical evidence. The mystery would haunt investigators for years. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Get it, it! Like a John Grisham novel. A gripping true crime original, 48 Hours, now streaming on the free CBS News app. This is CBS. of a lifetime. Seeing the Earth from space, it was so exhilarating. But the risks that come with the territory. There have been four fatal accidents. That's a 1% fatal accident rate. Might make you look before you launch. If you had one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, would have a public crisis. Space Tourism, now streaming on the free CBS News app.
All right, friends, welcome back to CBS News. I'm Errol Barnett. Here's a recap of the top stories we're tracking for you right now. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is at the White House today for an official state visit with President Biden. The White House calls Japan the pivotal member of the Quad. That's the nickname for the informal alliance between the US, Japan, Australia, and India. High-level talks this afternoon will be followed by a formal state dinner at the White House tonight. A New York judge sentenced former Trump CFO Alan Weisselberg to five months behind bars for perjury. He admitted to lying while testifying on behalf of the former president in the company's civil fraud trial. Weisselberg served 100 days in prison last year for tax evasion. Consumer inflation rose higher than expected. The CPI is up uh, less than half a percent from last month, but it also rose three and a half percent from this time last year. Experts say the stubborn rise in prices may prompt the Federal Reserve to hold off on plans to begin lowering interest rates this year. The Environmental Protection Agency has issued groundbreaking regulations designed to make drinking water safer for people all over the United States. Now, the agency is requiring public water utilities to test for six different types of substances known as PFAS to reduce people's exposure to them in drinking water. PFAS, also commonly known as forever chemicals, are found in a wide variety of products. And that's despite a growing body of research demonstrating their negative health effects on all of us. This new effort marks the first ever national regulations for PFAS in drinking water. These new standards really are a breakthrough because what they do is they will address six of these forever toxic chemicals, um, six of the ones that we know are pretty common and are extremely toxic. So by regulating those, EPA's estimate is that as many as 105 million people have these chemicals in their water right now. That stuff is getting into people's bodies and is threatening their health. CBS News senior national and environmental correspondent Ben Tracy joins us now to dive into this historic announcement. And Ben, I feel like there's two reactions to this. On one side, it sounds like an encouraging development that we're better protected. But on the other side, it's only six of these so-called forever chemicals. Help us understand why they're so dangerous and how long they really do last. So these are really incredibly strong man-made chemicals. They're resistant to heat and water and oil and dirt. And that makes them great for all the products that they're used in. You saw some of those products up on the screen. It's everything from nonstick cookware to water-resistant clothing. But the problem is they're very hard to break down. They can last for thousands of years in the environment. And they have been linked to serious health issues. Everything from, you know, liver damage and immune system damage to certain forms of cancer and then developmental issues with children. So that is the concern that this stuff is in the water supply that nearly 2 million, um, 200 million Americans are drinking. And how exactly, Ben, will the EPA try to enforce these regulations? Well, these are legally enforceable. Basically, water, public water utilities around the country are going to have to make changes to comply with these new rules. They have some time to do it. They have about three years to monitor their water system, find out how much PFAS is actually in their system, report that to the public, make that public so people know what they're drinking, and then they get about two years to comply with these rules. So they're going to have to install equipment to basically bring those levels down if they exceed these new EPA rules to the levels that would comply. And as I mentioned, and as we spoke about coming into this, uh, the EPA is restricting the use of a total of six uh, PFASs in, in drinking water. But what, there are more than 15,000 of these kinds of chemicals. So how significant from your point of view, Ben, on reporting on environmental and climate issues, how significant are these regulations specifically? It's still really significant. Yes, you hear six versus the 15,000, but the reason they're focusing on those six are those are the six that are really toxic. Those are the ones that are causing the really significant health issues and ones that have found to be prevalent in drinking water systems. So the thought is by going after those and forcing these systems to reduce those to near zero levels that you really will mitigate some of the health risks uh, that currently exist. And for folks watching who, you know, want to follow better guidance and reduce their risk and exposure to any type of forever chemicals, what would you recommend? Well, we got to be honest, this is this is not easy. I mean, this is not as simple as, you know, running your water through a Brita filter at your house or something like that. You'd have to install basically a reverse osmosis system 
the kind of thing that goes underneath your sink. It costs a lot of money. So what EPA is doing is they're saying we would rather do this at the utility level. So you folks at home, when you turn on your tap, you don't have to worry about it. You can actually trust what is coming out of there. So some of that technology will be installed at these water treatment plants. And therefore, you wouldn't have to worry about it as much when it comes out of your tap. All right. It'll take some time for this to kick in, but at least it seems like a step in the right direction. Ben Tracy, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Errol. An 18-year-old who was arrested for allegedly plotting a terror attack on churchgoers in the name of ISIS is appearing in court today. Alexander Scott Mercurio was arrested Saturday. The FBI says he intended to carry out deadly attacks on multiple churches across his hometown the next day. According to court documents, he was planning to die while killing others using makeshift flamethrowers, a machete, and other weapons that were found in his home. Authorities took the suspect into custody just days after federal law enforcement warned of potential threats to public gatherings in the U.S., and that included, at the time, houses of worship. Six Mississippi law enforcement officers who tortured and abused two black men learned their sentences in their state courses to, uh, court cases today. The members of the so-called Goon Squad receive sentences ranging from 15 to 45 years. They'll serve those concurrently with the federal prison sentences they received last month. If you remember, I was in Jackson, Mississippi, reporting on that. The attack happened in January of last year after a white person called a deputy to complain. Two black men were staying with a white woman. The six former officers tortured and humiliated the men with various objects. We want to report on a new study it found some of the nation's largest employers may be biased in their hiring practices. Coming up next, what experts say can be done to address discrimination. You're streaming CBS News. Washington is the seat of power. Um, national security, foreign policy, global economics, every story comes through Washington in some way. We bring some of the most powerful voices in America to the table. We don't just ask the questions, you have to go deeper. We try to understand what's at the heart of the issue we're talking about to then come forward with solutions. Face the Nation on CBS. The justices ruled that Harvard and the University of North Carolina violated the Constitution. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to end affirmative action in college admissions, uncertainty sets in for some students of color. Affirmative action really gave us an equal opportunity. CBS Reports explores the historic decision and what it means for those chasing an opportunity to change their lives. I knew that college was the ticket to break this cycle. The end of affirmative action, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Okay, let's go. You guys good? Hey. All right, we good? Keep going. It's the clock, it's ticking. Off we go. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. <laughs> it's time for 60 Minutes, Sundays on CBS. An original documentary from CBS Reports. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever. Curing diseases, scientific breakthroughs, making lives better. They can help us with medical discovery, scientific discoveries, doing better agriculture, having cures for things like Alzheimer's. It's also going to really transform the way we work. The uplifting potential of artificial intelligence is limitless. It gives you a friend, somebody to chat with 24-7 that is non-judgmental. He makes me feel loved and desired. And so are its downfalls. The problem with all this AI is that it's unpredictable and uncontrollable. The choices we make now will have lasting effects for decades, maybe even centuries. The ChatGPT revolution, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We are about to see American weapons in the hands of Mexican cartels. A gun pipeline to Mexico. We are arming the cartels. 100%, no doubt about it. Happening right under our noses. Uh, who's doing something about this? Nobody. A CBS Reports exclusive. Most Americans have no idea that we are effectively arming the enemy next door. This is the story the American people need to know. Arming cartels, now streaming on the free CBS News app. 
America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides, Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Officials in Chicago have released body cam video that shows officers firing 96 times at a driver who they pulled over. We have to give you a warning here. This video is disturbing. Initial evidence from an independent investigation shows the driver, a 26-year-old named Dexter Reed, fired the first shot. Reed was killed and one officer was injured. The plainclothes officer says they'd stop Reed on suspicion of not wearing a seatbelt. Reed's family is calling for charges to be filed. Chicago's mayor says the footage is deeply disturbing. I'm personally devastated to see yet another young black man lose his life during an interaction with the police. I've also been praying for the full recovery of the officer who was shot during this interaction. Now, the Chicago Fraternal Order of Police has not responded to CBS News's request for comment on this. Exit polls are suggesting South Korea's liberal opposition could win today's parliamentary election by a landslide. South Korean media reports the opposition is forecasted to win 197 seats in the 300-member National Assembly. Now, this would be a major blow to South Korea's conservative president, essentially making him a lame duck for his remaining three years in office. Arizona's governor is calling on the state legislature to repeal a near-total abortion ban. The state Supreme Court ruled yesterday that a law put on the books way back in 1864, which makes the procedure illegal unless the mother's life is in danger, can be enforced. CBS News' Natalie Brand reports on the fallout. Abortion access in Arizona is in limbo after the state's conservative Supreme Court reinstated a 19th century law banning nearly all abortions. While a lower court reviews the law's constitutionality, the state's Democratic governor is blasting the ruling. This is a devastating decision that will have huge consequences. Governor Katie Hobbs is calling on the state legislature to repeal the ban first enacted in 1864 before Arizona even became a state. They could uh, gavel in today and make a motion to repeal this ban, and they should do that. I'm hopeful that they will. The 4-2 decision overrides Arizona's current 15-week ban and the court warned that all abortions except those necessary to save a woman's life are illegal with doctors facing a two to five year prison sentence. Today's decision should be celebrated and we're very hopeful that voters will recognize that life is a human right. Arizona is a critical battleground in the presidential race. Within hours of the decision, the Biden campaign boosted ad spending there and the vice president will visit later this week. To stop bans like this, we need a United States Congress that will restore the protections of Roe v. Wade. Monday, former President Donald Trump released a video statement saying abortion limits should be up to the states. The states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law. Back in Arizona, Planned Parenthood says it will continue to provide abortion services up to 15 weeks for a short period of time. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Washington. All right, let's get you something that hopefully makes you smile. Many across the country will remember Monday's total solar eclipse as one of the highlights of their lives. But for one Texas family, another event happened that day that easily outshone the eclipse. We'll explain. You're streaming CBS News. to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. <laughs> and reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Multiple to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Right. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. 
this moment, terrorists could be plotting another attack. 9-11 triggered a counter-terrorist system that included a secret database. This person needs a closer look. A growing list of nearly 2 million people, including some Americans who say they're innocent. For one hour flight, I have to spend six hours to go and come back. CBS Reports explores the system, the people responsible for it, and those pushing for change. I'm not fighting against them. I'm fighting for them to do the right thing. The Watch List, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Don't miss true crime anytime you want, anywhere you go. With the 48 Hours Podcast. Real crimes, real lives, real justice. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Listen to 48 Hours on Apple Podcasts. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Imagine yourself in Manhattan with no police, no army, no mayor. The people of Haiti stare down poverty, corruption, natural disasters, and violence. 90% of the guns that are used by gangs in Haiti are American guns. But with an unbreakable spirit and eternal optimism. There are days where I cry, but we can't be discouraged. We still believe in Haiti. They're still able to look ahead with hope. Haiti is on the brink of transformation, a radical shift. Haitians are coming together and saying things must change. Fighting for Haiti, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Everybody wakes up in the morning and they are pelted with alerts that frighten them, news that agitates them. With this show, we have the time to explain what's going on. These migrants, they've been released. Explain the status that allows them to be released, to slow things down a little bit. What are the big sets of questions for China and its ambitions? Hackers are stepping up their attacks to extort victims. Let's start with easy. Who's attacking? Here's a deeper understanding of what's happening. Prime Time with John Dickerson. Stream on the free CBS News app. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. On our places, bright, shiny faces. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. Welcome to our CBS Sports HQ studios. I'm Brandon Baylor, and this is your news in 90. We start in the NBA with Milwaukee Bucks star Giannis Antetokounmpo had to leave last night's win over the Celtics with a calf injury. The two-time MVP went down the third quarter without a contact injury there, but was helped off the floor in the third quarter. And some good news, Giannis avoided damage to his left Achilles, according to multiple reports. Elsewhere, the Golden State Warriors, boy, a season-high 26 three-pointers overwhelming the Lakers, 134 to 120, moving with half a game when it comes to L.A. for that ninth spot and also in that play-in realm in the West. The Warriors shot just over 63% from beyond the arc, the highest single-game percentage in NBA history with a minimum of 40 shots. In college hoops, Stanford's women's basketball coach Tara Vanderveer is stepping down after 38 years on the bench here at Palo Alto. Vanderveer is a three-time NCAA champion, a five-time National Coach of the Year, and guided the Cardinals to the Final Four 13 times. The Basketball Hall of Famer is the game's all-time winningest coach, men and women, with 1,216 victories, coming in a total of 45 seasons with Stanford, Idaho, and Ohio State. And in baseball, it's time to let the young kid play. The Baltimore Orioles are calling up Jackson Holiday, the top prospect in all the baseball. That is per multiple reports. The 20-year-old shortstop is hitting 342 with a pair of home runs in AAA. And the former number one overall pick is expected to join the O's in Boston today. Hey, don't forget, we got you covered per usual on HQ 24-7 news highlights and expert analysis streaming for free. You can catch us on Paramount+. Plus. Don't forget that CBS Sports app and also online. A whistleblower who came forward after a Boeing jet lost a door panel midair is raising safety questions about a different Boeing jet. Sources tell CBS News federal regulators are now looking into his claims, which the company strongly denies. CBS News senior transportation correspondent Chris Van Cleve brings us this story. The FAA is investigating claims by a Boeing quality engineer that he observed shortcuts during the production of the 787 Dreamliner. He worries they could lead to structural integrity issues years down the line as the jet ages. 
His concerns were spelled out in a letter by his attorney to the FAA in January, following the door panel that blew out of a 737 MAX mid-flight. His lawyer urged the FAA to widen its probe of Boeing to focus on the company's entire production process, not just the 737. But Boeing is pushing back strongly, saying, We are fully confident in the 787 Dreamliner. These claims about the structural integrity of the 787 are inaccurate and do not represent the comprehensive work Boeing has done to ensure the quality and long-term safety of the aircraft. The whistleblower letter cites concerns from 2021, around the same time when Boeing paused 787 deliveries for over a year to address quality control issues, a process the FAA signed off on. All right, take a look at this. A powerful storm system moved through Texas overnight, and it caused all of this mess, major damage. This is at a strip mall in Katy, Texas, just west of Houston. Luckily, there are no reports of any injuries. That same system right now is moving east. Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama could see tornadoes if you're in these areas. Look out. Flooding is also a major concern from Louisiana to Georgia. Jen Carfagno from our partners at the Weather Channel has more on this storm's track. Hey there, Jen. Good day to you, Errol. We have severe weather in the south that continues to make headlines here. After a day yesterday with heavy rain and storms and possible tornadoes, we're going to continue that again today, a really nonstop with this line of thunderstorms. And the risk is there for all modes of severe weather, including tornadoes. A 7 on the Torcon in communities like Hattiesburg, Mississippi. We've got a 5 surrounding it in communities like Mobile and even New Orleans with that risk of storms that could go tornadic. We have all the risks, out, actually. Very strong straight line winds are a possibility, perhaps in excess of 70 or even 80 miles per hour. The atmosphere just has that much energy, especially confined in that area just uh, into southern Mississippi, parts of Louisiana, stretching into Alabama. Also heavy rainfall. We've had inches of rain, one of our top uh, five wettest April days on or top 10 April days on record in Jackson yesterday with more rain coming in today here in Mississippi. Likely that we will see some flash flooding in southern Mississippi and Alabama. We'll have these storms on the move throughout Wednesday, continuing into the overnight with that risk of severe weather continuing into the overnight hours. And then throughout uh, the day on Thursday, we will also have a threat of thunderstorms that we'll have to continue to watch, perhaps even moving over towards Augusta, Georgia, where the Masters Tournament will be getting kicked off. There is that risk of thunderstorms going severe here into northern Florida, up into Georgia, and then another area up into the Great Lakes. We'll get updates to the forecast for your neighborhood with the Weather Channel on cable or live on your favorite TV streaming device. Errol, I'll send it back to you. All right, Jen, thanks. A sixth grade Massachusetts student suffered burns on his left hand from a laptop that just spontaneously ignited during school hours. Imagining that happening to you. Uh, the superintendent of a school in Uxbridge, which is near Rhode Island's northern border, says the laptop began smoking as a student was taking a standardized test yesterday morning. This caused the fire alarm to go off and forced all students, teachers and staff to evacuate, of course. It has also uh, injured the young student. When I made contact, uh, he did not have bandages on his hand. He had an ice pack on his hand. Mm -hmm. And um, the, his mom was just preparing to take him for, uh, for treatment. The school district says it purchased the laptop at the beginning of this year. Officials are, of course, asking students with the same kind of laptop to power it down and hand it in to be inspected. The summer travel season is almost here, and to ease the stress of flying, one airport is helping travelers relax with the help of some furry friends. CBS News' Ian Lee. These reports. pups are on patrol at Istanbul Airport. They're not sniffing out drugs, but searching for tense travelers passing through Turkey. This dog handler says, we see a lot of demand for therapy dogs. They help people to relax. Border Collie Alida leads the pack of this pilot project, giving kisses and comfort. After your long flight or your gas stressful or you lost something, you need something like can keep you calm down and uh, something that's like the dog is wonderful. Italian retriever Cookie loves belly rubs. I think it looks nice to how like friendly dogs in the airports. And research shows this positive approach has health benefits, reducing stress, raising feel good hormones and lowering blood pressure. They stop people worrying and, and they make people happy. The idea is being unleashed at airports around the world 
from the UK to Miami International. He's here to keep you happy and de stressed. He's doing a great job. Is he? <laughs> He's doing a great job, hey, bro. It's dogs doing what they do best. This is Brody. See how soft he is? Being hey, our Brody. best friends. Ian Lee, CBS News, here, London. For one family in Texas, the excitement of Monday's total eclipse was outdone by an even bigger event, the birth of their baby. And as CBS News' Brooke Rogers tells us, this little girl will have a story to tell the rest of her life with a name to match. Well, congratulations, Mom. Meet Sol Celeste Alvarez, who came into the world at six pounds, nine ounces, and nine days early. So I started feeling contractions around four. I didn't think in my wildest dream that she would be born though, during the eclipse. When Alicia's labor pains picked up, their only concern about time was making it to the hospital. But we ran into a lot of traffic just because yeah. everybody was going to the um, eclipse, like wanted to see the eclipse. So it took us about an hour and 30 or 30, 30 minutes to get here. Sol Celeste, whose name means celestial sun in Spanish, made her appearance just as the sun was disappearing. And then I just saw, you know, while she was in the bat in the bassinet that it started turning dark. The Alvarez's actually decided they were gonna name her soul months ago. And they chose that because they had named her big sister Luna, which means the moon. So I wanted something that they could share together. So I love the continuous name of um, Sun and Moon and it was just a continuous love. Dad Carlos, an Army veteran, says he's still marveling at her timely arrival. It was really surprising. I think that um, I didn't wake up that day thinking it was gonna be this plus a baby at the same time. But they know that somehow the stars aligned to give them the sun. When it did, you're like, okay, there must be a better purpose behind it or something that's going on maybe that I'm out of my control. And the fact that I have a moon already mm -hmm. and now i have a sun and a moon and then she was born during the eclipse that's just you just can't the odds of that it's just crazy brooke rogers cbs news texas that's a beautiful story there's always a bigger purpose for us all all right folks coming up in our next hour and throughout the afternoon for you right here on cbs news the stock market slides as new inflation numbers raise fears of a delay to the Fed's plan to finally start lowering interest rates. We'll track the forecast of severe storm systems amid major damage in parts of the southern U.S. And we'll head back to the White House for a look at what's cooking for tonight's state dinner in honor of the Japanese Prime Minister. You're streaming CBS News. Okay, so let's just start at the beginning. Well, let me start with this. What is at stake here? What is the answer then? Do you know why? You want me to just keep going? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Were there death threats? How is this possible? What's wrong with that argument? Are you saying they lied? Have you told the government that? Why won't you say the word crisis? You're not answering my question. This really is that scary? Does that make sense? What do you mean? What does that mean? Did it? any of that make what sense? You What's your response? What happened? Why? 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 It's time for the CBS News Original 60 Minutes, Sunday on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. There is no more room in our city. New York City is receiving record numbers of migrants. Today, we're going to have more than 500 adults and children come through that door. Tensions rise as shelters reach max capacity. We don't have to take care of them. CBS Reports goes inside a crisis cities and families are facing as they fight to survive. The United States still has that glimmer of hope for people to come here. Fighting for a future. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. On Face the Nation, the way to learn is to listen. We may have a recession. Listening to how someone explains themselves is so key to understanding their perspective. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Since you started La Soup in 2014, do you have any sense as to how much food you've rescued from the landfill? We've rescued four and a half million pounds. I can't even fathom how much food that is. And that's one little person in one little city in America. We're going to call this chicken piccata. We did 450 of these meals today. This is the exact dish that you and I are going to have. Yep. 
Oh, my God. Is it good? Mm-hmm. Having a plan of how to keep people fed should be in every single city. So if we eliminated food waste, could we eliminate hunger? Yes. Eating Trash, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education. Both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. This is CDA. Listen to the My Life of Crime podcast with me, Erin Moriarty. We aim every night to be factual and fair. That's our goal. Sunday morning, actor Kirsten Dunst, plus Wayne Brady on Broadway, and a beloved cherry tree named Stumpy. Stories that inform. Or you can be really old at 60, and you can be really young at 85. Inspire. How do we unlock the power within ourselves to be who we want to be and brighten your day the best part of fame is making people feel good always send the people home happy make every day a little more like sunday morning here comes the sun stream now on the free cbs news app Errol Barnett at the CBS Broadcast Center here in New York. Thanks for staying with us on CBS News. We want to show you a glimpse of the Rose Garden at the White House right now. President Biden, in a short uh, amount of time, will be speaking alongside Japan's prime minister after having their own one-on-one meetings today. Uh, One of the interesting things I'll be watching closely, we already understand that there's many deliverables, I think some 70 deliverables they will discuss and mention areas of cooperation We're going to listen closely to the press conference to hear how much Nippon Steel will be mentioned. This is a Japanese-owned company looking to take over a major U.S. steel company uh, that the White House has actually resisted. It's not on the agenda. It's not something that they've mentioned already. But as always, when press conferences take place... It's time for the questions of the people to be presented. And so we'll listen closely to that. We understand this will get underway in just a few minutes. And as soon as it gets rolling, we'll bring it to you live. President Biden is stepping up his criticism of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's approach to the ongoing war with Hamas. He told CBS News contributor Enrique Acevedo there needs to be total access to food and medicine in Gaza. The president also said he disagrees with Israel's operations in the enclave, calling it a, quote, mistake. Do you think at this point Prime Minister Netanyahu is more concerned about his political survival than he's in the national interest of his people? What I will tell you is I think what he's doing is a mistake. I don't agree with his approach. I think it's outrageous that those four or three vehicles were hit by drones and taken out on a highway where it wasn't like it was along the shore, it wasn't like there was a convoy moving here, et cetera. So I, what I'm calling for is for the Israelis to just call for a ceasefire, allow for the next six, eight weeks total access to all food and medicine going into the country. Now, Vice President Harris met with the families of American hostages being held by Hamas yesterday. Keep this in mind, they've been in captivity in Gaza for more than six months. All right, this hits your pocketbook. The latest Consumer Price Index report shows inflation is running hotter than expected. The Labor Department says prices rose 3.5% year over year in March. They're up nearly half a percent from the month before. In a statement, President Biden notes inflation is still much lower than its peak, but he says there's more work to do to lower costs. 
CBS News senior business and tech correspondent Joe Ling Kent joins us now from our Los Angeles bureau to speak about all of this. And what I appreciate, Joe Ling, is that you join us with a smile while you report on information which reflects that people are frowning as they realize that these increasing prices are really making stuff uh, expensive. But what's driving the price increases we're all feeling? Yeah, more than half of what we're seeing in this hotter than expected inflation is driven by gas prices and rent. That is the mm. harsh reality. So even though inflation remains below 4%, it is well above the 2% target that the Federal Reserve is looking to when it comes to deciding if and when they're going to cut rates later this year. At the last Fed meeting, it was telegraphed that we'd get three rate cuts, right? And now when you have hotter than expected inflation, you can expect a Reevaluation at the Fed in Washington as to what they're going to do. Now, inflation across the board has been really stubborn and sticky. That is the fundamental problem. In fact, if you look at some of the most persistent high cost items, they're monthly expenses. We're talking about auto insurance. Over the last year, if you've been feeling it, you're not wrong. It's been up 22.2% overall from just a year ago. So even though the Biden administration is saying, look, we're off the peaks of 9% inflation in 2022, prices are still going up and they're still going up by 3.5%. And that really hurts people in their pocketbooks, Errol. And it's important that you point to things like car insurance. These are must-haves. You can't choose not to uh, be covered. Yeah. I know that you've been looking at how it impacts what folks can buy in the grocery store, now having to make more difficult decisions about what they can and cannot purchase. How is this changing what people can afford? Yeah, so we wanted to not just look at the last year, but the last five years. And mm. so we got some great data from Nielsen IQ looking at what groceries cost pre-pandemic in the year leading up to 2020 and then now post-pandemic, yeah. right? And so if you take that five-year horizon, you take a look at a $100 grocery budget, say you're spending that on your, your targeting and you're trying to spend that on your family every week. Well, Five years ago, a $100 grocery budget would buy you about 30-some items. I can go into the details of what those are if you want. But you fast forward five years. To spend $100, you'd then have to subtract 33%, about 10 items out of your grocery bag. And we're talking about taking out big items like milk, chicken, cereal, bread, and four or six other items to hit and stick with your $100 budget. So even though food inflation isn't as bad as it was in 2022, perhaps 2023, it's still incredibly expensive and prices are going up just at a slower rate, but it still means that prices are going up. And so we don't expect prices ever to come back down, so to speak, unless there's a major economic event. But when you're talking about groceries, and as you point out, car insurance, 90% of Americans own a car, so you have to have car insurance. Not to mention repairs are up. Elder care, if you're caring for an elderly person, is up way over 10% over the last year. These are major costs that are taking huge amounts of money out of your paycheck. And even even though wage growth does outpace inflation by some, it is still a very significant crunch that you're feeling when you're paying for your monthly expenses, Errol. Yeah, no, so well put. So viewers at home can know that while it's painful, misery loves company. We're all feeling it. Joe Lincoln, <sighs> thanks for breaking it down for us. Appreciate it. Thanks, you. Errol. All right, another wave of severe weather right now is sweeping through parts of the south and the Mississippi Valley. Look at that. This will continue throughout the afternoon. In fact, we have some video to show you from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, harsh thunderstorms there, downing trees and utility poles. That's happening beneath the radar images you're seeing. Some homes have been destroyed, and while around thousands of people in Mississippi uh, at this moment also without power. CBS News correspondent Tom Hansen is covering the storm in Jackson, Mississippi, getting soaked. Tom, what else are you feeling and seeing on the ground there? Errol, this storm has been powerful and fast moving. You know, I flew through this storm, in fact, last night as I was getting into Jackson. It tossed our plane around like a toy. Now we are seeing some of the impacts on the ground. I want you to take a look around me. You can see that there are downed power lines, something that is happening in many neighborhoods across Jackson. You can see the yards here littered with branches. And then take a look at this house. A massive tree fell on this house, essentially 
splitting the house in two. Now, we've talked with emergency management here in Jackson. They say that they are watching the Pearl River very closely. The primary concern here, of course, is flooding. Elsewhere, the concern are those powerful tornadoes that we have already seen, one overnight in Houston that leveled a church, and then another tornado in Louisiana. So this storm is packing a punch, certainly nothing to balk at. Errol? Yeah, and with those down power lines uh, also provide a danger. We want everyone to remain safe, including you and the crew there. We know the power is out, but how long will folks in this part of the country experience this severe weather, Tom? We are nowhere near out of the woods just yet. This storm system is expected to last throughout the day, possibly into the night. And if you zoom out, just to get a context of how powerful this storm system is and how much of a concern there should be, if you look at the Torcon map, there is a large portion of pink in southern Louisiana, southern Alabama, Mississippi, uh, and that is a level seven. That basically means that there is a very strong likelihood of tornadoes, not just in that area that is pink, but also in a 50-mile radius surrounding that area. Officials are urging people not to go out in this storm and to seek shelter if there is a tornado on the ground. We've already seen other precautions being taken. Louisiana closing all state offices today, and schools here in Jackson are remote. So people are taking this storm very seriously, Errol, and we are certainly nowhere near out of the woods just yet. All right, great warning there, Tom. We want everyone there to stay safe. Thank you very much. Still to come for you here on CBS News, six former Mississippi officers received new sentences in state court for the brutal beating of two black men. We'll discuss the punishments that were just handed down. And the EPA has unveiled the first of its kind regulation aimed at making water safer to drink. We'll walk you through the new standards and the risks they're designed to reduce. Stay right there, you're streaming CBS News. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. Does this carrier strike group stand ready? It's just incredible to see there's an active search and rescue operation going on 12 hours after this accident. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. People with developmental disabilities were once sequestered by the hundreds of thousands in institutions. Many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because lack of attention, lack of imagination, lack of uh, adequate manpower. Disability activists have since torn down barriers blocking them from living at home or in the community. We conclude that Title II of the ADA requires states to provide community-based treatment for persons with mental disabilities. But of the 16,000 people who remain in state-operated institutions, half are in five states, and Illinois is one of them. 
I don't want to live in the institution. It makes me feel discriminated against. Do you think there are people living in institutions in Illinois that don't need to be living there? Yeah, because they're proving it as soon as they get out. Right now, House Republicans are inching towards another potential speaker battle. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, Marjorie Taylor Greene, excuse me, posted on social media this morning that she's still looking to oust House Speaker Mike Johnson. Greene is rebuking Johnson for working with Democrats on passing a bill to avoid a partial government shutdown last month. CBS News congressional correspondent Nicole Killian joins us from Capitol Hill. You're following every aspect of this. Nicole, how much support uh, does Congresswoman Green really have to vacate the speaker? Well, it remains to be seen. Republicans met for their weekly conference meeting, and some of them did say that they didn't necessarily feel that there was an appetite to move forward, that it was a mistake to oust uh, Speaker McCarthy last fall. Of course, those were more uh, McCarthy allies speaking, but even those who supported the motion to vacate a uh, last fall against McCarthy, uh, lawmakers, for instance, like Congressman Nancy Mace, uh, also uh, telling reporters this week that they don't think that uh, this is the right time to try to move to oust Speaker Johnson. That being said, Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, says that she still uh, has this motion at her disposal. She wouldn't outline if there's any kind of red line, per se, that would trigger her to bring this motion up. We do know that she is meeting with Speaker Johnson today, and the Speaker also addressed the status of their relationship. Take a listen. She's a colleague. I've always considered her a friend. Marjorie and I don't disagree, I don't, I don't think, on any matter of uh, philosophy. Um, we're both conservatives, you know, but uh, we do disagree sometimes on, on strategy. So the speaker, you know, putting some distance between this motion to vacate, uh, not letting it him not letting it stop him from uh, proceeding with his job and defending, you know, passing that appropriations package uh, before the Easter recess, which is in part what triggered Marjorie Taylor Greene to bring up this potential motion in the first place. And on another topic, Nicole, House Republicans delayed sending Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas's impeachment articles to the Senate. What's happening there? Well, this was really a matter of trying to allow some more time for the Senate to consider this. Of course, many Senate Republicans have been pushing for a trial, although Leader Chuck Schumer has made clear that he wants to resolve this issue quickly and he doesn't believe that impeachment is the vehicle to resolve what he believes are policy differences uh, with respect to a Republican's position uh, against uh, Secretary Mayorkas. But uh, Speaker Johnson's office did issue a statement uh, late yesterday Yesterday, saying that they decided to put this on hold until next week so that the Senate does have adequate time to uh, do its constitutional duty. So uh, we do expect at some point next week that this process will move forward. But probably, uh, to put it bluntly on the part of Utah Senator uh, Mike Lee, he suggested that it probably wasn't wise to bring forward these articles on a Wednesday leading into a Thursday when senators are trying to get out of town and maybe subject to jet fumes intoxication. Of course, you know, that smell of jet fumes is always a quick um, accelerant to uh, lawmakers eager to get out of town. And so by bringing it up next week, the hope is that they can really uh, be very deliberate about their consideration of these articles when they're brought over from the House. Very interesting point that, Nicole. Uh, we understand that Secretary Mayorkas is actually on Capitol Hill today testifying about border funding and other major issues our viewers care about. What, what are we hearing from him? Yeah, well, this is part of the annual hearings or set of hearings uh, around appropriations and the budget for President Biden and the Department of Homeland Security. So uh, the secretary is appearing before subcommittees, both uh, in the House Appropriations and Senate uh, Appropriations subcommittees. But he continues to make the argument that it really is up to Congress to fix what he believes is a broken immigration system. And he continues to defend uh, the administration's policies around this, despite uh, this uh, looming article of impeachment and potential trial that the Senate could consider. You know, he has previously said that he's going to keep politics out of this and focus on his job, but uh, he did stress the importance of, of the budget being fully funded so that uh, they can make more uh, advances and progress at the border. But ultimately, he said that it's up to Congress to act.
All right, Nicole Killian with all the latest for us on Capitol Hill. Nicole, thank you. You bet. Former exchange student Amanda Knox is on trial once again in Italy, this time for slander. She's charged with wrongly accusing a Congolese man of murdering her roommate back in 2007. Now, you may remember Knox was convicted for that murder and uh, served four years in prison for being, before being exonerated. During her interrogation, Knox pointed the finger at the owner of the bar where she worked. She later recanted that claim in a note she wrote the following afternoon. CBS News foreign correspondent Chris Livesay joins us now from Rome with the latest on this. Chris, I think I've basically tried to give the broad brush strokes, but explain better in detail what this trial is really about. Hey, Errol. Yeah, you know, you have to remember this happened when Amanda Knox was just 20 years old. Uh, she barely spoke Italian at the time. She was living in Perugia on, on a college a study abroad program. Just imagine the circumstances. She finds out that her housemate, her, her roommate, has been murdered. And then after sleepless nights, she has to give testimony. And then in the midst of that testimony, speaking in very broken Italian, sometimes without an official interpreter on hand, she wrongly accuses somebody, uh, putting them at the scene of the crime who absolutely was not there. But that person still had to spend two weeks under arrest as a result of that accusation. So this is what this case is all about. She was found guilty of slandering this other person. Now is an opportunity for her to finally clear her name and, and set the record straight as she sees it and show the circumstances that she was under. At the time she issued, there was a four page statement that was taken by police, but that's since been ruled inadmissible because of those circumstances. Now she has an opportunity to submit a 20 page letter that she's written herself, we can only presume in perfect Italian because she was able to perfect her Italian in the four years that she had to spend in prison. I bet. And that's a really interesting uh, detail. We know that Knox is not in court for this. What do we know about how she's living her life now? Yeah, you know, so ever since then, she's been able to pull the pieces of her life back together and, uh, you know, start a family. She's married. She has two children. She's 36 years old. And today she works mostly as an advocate, uh, specifically for people who are caught up in the same types of circumstances that she was, you know, wrong people who have been wrongly accused or people who have been victims of forced confessions. Um, you know, she's also spoken out about this at length. Uh, she has made a podcast. Uh, she continues to work on a podcast with her husband. Uh, she's also made uh, a series on a meditation app where she talks about resilience. So she's definitely not gone anywhere. She seems to have turned this massive setback into something that gives her more and more energy to move forward and turn it into a strength. And perhaps next she'll do a language translation app. Who knows? Uh, Chris Livesay, appreciate the update on this. Thank you very much. A whistleblower who came forward after a Boeing jet lost a door panel midair is raising safety questions about a different Boeing jet. Sources tell CBS News federal regulators are now looking into his claims, which the company strongly denies. CBS News senior transportation correspondent Chris Van Cleve brings us this story. The FAA is investigating claims by a Boeing quality engineer that he observed shortcuts during the production of the 787 Dreamliner. He worries they could lead to structural integrity issues years down the line as the jet ages. His concerns were spelled out in a letter by his attorney to the FAA in January, following the door panel that blew out of a 737 MAX mid-flight. His lawyer urged the FAA to widen its probe of Boeing to focus on the company's entire production process, not just the 737. But Boeing is pushing back strongly, saying, We are fully confident in the 787 Dreamliner. These claims about the structural integrity of the 787 are inaccurate and do not represent the comprehensive work Boeing has done to ensure the quality and long-term safety of the aircraft. The whistleblower letter cites concerns from 2021, around the same time when Boeing paused 787 deliveries for over a year to address quality control issues, a process the FAA signed off on. Coming up for you all, an Idaho teen is facing a judge today after he was arrested by the FBI for allegedly planning to commit multiple terror attacks. We'll discuss what officials found when they searched his home. And Arizona's governor's calling on lawmakers to repeal a 160-year-old near-total abortion ban 
just hours after the state Supreme Court said it could be enforced. What does this all mean? We'll look at the political fallout and what this will change about this year's elections. You're streaming CBS News. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Nate has one of the quickest minds I've ever seen. Tony has a way of making people feel comfortable. Gail has this unbelievable knack to ask the question that you're asking at home. I've been told I could talk to a tree, and that's pretty much true. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. It didn't seem like anything could happen because nothing ever happens in East Palestine. But it did. Authorities released toxic fumes from five derailed train cars. Resident, please Cute bronchitis due to chemical fumes. Did you ever have these problems before the derailment? No, ma'am. This neighborhood's not safe no more. We can assure the community that there's not vinyl chloride entering their communities. Then why are there so many people feeling these various symptoms of bloody noses or difficulty breathing and bronchitis? That's a hard question to answer. We're talking about one of the most blatant releases of a mixture of some of the most toxic chemicals. All right, as promised, let's get you right now to the Rose Garden at the White House. President Biden speaking alongside Japan's Prime Minister after their one-on-one -on -one meeting. Let's Together, listen. Our countries are taking significant steps to strengthen defense security cooperation. We're modernizing command and control structures, and we're increasing the interoperability and planning of our militaries so they can work together in a seamless and effective way. This is the most significant upgrade in our alliance since the end of, since it was first established. I'm also pleased to announce that for the first time, Japan and the United States and Australia will create a network system of air, missile, and defense architecture. We're also looking forward to standing up a trilateral military exercise with Japan and the United Kingdom. And our AUKUS defense partnership with Australia and the United Kingdom is exploring how Japan can join our work in the second pillar, which focuses on advanced capabilities, including AI, autonomous systems. All told, that represents a new benchmark for our military cooperation across a range of capabilities. On the economic front, our ties have never been more robust. Japan is the top foreign investor in the United States. Say that again. Japan is the top foreign investor in the United States. And we, the United States, are the top foreign investor in Japan. Nearly one million Americans work in Japanese companies here in the United States. And to name just one example, a few months ago, Toyota announced an $8 billion investment in a massive battery production facility in North Carolina, which will employ thousands of people. Prime Minister is going to travel to North Carolina tomorrow to visit that project. Don't stay. Don't stay. We need you back in Japan. They'll probably try to keep you. We also affirm the science and education ties between Japan and the United States. Those ties, ties stretch up to the moon, where two Japanese astronauts will join future American missions, and one will become the first non-American ever to land on the moon. And they reach into the high schools and universities as well, where the Mineta, Ambassador Mineta's program exists, named for our dear friend Norm Mineta. We're going to invest in new student exchanges, help train the next generation of Japanese and American leaders. We'll also discuss developments in the Middle East, including our shared support for a ceasefire and a hostage deal, and urgent efforts to deal with the humanitarian crisis that exists in Gaza. We also want to address the Iranian threat to launch a significant — they're threatening to launch a significant attack on Israel. As I told Prime Minister Netanyahu, our commitment to Israel's security against these threats from Iran and its proxies is ironclad. Let me say it again, ironclad. We're going to do all we can to protect Israel's security. And finally, I want to commend the Prime Minister himself. He's a statesman. Command, you know, the fact is that uh, you condemned Putin's invasion of — brutal invasion of Ukraine when it happened. 
You pledged more than $12 billion in aid, prioritizing nuclear nonproliferation at the United Nations Security Council, standing strong with the United States as we stand up for freedom of navigation, including in the South China Sea, and as we maintain peace and stability across the Taiwan Straits, and taking the brave step of mending ties with the Republic of Korea, so we can all stand shoulder to shoulder together. Tomorrow, we will both be joined by another good friend, President Marcos of the Philippines, for a trilateral summit, the first of its kind. And through it all, our commitment to the defense of Japan under Article 5, including the Senkaku Islands, is unwavering. Mr. Prime Minister, through our partnership, we have strengthened the alliance. We have expanded our work together. We've raised our shared ambitions. And now the U.S.-Japan alliance is a beacon to the entire world. There's no limit what our countries can and our people can do together. So thank you for your partnership, your leadership, and your friendship. And now over to you, Mr. Prime Minister. Hi, Joe. Thank you very much. ジョーとジル夫人のご招待に改めて感謝を申し上げます。バイデン大統領と私はこれまで幾度となく会談をし。And confirmed our shared notion that we are at crucial crossroads and that Japan US partnership is immensely important. The international community stands at a historical turning point. In order for Japan, the US, the Indo Pacific region, and for that matter, the whole world to enjoy peace, stability, and prosperity lasting into the future, we must resolutely defend and further solidify a free and open international order based on the rule of law. And again today, I told the President that now is the time to demonstrate the true values that Japan and the United States can offer as global partners, that we must together fulfill our responsibilities to create a world where human dignity is upheld, and that Japan will always stand firm with the United States. I explained that based on our national security strategy, Japan is determined to strengthen our defense force through possession of counter-strike capabilities, increase our defense budget and other initiatives, and was reassured by President Biden of his strong support for such efforts. In such context, we confirmed again the urgency to further bolster the deterrence and response capabilities of our alliance and concurred on reinforcing our security and defense cooperation to increase interoperability between the U.S. forces and our self-defense forces, including the improvement of our respective command and control frameworks. We will be discussing the specifics as we plan for the next Japan U.S. 2 plus 2. The President and I went on to discuss various specific challenges faced by the international community. First, we confirmed that unilateral attempts to change status quo by force or coercion is absolutely unacceptable wherever it may be, and that we will continue to respond resolutely against such action through cooperation with allies and like-minded nations. From such perspective, we agreed that our two countries will continue to respond to challenges concerning China through close coordination. At the same time, we confirmed the importance of continuing our dialogue with China and cooperating with China on common challenges. 
We also underscored the importance of peace and stability in the Taiwan Straits and confirmed opposition to encourage peaceful resolution of the cross Straits issue. The situation in North Korea, including nuclear and missiles development, was brought up as well. We welcomed the progress seen in many areas of cooperation based on the outcome of the Japan-U.S. ROK summit last August and concurred to coordinate even more closely as we face serious concerns under the current state of affairs. President Biden once again demonstrated his strong support towards the immediate resolution of the abduction issue. We reaffirmed the importance of realizing a free and open Indo-Pacific based on the rule of law and concur to maintain close collaboration through various opportunities, including the Japan-U.S.-Philippines summit, which is planned for tomorrow. Regarding Russia's aggression of Ukraine, based on a recognition that Ukraine today may be East Asia tomorrow, taking the issue as our own problem for Japan I expressed our resolution to continue with stringent sanctions against Russia and strong support for Ukraine, and we concurred to maintain close partnership with like-minded countries. On the situation in the Middle East, I expressed my respect for the efforts of President Biden towards the release of the hostages, improvement of the humanitarian situation, and for calming down the situation. I then explained how Japan is continuing diplomatic efforts uh, to improve uh, the humanitarian situation and to realize a sustainable ceasefire and agree to continue close uh, cooperation towards the improvement of the situation, the realization of a two-state solution, and the stabilization of the region. Regarding the economy, we firstly concurred that for both of us to lead the global economic growth together, the promotion of investment in both directions is important. I explained how Japanese businesses are making a significant contribution to the U.S. economy by their investment and the creation of jobs to which President Biden agreed. In order to maintain and strengthen the competitive edge in the area of advanced uh, technologies and to respond appropriately to issues such as economic coercion, non-market policies and practices, and excess capacities, and to overcome uh, the vulnerability of the supply chains and to lead a sustainable and inclusive economic growth. We affirmed that the collaboration of Japan and the United States is indispensable. In addition, we concurred to advance our cooperation in the areas such as decarbonization, AI, and startups. There was a huge achievement also in the area of space. In the first half of the 1960s, when I was in the United States, it was the dawn of space development in the United States, I am one of all those who were so excited in the U.S. by the spectacular challenge in space. The implementing arrangement has been signed on this occasion, and the provision of the lunar rover by Japan and the allocation of Two astronaut flight opportunities to the lunar service to Japan were confirmed. Under the Artemis program, I welcome the lunar landing by a Japanese astronaut as the first non-US astronaut. We also discussed the efforts towards a world without nuclear weapons. We affirmed 
The realistic and practical endeavors of nuclear disarmament, including the issuance of the G7 leader's Hiroshima vision last year, and I welcomed the participation of the United States in the FMCT Friends, which was launched by my initiative. Lastly, in order to further strengthen the people-to-people -people bond, which is the cornerstone of our unwavering Japan U.S. relationship, we are firm to further promote people-to-people -people exchanges. As the outcome of our meeting today, we will issue the joint statement titled The Global Partners for the Future. This is the expression of the determination of Japan and the United States to maintain and strengthen a free and open international order based on the rule of law that underpins uh, the peace, stability, and prosperity of the international community and states the guiding uh, principles. With our partnership, we will defend uh, the future of Japan and the United States, the Indo-Pacific, and the world, and make that future all the more prosperous. Thank you. Now we'll take a few questions. Jordan Fabian of Bloomberg. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, last month, uh, you predicted the Federal Reserve would cut interest rates thanks to falling inflation. Uh, but today, data showed that inflation rose more than expected for the third straight month. So how concerned are you about the fight against inflation stalling? And do you stand by your prediction for a rate cut? Well, I do stand by my prediction that before the year is out to be a rate cut. This may delay it a month or so. I'm not sure of that. I don't, we don't know what the Fed is going to do for certain. But look, we have dramatically reduced inflation from 9 percent down to close to 3 percent. We're in a situation where we're better situated than we were when we took office, where we, inflation was skyrocketing. And we have a plan to deal with it, whereas the opposition, my opposition, talks about two things. They just want to cut taxes for the wealthy and uh, raise taxes on other people. And so I think they have no plan. Our plan is one I think is still sustainable. Mr. Prime Minister, uh, you've said that the Nippon Steel acquisition of U.S. Steel is a private matter. But I'm wondering, did you discuss the matter today with President Biden? And do you believe that politics are influencing President Biden's decision to oppose the deal? And I wouldn't mind, Mr. President, if you answer that one, too. Hi. On the issue that you have raised, we understand that discussions are underway between the parties. We hope these discussions will unfold in directions that would be positive for both sides. Japan believes that appropriate procedures based on law is being implemented by the U.S. government. Japan is the largest investor to the United States. Japanese businesses employ close to one million workers in the United States, and investment from Japan to the U.S. can only increase upwards in the months and years to come. And we wish to cement this win-win relationship. Thank you. I stand by my commitment to American workers. I give a man of my word. I'm going to keep it. And with regard to that, I stand by our commitment to our alliance. This is a exactly what we're doing, a strong alliance as well. Prime Minister's microphone, please. Nakakuki of Kyodo News. My question is to both Prime Minister Kishida and President Biden. At the summit, you confirmed your strong objections against unilateral attempts to change status quo by force or coercion by China and agreed on reinforcing response capabilities. Under current circumstances, should Japan and the United States bolster defense capabilities, China may become more preoccupied in military expansion and intensify its coercive behavior. That is the risk of dilemma. In order to avoid divide and expand, avoid the divide, how should Japan and U.S. respond? Let me then take that question first. At this summit, we confirmed 
that the United States and Japan will resolutely defend and bolster a free and open international order based on the rule of law, and that Japan and the United States as global partners shall work uh, together. On challenges concerning China, including the point you raised on objecting to unilateral attempts to change status quo by force or coercion, we concurred that Japan and the United States as global partners shall work in close coordination. And also, as I said previously, we will continue our dialogue with China, and we will cooperate with China in tackling common challenges. And the President and I confirmed the importance of such dialogue as well. Based on the solid trust with our ally, the United States, we will continue to call on China to fulfill its responsibilities as a major power. Japan's policy, which I have consistently embraced, is to comprehensively promote the mutual strategic relationship we have with China and establish a constructive and stable Japan-China relationship through efforts by both sides. That has been my consistent position that I have upheld. We will continue to seek close communication with China at all levels. That's it for me. You know, uh, first of all, we keep improving our lines of communication with one another. That's the United States and China. We, I met, I've recently spoken at length with President Xi, and we've agreed that we would, number one, have personal contact with one another whenever we wanted to discuss anything, so there'd be no, nothing lipped as, no, no, nothing slips, as they say, between the cup and the lip, so we know exactly what the other team is thinking, number one. And uh, so we had a long discussion last, uh, almost, I guess almost two weeks ago now. And uh, the best way to reduce the chances of miscalculation and misunderstanding. That's number one. Number two, in our alliance we have with Japan is a purely defensive in nature. It's a defensive alliance. And the things we discussed today improve our cooperation and are, and are purely about defense and readiness. It's not aimed at any one nation or a threat to the region. And it, uh, it doesn't have anything to do with conflict. And uh, so this is about restoring stability in the region, and I think we have a chance of doing that. Okay. Third, the next question. Where, who do I call on next? Hang on a second. I got my list here. Hang on. I apologize. Aurelia of AFP. Thank you. My first question would go to both of you, Mr. President and Mr. Prime Minister. Is there a path for Japan to become a full member of AUKUS? And I would have a second question for you, Mr. President. You're now saying that Benjamin Netanyahu is making a mistake in Gaza. What are you willing to do to make him change his strategy? And would you consider conditioning military aid to Israel? Thank you. Thank you. Your question about AUKUS, I will uh, respond. Our uh, country, we want to contribute to the peace and stability of the region, and therefore we have consistently supported AUKUS. Having said that, the participants of AUKUS, US, UK, Australia, with such countries by bilateral relationship or on multilateral occasions, we have established various relationships. But for Japan to have a direct cooperation with AUKUS, nothing has been decided at this moment. Going forward with US, UK, or with Australia, with such countries, 
in bilateral or multilateral frameworks, we will continue our cooperation. So that uh, will uh, continue to be considered. At the moment, about the relationship between Japan and AUKUS, that's it. With regard to uh, my discussions with uh, Bibi Netanyahu, Prime Minister Netanyahu, as well as our relationship with Israel, I have been very blunt and straightforward with the Prime Minister, as well as his War Cabinet, as well as the Cabinet. And uh, the fact of the matter is that uh, uh, Bibi and I had a long discussion. He agreed to do several things that related to, number one, getting more aid, of both food and medicine, into Gaza, and reducing significantly the attempts, the civilian casualties in any action taken in the region. And thus far, and, we, and it's tied to the hostages, there are a number of hostages that are being held. Uh, by uh, by the, the uh, uh, Hamas, and uh, just yesterday we're meeting with the vice president, our national security advisor. Before that, and they and they're American hostages as well, and they know how committed we are, the whole team, to getting their loved ones home. We're not going to stop until we do. The new proposal on the table, uh, Bill Burns led the effort to uh, for us. We're grateful for his work. There's a now up to Hamas. They need to move on the proposal that's been made. And as I said, uh, we'll get these hostages home where they belong, but also bring back a six-week ceasefire that we need now. And the fact is that we're, uh, we're getting in somewhere in the last three days over 100 trucks. It's not enough, but it needs to be more. And there's one more opening that has to take place in the north. So we'll see what he does in terms of meeting the commitments he made to me. This will be the last reporter. Mr. Shimizu, please. Thank you. Shimizu of NHK. I ask the question to both of you. As Prime Minister Kishida mentioned, the abduction issue of North Korea, I believe, was discussed. Prime Minister, you have expressed your wish to have a direct engagement with Kim Jong-un, but they say that abduction is already resolved, which means that they are refusing. During the meeting, what did you tell President Biden about the outlook of a summit, and what engagement did you ask President Biden? President Biden, my question, what did you hear from Prime Minister Kishida, and what is your observation and feeling, your president, and with the nuclear missile issues, what is your position? Do you support early summit between in Japan and North Korea. Thank you. First of all, if I may start regarding my summit meeting with President Biden about North Korea, including the missile and nuclear issues we have discussed, and regarding the increasingly worrying situation, we have agreed to continue a close coordination. And uh, on uh, top of uh, that, uh, we concurred uh, that uh, the window of uh, a discussion with North Korea is open, and uh, we discussed uh, that uh, Japan, U.S., uh, Japan, U.S., and ROK will continue to work closely uh, together. I also asked for the continued understanding and cooperation for the immediate resolution of the abduction issue. And President Biden once again gave myself a very strong assurance. Regarding the recent announcement by North Korea, I will refrain from commenting on each and every announcement by North Korea. But as I have been mentioning repeatedly, Based on uh, the perspective that the establishment of a meaningful relation between Japan and North Korea is in the interest of both Japan and North Korea, and that it would be hugely uh, beneficial to the peace and stability of the region, my policy is to aim for a summit meeting with North Korea to resolve various issues and will advance high-level consultation directly under my uh, instruction, and that remains unchanged. That is my response.
We did discuss this issue. We both agreed that DPRK must, must also address the serious human rights and humanitarian concerns of the international community, including the immediate resolution of the abduction issue. But you know, the Prime Minister has just spoken to the potential of what his plans may mean, but welcome, I welcome the opportunity, we welcome the opportunity of our allies to initiate dialogue with the Democratic Republic of Korea. So I've said many times, we're open to dialogue ourselves at any time, without preconditions of the DPRK. So I have faith in the in the Japan, I have faith in the Prime Minister, and I think his seeking a dialogue with them is a good thing. It's a positive thing. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, what do you say to the people of Arizona? Why didn't everybody holler at once? I'll ask you briefly on the issue of abortion, sir. Respectfully, what do you say to the people of Arizona right now who are witnessing a law go in place that dates back to the Civil War era? Elect me. I'm in the 20. So 20th century, 21st century, not back then. They weren't even a state. I find. Thank you all very much. Thank you. How does the war in Ukraine come to an end, sir? This concludes. Will you reconsider? How does the war in Ukraine? The war in Ukraine comes to an end by the House leader allowing a vote. There's overwhelming support for Ukraine among the majority of Democrats and Republicans. There should be a vote now. Is there a plan for peace? Is there a plan for peace? Is there a plan for peace? Alive? Will you reconsider the LNG export ban, sir? There is no ban. ban. Will you Reporters making their best effort to get in every question while the president is visible. But there, you've just been watching President Biden speaking alongside Japan's Prime Minister Fumio Kishida uh, as part of this state visit. They had a bilateral earlier today. There will be a state dinner later tonight with the one and only Paul Simon performing. Uh, but top on the agenda, mostly economic um, headlines, a military partnership with Japan that, in the president's words, quote, raise a new benchmark of cooperation. We heard them also speak about uh, the U.S.'s ties with Japan economically, saying that Japan is the top foreign investor in the U.S. and that vice versa is true. Interestingly enough, we heard about a major lunar announcement where Japan would join U.S. efforts to get back to the moon and, in fact, provide the first non-American to set foot, foot on the lunar surface. But we also heard questions raised about a potential deal between uh, Japan-owned Nippon Steel to buy U.S. Steel that President Biden intervened in, and he said today that he stands by his position, uh, a commitment to American workers, as he calls it, while also committed to the relationship with Japan. One of the reporters we heard uh, throw those questions out as the president left was our own CBS News senior White House correspondent, Weijia Zhang. Uh, from your point of view, Weijia, what stood out as a major takeaway from what these two leaders did and did not say today? Well, Errol, even though President Biden did not explicitly talk about China at length, that was really the undercurrent of everything these two leaders had to say as they talked about their alliance with regard to bolstering their relationship uh, when it comes to their military, cooperating, integrating their systems more. Even when they were talking about artificial intelligence and cooperating in space, these are all things that are tangentially, at the least, related to China as it continues its aggressions and its goals of dominance, especially in that region. And so this really underscored the relationship well, the between the U.S. The and Japan. I mean, you might remember that President Biden, when he first came here to the White House, the first country he, vis he welcomed to visit here uh, was Japan. And so it really just reinforces what he has been saying all along, because Errol, you know, regardless of what we are talking about in terms of Joe Biden's foreign policy, China is going to be at the center of it. But he did stress again that that relationship is on the mend, if you will, because there were some icy uh, months that caused some concern because the two leaders were not talking. So the president made it a point to say that he is in regular contact now with President Xi Jinping of China.
China. And Weijia, I want to ask you about the rare area of disagreement, as we see all these topics of unity, as it relates to uh, Japan's efforts, the Japan-owned company Nippon Steel, to purchase U.S. steel, which President Biden himself opposes and said today that he remains committed to American workers. Help us understand the president's thinking there and how it impacts the relationship. Sure. So you're absolutely right. It was a little bit of an awkward moment because the president had just spoken at length about the economic relationship between these two countries and how much both are investing into the other one. Uh, but at the same time, we know that the president has opposed a deal for Japan to purchase U.S. steel, a $15 billion deal, because this administration, the president especially, says that that massive company that has a legacy here in America ought to stay here. And today he was asked about it and said that, you know, his commitment to steel workers remains. And he didn't say much more, Errol, except uh, that, you know, he would continue to support the American company and imply that, you know, he still opposed to that deal going through. That's right. And U.S. Steel, based in Pittsburgh, we know President Biden um, received the endorsement of the U.S. Steel workers after refusing to allow this deal to go through. And of course, it's an election year in Pennsylvania, certainly one of the many swing states. And it came just after the, chi uh, the, 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 the Japanese prime minister said he hopes that there is um, uh, discussions underway for both sides to be happy. So that's one area of disagreement. We also heard the president um, answer a question as it relates to his conversations about um, the war between Israel and Hamas. What can you tell us uh, about what he said and if it sheds any new light into the U.S. relationship between President Biden and, and the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Well, we know that in his most recent interview, the president said that Netanyahu had made a mistake with his approach to handling the war in Gaza. Uh, we also know that, you know, during that conversation that he had with Netanyahu, uh, he did warn, essentially, that if Israel did not change its course of action, then the U.S. would have to. But one big question still remains, Errol, even after today, even though the president was directly asked whether he was prepared to condition aid uh, to Israel. And he did not say one way or another, but he did stress that Netanyahu made commitments, that it appeared he was following through on them, and separately said that the U.S. would continue to um, uh, support Israel's right to defend itself. So you ask if there's anything new there. Not really. I mean, the president is stressing what the administration or other officials have already said, which is that you know, they are prepared to change course, but what that means has not been spelled out. Of course, we can um, assume that it might have to do with aid and support uh, or sanctions or economic packages to Israel. But again, no clear answer as the president tries to carefully walk this line. And as our viewers join us now, Weijia, it's about 2 p.m. here on the East Coast. Uh, our senior White House correspondent, Weijia Zhang, is giving us a bit of a debrief after President Biden um, held a press conference with the Japanese Prime Minister, Fumio Kishida, as part of a state visit today. You and I have just walked through some of the big headlines, what was and what was not mentioned, but state dinners come with a certain level of pomp and circumstance and ceremony as well. Uh, Weijia, you're braving the conditions outside for us, but what can you tell us about what is to be expected later tonight, including a celebrity dinner performance, I understand. That's right, Errol. A state dinner is probably one of the greatest gifts that uh, a U.S. president can give to another foreign leader because it signifies the level of um, that relationship and how important it is to the United States. So you're absolutely right. That will happen in just a few hours after these two leaders continue their engagements. And there is a lot of pomp and circumstance, as you can imagine, the big reveal of the president with uh, and the prime minister with their dates. Of course, the first lady, everyone wants to know what she'll be wearing. And it really is an opportunity to indulge and to celebrate the relationship between between these two companies with food, with entertainment. And so uh, that will be a highlight of this trip, Errol, but of course, still a lot of work to do uh, throughout the day. Of course, that's right. And Paul Simon, I understand, will perform. Do you have any clue of who picked that artist? Maybe the 
Japanese prime minister's a fan. Have you heard anything about that? I, you know, that's a great question, Earl, <laughs> and I'll try to report it out. Uh, but certainly... He's a legend and has been for decades, not only here in the U.S., uh, but around the world. And so it's no surprise. But I think, you know, for, for those who are lucky enough to attend, I am not one of them. Oh. Uh, but they'll certainly have a wonderful show uh, and, and be able to take in all the, the things that, you know, you can't really uh, predict, but... Right. You know, body language yeah. and the way that they interact during this very uh, prestigious event, all very important to, to stress their relationship. That's Aaron. right. Weijia Zhang walking through all the important topics for us and then some of the, the kind of, you know, more entertainment uh, topics as well. Weijia Zhang, thank you so much. Just so you know, you can call me Al anytime. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Errol. All right, another wave of severe weather right now is sweeping through parts of the south and the Mississippi Valley. Look at that. This will continue throughout the afternoon. In fact, we have some video to show you from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, harsh thunderstorms there, are downing trees and utility poles. That's happening beneath the radar images you're seeing. Some homes have been destroyed, and while around thousands of people in Mississippi uh, at this moment also are without power. CBS News correspondent Tom Hansen is covering the storm in Jackson, Mississippi, getting soaked. Tom, what else are you feeling and seeing on the ground there? Errol, this storm has been powerful and fast moving. You know, I flew through this storm, in fact, last night as I was getting into Jackson. It tossed our plane around like a toy. Now we are seeing some of the impacts on the ground. I want you to take a look around me. You can see that there are downed power lines, something that is happening in many neighborhoods across Jackson. You can see the yards here littered with branches. And then take a look at this house. A massive tree fell on this house, essentially splitting the house in two. Now, we've talked with emergency management here in Jackson. They say that they are watching the Pearl River very closely. The primary concern here, of course, is flooding. Elsewhere, the concern are those powerful tornadoes that we have already seen, one overnight in Houston that leveled a church, and then another tornado in Louisiana. So this storm is packing a punch, certainly nothing to balk at. Errol? Yeah, and with those down power lines, uh also provide a danger. We want everyone to remain safe, including you and the crew there. We know the power is out, but how long will folks in this part of the country experience this severe weather, Tom? We are nowhere near out of the woods just yet. This storm system is expected to last throughout the day, possibly into the night. And if you zoom out, just to get a context of how powerful this storm system is and how much of a concern there should be, if you look at the Torcon map, there is a large portion of pink in southern Louisiana, southern Alabama, Mississippi, uh, and that is a level seven. That basically means that there is a very strong likelihood of tornadoes, not just in that area that is pink, but also in a 50-mile radius surrounding that area. Officials are urging people not to go out in this storm and to seek shelter if there is a tornado on the ground. We've already seen other precautions being taken. Louisiana closing all state offices today, and schools here in Jackson are remote. So people are taking this storm very seriously, Errol, and we are certainly nowhere near out of the woods just yet. All right, great warning there, Tom. We want everyone there to stay safe. Thank you very much. President Biden is stepping up his criticism of Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu's approach to the ongoing war with Hamas. He told CBS News contributor Enrique Acevedo there needs to be total access to food and medicine in Gaza. The president also said he disagrees with Israel's operations in the enclave, calling it a, quote, mistake. Do you think at this point Prime Minister Netanyahu is more concerned about his political survival than he is in the national interest of his people? What I will tell you is I think what he's doing is a mistake. I don't agree with his approval. I think it's outrageous that those four, three vehicles were hit by drones and taken out on a highway where it wasn't like it was along the shore. It wasn't like there was a convoy moving here, et cetera. So I, what I'm calling for is for the Israelis to just call for a ceasefire, allow for the next six, eight weeks total access to all food and medicine going into the country. 
And Vice President Harris met with the families of American hostages being held by Hamas yesterday. Keep this in mind, they've been in captivity in Gaza for more than six months. All right, this hits your pocketbook. The latest Consumer Price Index report shows inflation is running hotter than expected. The Labor Department says prices rose 3.5% year over year in March. They're up nearly half a percent from the month before. In a statement, President Biden notes inflation is still much lower than its peak, but he says there's more work to do to lower costs. CBS News senior business and tech correspondent Joe Link Kent joins us now from our Los Angeles bureau to speak about all of this. And what I appreciate, Joe Ling, is that you join us with a smile while you report on information, which reflects that people are frowning as they realize that these increasing prices are really making stuff uh, expensive. But what's driving the price increases we're all feeling? Yeah, more than half of what we're seeing in this hotter than expected inflation is driven by gas prices and rent. That is the harsh reality. So even though inflation remains below 4%, it is well above the 2% target that the Federal Reserve is looking to when it comes to deciding if and when they're going to cut rates later this year. At the last Fed meeting, it was telegraphed that we'd get three rate cuts, right? And now when you have hotter than expected inflation, you can expect a re-evaluation at the Fed in Washington as to what they're going to do. Now, inflation across the board has been really stubborn and sticky. That is the fundamental problem. In fact, if you look at some of the most persistent high cost items, they're monthly expenses. We're talking about auto insurance. Over the last year, if you've been feeling it, you're not wrong. It's been up 22.2% overall from just a year ago. So even though the Biden administration is saying, look, we're off the peaks of 9% inflation in 2022, prices are still going up and they're still going up by 3.5%. And that really hurts people in their pocketbooks, Errol. And it's important that you point to things like car insurance. These are must-haves. You can't choose not to uh, be covered. Yeah. I know that you've been looking at how it impacts what folks can buy in the grocery store now having to make more difficult decisions about what they can and cannot purchase. How is this changing what people can afford? Yeah, so we wanted to not just look at the last year, but the last five years. And mm. so we got some great data from Nielsen IQ looking at what groceries cost pre-pandemic in the year leading up to 2020 and then now post-pandemic, yeah. right? And so if you take that five-year horizon, you take a look at a $100 grocery budget, say you're spending that on your you're targeting and you're trying to spend that on your family every week. Well, Five years ago, a $100 grocery budget would buy you about 30-some items. I can go into the details of what those are if you want. But you fast forward five years. To spend $100, you'd then have to subtract 33%, about 10 items out of your grocery bag. And we're talking about taking out big items like milk, chicken, cereal, bread, and four or six other items to hit and stick with your $100 budget. So even though food inflation isn't as bad as it was in 2022, perhaps 2023, it's still incredibly expensive and prices are going up just at a slower rate, but it still means that prices are going up. And so we don't expect prices ever to come back down, so to speak, unless there's a major economic event. But when you're talking about groceries, and as you point out, car insurance, 90% of Americans own a car. So you have to have car insurance, not to mention repairs are up. Elder care, if you're caring for an elderly person, is up way over 10% over the last year. These are major costs that are taking huge amounts of money out of your paycheck. And even even though wage growth does outpace inflation by some, it is still a very significant crunch that you're feeling when you're paying for your monthly expenses, Errol. Yeah, no, so well put. So viewers at home can know that while it's painful, misery loves company. We're all feeling it. Joe Link Kemp, <sighs> thanks for breaking it down for us. Appreciate it. Thanks, you. Errol. Still to come for you here on CBS News, six former Mississippi officers received new sentences in state court for the brutal beating of two black men. We'll discuss the punishments that were just handed down. And the EPA has unveiled a first of its kind regulation aimed at making water safer to drink. We'll walk you through the new standards and the risks they're designed to reduce. Stay right there, you're streaming CBS News.
Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. Does this carrier strike group stand ready? It's just incredible to see there's an active search and rescue operation going on 12 hours after this accident. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. People with developmental disabilities were once sequestered by the hundreds of thousands in institutions. Many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because lack of attention, lack of imagination, lack of uh, adequate manpower. Disability activists have since torn down barriers blocking them from living at home or in the community. We conclude that Title II of the ADA requires states to provide community-based treatment for persons with mental disabilities. But of the 16,000 people who remain in state-operated institutions, half are in five states, and Illinois is one of them. I don't want to live in the institution. It makes me feel discriminated against. Do you think there are people living in institutions in Illinois that don't need to be living there? Yeah, because they're proving it as soon as they get out. Right now, House Republicans are inching towards another potential speaker battle. Representative Marjorie Taylor Greene, Marjorie Taylor Greene, excuse me, posted on social media this morning that she's still looking to oust House Speaker Mike Johnson. Greene is rebuking Johnson for working with Democrats on passing a bill to avoid a partial government shutdown last month. CBS News congressional correspondent Nicole Killian joins us from Capitol Hill. You're following every aspect of this. Nicole, how much support uh, does Congresswoman Greene really have to vacate the speaker? Well, it remains to be seen. Republicans met for their weekly conference meeting, and some of them did say that they didn't necessarily feel that there was an appetite to move forward, that it was a mistake to oust uh, Speaker McCarthy last fall. Of course, those were more uh, McCarthy allies speaking, but even those who supported the motion to vacate a uh, last fall against McCarthy, uh, lawmakers, for instance, like Congressman Nancy Mace, uh, also uh, telling reporters this week that they don't think that uh, this is the right time to try to move to oust Speaker Johnson. That being said, Marjorie Taylor Greene uh, says that she still uh, has this motion at her disposal. She wouldn't outline if there's any kind of red line, per se, that would trigger her to bring this motion up. We do know that she is meeting with Speaker Johnson today, and the Speaker also addressed the status of their relationship. Take a listen. She's a colleague. I've always considered her a friend. Marjorie and I don't disagree, I don't, I don't think, on any matter of uh, philosophy. Um, we're both conservatives, you know, but uh, we do disagree sometimes on, on strategy. So the speaker, you know, putting some distance between this motion to vacate, uh, not letting it him 
not letting it stop him from uh, proceeding with his job and defending, you know, passing that appropriations package uh, before the Easter recess, which is in part what triggered Marjorie Taylor Greene to bring up this potential motion in the first place. And on another topic, Nicole, House Republicans delayed sending Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas' impeachment articles to the Senate. What's happening there? Well, this was really a matter of trying to allow some more time for the Senate to consider this. Of course, many Senate Republicans have been pushing for a trial, although Leader Chuck Schumer has made clear that he wants to resolve this issue quickly and he doesn't believe that impeachment is the vehicle to resolve what he believes are policy differences uh, with respect to a Republican's position uh, against uh, Secretary Mayorkas. But uh, Speaker Johnson's office did issue a statement uh, late yesterday Yesterday, saying that they decided to put this on hold until next week so that the Senate does have adequate time to uh, do its constitutional duty. So uh, we do expect at some point next week that this process will move forward. But probably, uh, to put it bluntly on the part of Utah Senator uh, Mike Lee, he suggested that it probably wasn't wise to bring forward these articles on a Wednesday leading into a Thursday when senators are trying to get out of town and maybe subject to jet fumes intoxication. Of course, you know, that smell of jet fumes is always a quick um, accelerant to uh, lawmakers eager to get out of town. And so by bringing it up next week, the hope is that they can really uh, be very deliberate about their consideration of these articles when they're brought over from the House. Very interesting point there, Nicole. Uh, we understand that Secretary Mayorkas is actually on Capitol Hill today testifying about border funding and other major issues our viewers care about. What, what are we hearing from him? Yeah, well, this is part of the annual hearings or set of hearings uh, around appropriations and the budget for President Biden and the Department of Homeland Security. So uh, the secretary is appearing before subcommittees, both uh, in the House Appropriations and Senate uh, Appropriations subcommittees. But he continues to make the argument that it really is up to Congress to fix what he believes is a broken immigration system. And he continues to defend uh, the administration's policies around this, despite uh, this uh, looming article of impeachment and potential trial that the Senate could consider. You know, he has previously said that he's going to keep politics out of this and focus on his job, but uh, he did stress the importance of, of the budget being fully funded so that uh, they can make more uh, advances and progress at the border. But ultimately, he said that it's up to Congress to act. All right, Nicole Killian with all the latest for us on Capitol Hill. Nicole, thank you. You bet. Former exchange student Amanda Knox is on trial once again in Italy, this time for slander. She's charged with wrongly accusing a Congolese man of murdering her roommate back in 2007. Now, you may remember Knox was convicted for that murder and uh, served four years in prison for being, before being exonerated. During her interrogation, Knox pointed the finger at the owner of the bar where she worked. She later recanted that claim in a note she wrote the following afternoon. CBS News foreign correspondent Chris Livesey joins us now from Rome with the latest on this. Chris, I think I've basically tried to give the broad brush strokes, but explain better in detail what this trial is really about. Hey, Earl. Yeah, you know, you have to remember this happened when Amanda Knox was just 20 years old. Uh, she barely spoke Italian at the time. She was living in Perugia on, on a college a study abroad program. Just imagine the circumstances. She finds out that her housemate, her, her roommate, has been murdered. And then after sleepless nights, she has to give testimony. And then in the midst of that testimony, speaking in very broken Italian, sometimes without an official interpreter on hand, she wrongly accuses somebody, uh, putting them at the scene of the crime who absolutely was not there. But that person still had to spend two weeks under arrest as a result of that accusation. So this is what this case is all about. She was found guilty of slandering this other person. Now is an opportunity for her to finally clear her name and, and set the record straight as she sees it and show the circumstances that she was under. At the time she issued, there was a four page statement that was taken by police, but that's since been ruled inadmissible because of those circumstances. Now she has an opportunity to submit a 20 page letter that she's written her herself, we can only presume in perfect Italian because she was able to perfect her Italian in the four years that she had to spend in prison.
I bet, and that's a really interesting uh, detail. We know that Knox is not in court for this. What do we know about how she's living her life now? Yeah, you know, so ever since then, she's been able to pull the pieces of her life back together and, uh, you know, start a family. She's married. She has two children. She's 36 years old. And today she works mostly as an advocate, uh, specifically for people who are caught up in the same types of circumstances that she was, you know, wrong people who have been wrongly accused or people who have been victims of forced confessions. Um, you know, she's also spoken out about this at length. Uh, she has made a podcast. Uh, she continues to work on a podcast with her husband. Uh, she's also made uh, a series on a meditation app where she talks about resilience. So she's definitely not gone anywhere. She seems to have turned this massive setback into something that gives her more and more energy to move forward and turn it into a strength. And perhaps next she'll do a language translation app. Who knows? Uh, Chris Livesay, appreciate the update on this. Thank you very much. A whistleblower who came forward after a Boeing jet lost a door panel midair is raising safety questions about a different Boeing jet. Sources tell CBS News federal regulators are now looking into his claims, which the company strongly denies. CBS News senior transportation correspondent Chris Van Cleve brings us this story. The FAA is investigating claims by a Boeing quality engineer that he observed shortcuts during the production of the 787 Dreamliner. He worries they could lead to structural integrity issues years down the line as the jet ages. His concerns were spelled out in a letter by his attorney to the FAA in January, following the door panel that blew out of a 737 MAX mid-flight. His lawyer urged the FAA to widen its probe of Boeing to focus on the company's entire production process, not just the 737. But Boeing is pushing back strongly, saying, We are fully confident in the 787 Dreamliner. These claims about the structural integrity of the 787 are inaccurate and do not represent the comprehensive work Boeing has done to ensure the quality and long-term safety of the aircraft. The whistleblower letter cites concerns from 2021, around the same time when Boeing paused 787 deliveries for over a year to address quality control issues, a process the FAA signed off on. Coming up for you all, an Idaho teen is facing a judge today after he was arrested by the FBI for allegedly planning to commit multiple terror attacks. We'll discuss what officials found when they searched his home. And Arizona's governor's calling on lawmakers to repeal a 160-year-old near-total abortion ban just hours after the state Supreme Court said it could be enforced. What does this all mean? We'll look at the political fallout and what this will change about this year's elections. You're streaming CBS News. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Nate has one of the quickest minds I've ever seen. Tony has a way of making people feel comfortable. Gail has this unbelievable knack to ask the question that you're asking at home. I've been told I could talk to a tree, and that's pretty much true. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. It didn't seem like anything could happen because nothing ever happens in East Palestine, but it did. Authorities released toxic fumes from five derailed train cars. Resident, please evacuate. Acute bronchitis due to chemical fumes. Did you ever have these problems before the derailment? No, ma'am. This neighborhood's not safe no more. We can assure the community that there's not vinyl chloride entering their communities. Then why are there so many people feeling these various symptoms of bloody noses or difficulty breathing and bronchitis? That's a hard question to answer. We're talking about one of the most blatant releases of a mixture of some of the most toxic chemicals that we've seen in America. I feel like now I have a duty to warn other communities. If my daughter has to watch me die of cancer, at least it saves someone else. This case. It's like a screenplay, something straight out of Hollywood. But it's not fiction. It's 48 hours. Human remains found this week. Four families shattered. There's no physical evidence. The mystery would haunt investigators for years. 
There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Get like a John Grisham novel. A gripping true crime original, 48 Hours, now streaming on the free CBS News app. This is CBS. that come with the territory. There have been four fatal accidents. That's a 1% fatal accident rate. Might make you look before you launch. If you have one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, would have a public crisis. Space Tourism, now streaming on the free CBS News app. All right, friends, welcome back to CBS News. I'm Errol Barnett. Here's a recap of the top stories we're tracking for you right now. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is at the White House today for an official state visit with President Biden. The White House calls Japan the pivotal member of the Quad. That's the nickname for the informal alliance between the US, Japan, Australia, and India. High-level talks this afternoon will be followed by a formal state dinner at the White House tonight. A New York judge sentenced former Trump CFO Alan Weisselberg to five months behind bars for perjury. He admitted to lying while testifying on behalf of the former president in the company's civil fraud trial. Weisselberg served 100 days in prison last year for tax evasion. Consumer inflation rose higher than expected. The CPI is up uh, less than half a percent from last month, but it also rose three and a half percent from this time last year. Experts say the stubborn rise in prices may prompt the Federal Reserve to hold off on plans to begin lowering interest rates this year. The Environmental Protection Agency has issued groundbreaking regulations designed to make drinking water safer for people all over the United States. Now, the agency is requiring public water utilities to test for six different types of substances known as PFAS to reduce people's exposure to them in drinking water. PFAS, also commonly known as forever chemicals, are found in a wide variety of products. And that's despite a growing body of research demonstrating their negative health effects on all of us. This new effort marks the first ever national regulations for PFAS in drinking water. These new standards really are a breakthrough because what they do is they will address six of these forever toxic chemicals, um, six of the ones that we know are pretty common and are extremely toxic. So by regulating those, EPA's estimate is that as many as 105 million people have these chemicals in their water right now. That stuff is getting into people's bodies and is threatening their health. CBS News senior national and environmental correspondent Ben Tracy joins us now to dive into this historic announcement. And Ben, I feel like there's two reactions to this. On one side, it sounds like an encouraging development that we're better protected. But on the other side, it's only six of these so-called forever chemicals. Help us understand why they're so dangerous and how long they really do last. So these are really incredibly strong man-made chemicals. They're resistant to heat and water and oil and dirt. And that makes them great for all the products that they're used in. You saw some of those products up on the screen. It's everything from nonstick cookware to water-resistant clothing. But the problem is they're very hard to break down. They can last for thousands of years in the environment. And they have been linked to serious health issues. Everything from you know liver damage and immune system damage to certain forms of cancer and then developmental issues with children. So that is the concern that this stuff is in the water supply that nearly 2 million, um, 200 million Americans are drinking. And how exactly, Ben, will the EPA try to enforce these regulations? Well, these are legally enforceable. Basically, water, public water utilities around the country are going to have to make changes to comply with these new rules. They have some time to do it. They have about three years to monitor their water system, find out how much PFAS is actually in their system, report that to the public, make that public so people know what they're drinking, and then they get about two years to comply with these rules. So they're going to have to install equipment to basically bring those levels down if they exceed these new EPA rules to the levels that would comply. 
And as I mentioned, and as we spoke about coming into this, uh, the EPA is restricting the use of a total of six uh, PFAS is in, in drinking water, but what, there are more than 15,000 uh, of these kinds of chemicals. So how significant from your point of view, Ben, on reporting on environmental and climate issues, how significant are these regulations specifically? It's still really significant. Yes, you hear six versus the 15,000, but the reason they're focusing on those six are those are the six that are really toxic. Those are the ones that are causing the really significant health issues and ones that have found to be prevalent in drinking water systems. So the thought is by going after those and forcing these systems to reduce those to near zero levels that you really will mitigate some of the health risks uh, that currently exist. And for folks watching who, you know, want to follow better guidance and reduce their risk, and exposure to any type of forever chemicals, what would you recommend? Well, we got to be honest, this is this is not easy. I mean, this is not as simple as, you know, running your water through a Brita filter at your house or something like that. You'd have to install basically a reverse osmosis system, the kind of thing that goes underneath your sink. It costs a lot of money. So what EPA is doing is they're saying we would rather do this at the utility level. So you folks at home, when you turn on your tap, you don't have to worry about it. You can actually trust what is coming out of there. So some of that technology will be installed at these water treatment plants and therefore you wouldn't have to worry about it as much when it comes out of your tap. All right, it'll take some time for this to kick in, but at least it seems like a step in the right direction. Ben Tracy, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Errol. Six Mississippi law enforcement officers who tortured and abused two black men learned their sentences in their state courses to, uh, court cases today. The members of the so-called Goon Squad receive sentences ranging from 15 to 45 years. They'll serve those concurrently with the federal prison sentences they received last month. If you remember, I was in Jackson, Mississippi reporting on that. The attack happened in January of last year after a white person called a deputy to complain two black men were staying with a white woman. The six former officers tortured and humiliated the men with various objects. Arizona's governor is calling on the state legislature to repeal a near-total abortion ban. The state Supreme Court ruled yesterday that a law put on the books way back in 1864, which makes the procedure illegal unless the mother's life is in danger, can be enforced. CBS News' Natalie Brand reports on the fallout. Abortion access in Arizona is in limbo after the state's conservative Supreme Court reinstated a 19th century law banning nearly all abortions. While a lower court reviews the law's constitutionality, the state's Democratic governor is blasting the ruling. This is a devastating decision that will have huge consequences. Governor Katie Hobbs is calling on the state legislature to repeal the ban first enacted in 1864 before Arizona even became a state. They could uh, gavel in today and make a motion to repeal this ban, and they should do that. I'm hopeful that they will. The 4-2 decision overrides Arizona's current 15-week ban, and the court warned that all abortions except those necessary to save a woman's life are illegal with doctors facing a two to five year prison sentence. Today's decision should be celebrated and we're very hopeful that voters will recognize that life is a human right. Arizona is a critical battleground in the presidential race. Within hours of the decision, the Biden campaign boosted ad spending there and the vice president will visit later this week. To stop bans like this, we need a United States Congress that will restore the protections of Roe v. Wade. Monday, former President Donald Trump released a video statement saying abortion limits should be up to the states. The states will determine by vote or legislation or perhaps both, and whatever they decide must be the law. Back in Arizona, Planned Parenthood says it will continue to provide abortion services up to 15 weeks for a short period of time. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Washington. We want to report on a new study it found some of the nation's largest employers may be biased in their hiring practices. Coming up next, what experts say can be done to address discrimination. You're streaming CBS News. Washington is the seat of power. Um, national security, foreign policy, global economics, every story comes through Washington in some way. We bring some of the most powerful voices in America to the table. We don't just ask the questions, you have to go deeper. We try to understand what's at the heart 
of the issue we're talking about to then come forward with solutions. Face the Nation on CBS. The justices ruled that Harvard and the University of North Carolina violated the Constitution. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to end affirmative action in college admissions, uncertainty sets in for some students of color. Affirmative action really gave us an equal opportunity. CBS Reports explores the historic decision and what it means for those chasing an opportunity to change their lives. I knew that college was the ticket to break this cycle. The end of affirmative action, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Okay, let's go. You guys good? Hey. All right, we good? Keep going. It's the clock. It's ticking. Off we go. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. <laughs> it's time for 60 Minutes, Sundays on CBS. An original documentary from CBS Reports. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever. Curing diseases, scientific breakthroughs, making lives better. They can help us with medical discovery, scientific discoveries, doing better agriculture, having cures for things like Alzheimer's. It's also going to really transform the way we work. The uplifting potential of artificial intelligence is limitless. It gives you a friend, somebody to chat with 24-7 that is non-judgmental. He makes me feel loved and desired. And so are its downfalls. The problem with all this AI is that it's unpredictable and uncontrollable. The choices we make now will have lasting effects for decades, maybe even centuries. The ChatGPT revolution, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We are about to see American weapons in the hands of Mexican cartels. A gun pipeline to Mexico. We are arming the cartels. 100%, no doubt about it. Happening right under our noses. Uh, who's doing something about this? Nobody. A CBS Reports exclusive. Most Americans have no idea that we are effectively arming the enemy next door. This is the story the American people need to know. Arming cartels, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides, Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Officials in Chicago have released body cam video that shows officers firing 96 times at a driver who they pulled over. And we have to give you a warning here. This video is disturbing. Initial evidence from an independent investigation shows the driver, a 26-year-old named Dexter Reed, fired the first shot. Reed was killed and one officer was injured. The plainclothes officer says they'd stopped Reed on suspicion of not wearing a seatbelt. Reed's family is calling for charges to be filed. Chicago's mayor says the footage is deeply disturbing. I'm personally devastated to see yet another young black man lose his life during an interaction with the police. I've also been praying for the full recovery of the officer who was shot during this interaction. Now, the Chicago Fraternal Order of Police has not responded to CBS News's request for comment on this. A new report suggests some of the nation's biggest companies are discriminating against black job applicants. In the largest of its kind study, a group from the National Bureau of Economic Research sent out 80,000 resumes to 97 companies over a three-year span between 2019 and 2021. They use fake resumes, but with equal qualifications, changing only personal details to imply an applicant's race, age, and gender. Overall, researchers found employers contacted white applicants more than black ones, with the widest gap being between companies' genuine parts and auto nation. So far, neither company has responded to our requests for comment. However, genuine parts did tell the New York Times, quote, we are always evaluating our practices to ensure inclusivity and break down barriers, and we will continue to do so. Auto nation did not respond to the New York Times. Let's bring in Evan Rose now. He is a co-author of this report and is an assistant economics professor at the University of Chicago. Evan, great to have you with us on this topic. I'm just wondering from your point of view, with all the research you've done, what were the most significant findings and what it tells us about the U.S. labor market as a whole? Great. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Um, 
So this was uh, a, a huge study, as you mentioned. We sent thousands and thousands of resumes to many hundreds of companies. And I think the most important thing that we learned from the study is that companies seem to really differ in the extent to which they discriminate based on the characteristics uh, that we're looking at, which is both, both race and gender. You highlighted the fact that two companies appear to discriminate much more than the other companies in our study. I think it's also important to recognize that some companies appear to discriminate a, uh, quite a bit less or, or even not at all in our study. It's just massive heterogeneity in the economy and the extent to which we see this discrimination against distinctively black names. Now, importantly, that discrimination doesn't seem to be random. It's concentrated in particular industries for race discrimination, for example, firms that do things with cars and car parts like AutoNation and Genuine Parts, which owns the Napa, Napa Auto Parts brand, seem to discriminate much more than firms in other industries, including industries like uh, food stores and grocery stores, for example. So we think this is important because I think it means, first of all, there might be something we could do about this from an enforcement perspective. We also think it might be it might mean that there are things firms can do themselves that might mitigate or exacerbate the type of discrimination that you could see in their organization. The fact that all firms don't seem to discriminate in the same way suggests that this is just an inevitable feature of the labor market, that there's going to be discrimination out there always. Instead, it may be that policies and practices that firms can, can adopt, how they structure hiring, the type of training they give people might actually have an impact on these on these measures. And we hope that by releasing these data, we can start to learn some of those uh, policies and practices and share those across firms in a way that can help reduce the type of discrimination that we're seeing here. It's a fascinating study, extensive research that you've done. We mentioned areas in which we're more likely to discriminate, which companies and which areas were less likely. Yeah, so we see less discrimination on the basis of race against our distinctively black names and these fictional applications we sent in the food store industries, which I mentioned earlier. You can think about that like grocery stores, uh, we see less discrimination in freight and transport, which include companies like FedEx and UPS, um, as well as some in other utility companies uh, and communications companies like Charter and, and, and Spectrum. So again, it's not a universal phenomenon. It's not sort of inevitable that there's going to be discrimination in, in the types of job we're studying here. It does seem to have strong concentration in particular firms and, and among firms that are concentrated in these particular industries. And again, for our viewers, the resumes were identical. The qualifications and the skills were the same. It was the personal information that you changed. How then, if, if companies are watching this, people who can actually Im, you know, Im, uh, impact change, what can companies do to address discrimination and, and you know, extinguish this type of behavior? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And, and hopefully, hopefully something that we can continue to work on in, in future research. You know, the short answer is we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes at these companies. We see what our uh, our experiment is establishing is that companies do differ in the extent of discrimination that they exhibit as measured in an experiment like ours. We have some clues about what policies and practices might matter here, including things like how centralized their HR operation seems to be. Some companies, it seems that many individuals are involved in making hiring decisions at a single establishment. So it might be four or five different people calling back job applications at one store. At other companies, it looks like there might be just one person who's overseeing hiring for a couple a couple different stores across a broad, broader set of establishments. And what we infer from that is that it seems like companies where maybe they've invested a little bit more in professionalizing the hiring function and offered some kind of training, maybe that's one way in which you can mitigate the type of discrimination that you'd measure in a, in a study like ours. But you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this project and release these names and talk about the, which companies are actually in our list is to open the way for other researchers and policymakers and everyone to dig into what policies and practices really do seem to differ across these firms and think about what we can learn about how to, how to address this problem at a more systematic level. Yeah, it's a sobering report, but hopefully it's just part of a step in the right direction. Evan Rose, we really appreciate you discussing your findings with us, uh, joining us from Chicago. Okay, thanks so much. All right, let's get you something that hopefully makes you smile. Many across the country will remember Monday's total solar eclipse as one of the highlights of their lives. But for one Texas family, another event happened that day that easily outshone the eclipse. We'll explain. You're streaming CBS News. of the earth right now we got something crazy <laughs> and reach for the stars here we are <laughs> Tom. yes it's my comeback <laughs> <laughs> hey this is pretty fun but wait there's more experience thought-provoking multiple to the idea of being a human being innovative <laughs> and truly original That's reporting right. look through a telescope and go wow because there's always something new under the sun on cbs sunday morning 
this moment, terrorists could be plotting another attack. 9-11 triggered a counter-terrorist system that included a secret database. This person needs a closer look. A growing list of nearly 2 million people, including some Americans who say they're innocent. For one hour flight, I have to spend six hours to go and come back. CBS Reports explores the system, the people responsible for it, and those pushing for change. I'm not fighting against them. I'm fighting for them to do the right thing. The Watch List, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Don't miss true crime anytime you want, anywhere you go. With the 48 Hours Podcast. Real crimes, real lives, real justice. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Listen to 48 Hours on Apple Podcasts. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Imagine yourself in Manhattan with no police, no army, no mayor. The people of Haiti stare down poverty, corruption, natural disasters, and violence. 90% of the guns that are used by gangs in Haiti are American guns. But with an unbreakable spirit and eternal optimism. There are days where I cry, but we can't be discouraged. We still believe in Haiti. They're still able to look ahead with hope. Haiti is on the brink of transformation, a radical shift. Haitians are coming together and saying things must change. Fighting for Haiti, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Everybody wakes up in the morning and they are pelted with alerts that frighten them, news that agitates them. With this show, we have the time to explain what's going on. These migrants, they've been released. Explain the status that allows them to be released, to slow things down a little bit. What are the big sets of questions for China and its ambitions? Hackers are stepping up their attacks to extort victims. Let's start with easy. Who's attacking? Here's a deeper understanding of what's happening. Prime Time with John Dickerson. Stream on the free CBS News app. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. On our places, bright, shiny faces. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. All right, take a look at this. A powerful storm system moved through Texas overnight, and it caused all of this mess, major damage. This is at a strip mall in Katy, Texas, just west of Houston. Luckily, there are no reports of any injuries. That same system right now is moving east. Louisiana, Mississippi, and Alabama could see tornadoes. If you're in these areas, look out. Flooding is also a major concern from Louisiana to Georgia. Jen Carfagno from our partners at the Weather Channel has more on this storm's track. Hey there, Jen. Good day to you, Errol. We have severe weather in the south that continues to make headlines here. After a day yesterday with heavy rain and storms and possible tornadoes, we're going to continue that again today, a really nonstop with this line of thunderstorms. And the risk is there for all modes of severe weather, including tornadoes. A seven on the Torcon in communities like Hattiesburg, Mississippi. We've got a five surrounding it in communities like Mobile and even New Orleans with that risk of storms that could go tornadic. We have all the risks, out, actually. Very strong straight line winds are a possibility, perhaps in excess of 70 or even 80 miles per hour. The atmosphere just has that much energy, especially confined in that area just uh, into southern Mississippi, parts of Louisiana, stretching into Alabama. Also heavy rainfall. We've had inches of rain, one of our top uh, five wettest April days on, or top 10 April days on record in Jackson yesterday, with more rain coming in today here in Mississippi, likely that we will see some flash flooding in southern Mississippi and Alabama. We'll have these storms on the move throughout Wednesday, continuing into the overnight with that risk of severe weather continuing into the overnight hours. And then throughout uh, the day on Thursday, we will also have a threat of thunderstorms that we'll have to continue to watch, perhaps even moving over towards Augusta, Georgia, where the Masters Tournament will be getting kicked off. There is that risk of thunderstorms going severe here into northern Florida, up into Georgia, and then another area up into the Great Lakes. We'll get updates to the forecast for your neighborhood with the Weather Channel on cable or live in your favorite TV streaming device. Errol, I'll send it back to you. All right, Jen, thanks. A sixth grade Massachusetts student suffered burns on his left hand from a laptop that just spontaneously ignited during school hours. Imagining that happening to you. Uh, the superintendent of a school in Uxbridge, which is near Rhode Island's northern border, says the laptop began smoking as a student was taking a standardized test yesterday morning. 
This caused the fire alarm to go off and forced all students, teachers and staff to evacuate, of course. It has also uh, injured the young student. When I made contact, uh, he did not have bandages on his hand, he had an ice pack on his hand. Mm -hmm. And um, the, his mom was just preparing to take him for, uh, for treatment. The school district says it purchased the laptop at the beginning of this year. Officials are, of course, asking students with the same kind of laptop to power it down and hand it in to be inspected. The summer travel season is almost here, and to ease the stress of flying, one airport is helping travelers relax with the help of some furry friends. CBS News' Ian Lee. These reports. pups are on patrol at Istanbul Airport. They're not sniffing out drugs, but searching for tense travelers passing through Turkey. This dog handler says, we see a lot of demand for therapy dogs. They help people to relax. Border Collie Alida leads the pack of this pilot project, giving kisses and comfort. After your long flight or your gas stressful or you lost something, you need something like can keep you calm down and uh, something just like the dog is wonderful. Italian retriever Cookie loves belly rubs. I think it looks nice to how like friendly dogs in the airports. And research shows this positive approach has health benefits, reducing stress, raising feel good hormones and lowering blood pressure. They stop people worrying and, and they make people happy. The idea is being unleashed at airports around the world, from the UK to Miami International. He's here to keep you happy and de-stressed. He's doing a great job. Is he? <laughs> He's doing a great job, hey, bro. It's dogs doing what they do best. This is Brody. See how soft he is? Being hey, our Brody. best friends. Ian Lee, CBS News, London. For one family in Texas, the excitement of Monday's total eclipse was outdone by an even bigger event, the birth of their baby. And as CBS News' as Brooke Rogers tells us, this little girl will have a story to tell the rest of her life with a name to match. Well, congratulations, Mom. Meet Sol Celeste Alvarez, who came into the world at six pounds, nine ounces, and nine days early. So I started feeling contractions around four. I didn't think in my wildest dream that she would be born. That was very, very close. When Alicia's labor pains picked up, their only concern about time was making it to the hospital. But we ran into a lot of traffic just because yeah. everybody was going to the um, eclipse, like wanted to see the eclipse. So it took us about an hour and 30 or 30, 30 minutes to get here. Sol Celeste, whose name means celestial sun in Spanish, made her appearance just as the sun was disappearing. And then I just saw, you know, while she was in the bat in the bassinet that it started turning dark. The Alvarez's actually decided they were gonna name her Soul months ago. And they chose that because they had named her big sister Luna, which means the moon. So I wanted something that they could share together. So I love the continuous name of um, Sun and Moon and it was just a continuous love. Dad Carlos, an army veteran, says he's still marveling at her timely arrival. It was really surprising. I think that um, I didn't wake up that day thinking it was gonna be this plus a baby at the same time. But they know that somehow the stars aligned to give them the sun. When it did, you're like, okay, there must be a better purpose behind it or something that's going on maybe that I'm out of my control. And the fact that I have a moon already mm -hmm. and now I have a sun and a moon and then she was born during the eclipse that's just you just can't the odds of that it's just crazy Brooke Rogers CBS News Texas all right folks coming up in our next hour and throughout the afternoon for you right here on CBS News the stock market slides as new inflation numbers raise fears of a delay to the Fed's plan to finally start lowering interest rates we'll track the forecast of severe storm systems amid major damage in parts of the southern US and we'll head back to the White House for a look at what's cooking for tonight's state dinner in honor of the Japanese Prime Minister you're streaming CBS News
Okay, so let's just start at the beginning. Well, let me start with this. What is at stake here? What is the answer, then? Do you know why? You want me to just keep going? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Were there death threats? How is this possible? What's wrong with that argument? Are you saying they lied? Have you told the government that? Why won't you say the word crisis? You're not answering my question. This really is that scary? Does that make sense? What do you mean? What does that mean? Did any of that make what sense? You What's your response? What happened? Why? 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 It's time for the CBS News Original 60 Minutes, Sunday on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. There is no more room in our city. New York City is receiving record numbers of migrants. Today, we're going to have more than 500 adults and children come through that door. Tensions rise as shelters reach max capacity. We don't have to take care of them. CBS Reports goes inside a crisis cities and families are facing as they fight to survive. The United States still has a glimmer of hope for people to come here. Fighting for a future. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. On Face the Nation, the way to learn is to listen. We may have a recession. Listening to how someone explains themselves is so key to understanding their perspective. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Since you started La Soup in 2014, do you have any sense as to how much food you've rescued from the landfill? We've rescued four and a half million pounds. I can't even fathom how much food that is. And that's one little person in one little city in America. We're going to call this chicken piccata. We did 450 of these meals today. This is the exact dish that you and I are going to have. Yep. Oh, my really God. Is it good? Mm hmm Having a plan of how to keep people fed should be in every single city. If we eliminated food waste, could we eliminate hunger? Yes. Eating Trash, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America Decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bringing you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. This is CDA. Listen to the My Life of Crime podcast with me, Erin Moriarty. Sunday morning, actor Kirsten Dunst, plus Wayne Brady on Broadway, and a beloved cherry tree named Stumpy. Tonight, what does $100 buy you at the grocery store versus five years ago? How inflation is affecting the food staples. Then, a rare chance of daytime tornadoes in the South, and the new rules that can make water safer to drink on the CBS Evening News. Hey there, friends. Thanks for joining us here on CBS News. We appreciate you spending some of your day with us. I'm Errol Barnett. Let's make it count. Here's a look at the top stories we're tracking for you right now. Key inflation numbers head in the wrong direction, prompting fears interest rates will not be cut anytime soon. President Biden welcomes the Prime Minister of Japan for an official state visit with one of the country's most important allies. And the EPA unveils the first ever national safety standard to keep drinking water free of potentially dangerous chemicals. Also coming up for you all later this hour, former exchange student Amanda Knox, remember her? Well, she faces a new trial in Italy years after her murder conviction was thrown out. We'll break down this latest case and whether it will be the end of her ongoing legal troubles. And abortion rights move front and center in the 2024 campaign. How a ruling from Arizona Supreme Court is having ripple effects all over the country. President Biden is hosting his Japanese counterpart in Washington today for a critical state visit. The arrival ceremony for Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida happened on the South Lawn of the White House this morning. Later in the day, the Japanese leader sat down with the president for a meeting in the Oval Office. 
President Biden said the alliance between the U.S. and Japan has never been stronger. During a news conference held this afternoon, President Biden thanked the Japanese Prime Minister for his partnership, leadership and friendship. Mr. Prime Minister, through our partnership, we've strengthened the alliance. We have expanded our work together. We've raised our shared ambitions. And now the U.S.-Japan alliance is a beacon to the entire world. There's no limit what our countries can and our people can do together. Let's bring in CBS News senior White House correspondent Weijia Zhang. Uh, from your point of view, Weijia, what stood out as a major takeaway from what these two leaders did and did not say today? Well, Errol, even though President Biden did not explicitly talk about China at length, that was really the undercurrent of everything these two leaders had to say as they talked about their alliance with regard to bolstering their relationship uh, when it comes to their military, cooperating, integrating their systems more. Even when they were talking about artificial intelligence and cooperating in space, these are all things that are tangentially at the least related to China as it continues its aggressions and its goals of dominance, especially in that region. And so this really underscored the relationship well, between the, the U.S. The and Japan. I mean, you might remember that President Biden, when he first came here to the White House, the first country he, vis he welcomed to visit here uh, was Japan. And so it really just reinforces what he has been saying all along, because Errol, you know, so regardless of what we are talking about in terms of Joe Biden's foreign policy, China is going to be at the center of it. But he did stress again that that relationship is on the mend, if you will, because there were some icy uh, months that caused some concern because the two leaders were not talking. So the president made it a point to say that he is in regular contact now with President Xi Jinping of China. And Weijia, I want to ask you about the rare area of disagreement as we see all these topics of unity as it relates to uh, Japan's efforts, the Japan-owned company Nippon Steel, to purchase U.S. steel, which President Biden himself opposes and said today that he remains committed to American workers. Help us understand the president's thinking there and how it impacts the relationship. Sure. So you're absolutely right. It was a little bit of an awkward moment because the president had just spoken at length about the economic relationship between these two countries and how much both are investing into the other one. Uh, but at the same time, we know that the president has opposed a deal for Japan to purchase U.S. steel, a $15 billion deal, because this administration, the president especially, says that that massive company that has a legacy here in America ought to stay here. And today he was asked about it and said that, you know, his commitment to steel workers remains. And he didn't say much more, Errol, except uh, that, you know, he would continue to support the American company and imply that, you know, he still opposed to that deal going through. That's right. And U.S. Steel based in Pittsburgh. We know President Biden um, received the endorsement of the U.S. Steel workers after refusing to allow this deal to go through. And of course, it's an election year in Pennsylvania, certainly one of the many swing states. And it came just after the, chi uh, the, 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 the Japanese prime minister said he hopes that there is um, uh, discussions underway for both sides to be happy. So that's one area of disagreement. We also heard the president um, answer a question as it relates to his conversations about um, the war between Israel and Hamas. What can you tell us uh, about what he said and if it sheds any new light into the U.S. relationship between President Biden and, and the Israeli Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu. Well, we know that in his most recent interview, the president said that Netanyahu had made a mistake with his approach to handling the war in Gaza. Uh, we also know that, you know, during that conversation that he had with Netanyahu, uh, he did warn essentially that if Israel did not change its course of action, then the U.S. would have to. But one big question still remains, Errol, even after today, even though the president was directly asked whether he was prepared to condition aid uh, to Israel. And he did not say one way or another, but he did stress that Netanyahu made commitments 
that it appeared he was following through on them and separately said that the U.S. would continue to um, uh, support Israel's right to defend itself. So you ask if there's anything new there. Not really. I mean, the president is stressing what the administration. All right, we're going to get you now to Maryland, where you see Governor Wes Moore giving an update on cleanup efforts underway at the site of the key bridge collapse. Let's listen. Whether you were born and raised in Maryland or whether you've traveled here from around the country, you are and you continue to be the very best of us. And we are deeply grateful. Now, this morning, I received a briefing from Unified Command, and today, I will provide updates on the four directives that I've issued to our team. First, we need to give closure and comfort to the families. Second, we need to clear the channel and open the vessel to all traffic to the port. Third, we need to take care of all the people who have been directly impacted by this crisis. And four, we need to and we will rebuild the key bridge. First, on providing closure to the families. Last week, the Maryland State Police recovered the remains of one of the remaining victims. Maryland is praying for the family of Menor Sandoval and all of his loved ones. They are in our thoughts, in our hearts, and will always have our support. And in this moment, it's important that we not just recognize the tragic loss of these six Marylanders who perished during the Key Bridge collapse, but also remember the ways in which they have lifted our state up in the way that they lived. The night of the collapse, these men were tending to our state's infrastructure for our collective benefit. Their work had dignity. Their contributions will never be forgotten. On the day of the collapse, I said that we would stop at nothing to support these families. And the Maryland State Police currently has over 25 personnel assigned to recovery operations on a daily basis. Our Director of Immigrant Affairs, Adriana Lee, has been in direct and constant contact with each of the families. And we currently have 30 members of state government assigned to helping these families in their hour of need, and that work will continue. Second, on clearing the federal channel and opening the vessel traffic to the port. I've said it before, and I will keep on saying it. This work is remarkably complex. I ask you, I'll show you on the slide here what we're dealing with. So this over here, this over here is an aerial vision, an aerial rendering of what we have. As you see here, the dolly trapped underneath the bridge. The thing I want to point out here, and what's important to recognize, is this piece over here. All right, well, we'll continue to listen to the, listen into the Maryland governor as he gives updates on the cleanup efforts underway for the Key Bridge collapse, uh, noting that they want to give closure for families but also reopen that key essential waterway uh, for the port of Baltimore. And we also have this breaking news coming to us out of Philadelphia. There are early reports of a shooting at an event celebrating Eid al-Fitr. This is the end of Ramadan. Uh, there are few details available at this moment, but as you see, uh, CBS News Philadelphia is covering this story, and we want to dip into their coverage and see what they're learning at this moment. What led to this latest gunfire in Philadelphia? This is West Philly that we're looking at. Again, a large police presence out there at this point and folks still lingering about the area as police are continuing to investigate. So there's a flurry of activity as you can see there from Chopper 3's aerial perspective. Again, our crews heading there on the ground. Hopefully they will get more information as police are setting up a staging area for the media to hopefully give us more information. And as soon as we get those details, we'll of course pass them along to you as quickly as possible. But again, several people already in custody. 
multiple people shot. This was some kind of a community event there at a park at 46th and Girard, 48th and Girard in West Philadelphia, Clara Muhammad Square Park. Uh, that's what we're looking at now. That's where all of this transpired just before three o'clock this afternoon. Uh, it, some kind of a community event we understand was happening out there. Food trucks were there and still there. Tents are set up. So a very active scene playing out as police continue to investigate what may have prompted the gunfire. Multiple people shot, several people in custody. Chopper 3 hovering above a very active police investigation with a flurry of activity still happening and also a large police presence still there on the scene. So we're seeing again the Clara Muhammad Park here in West Philadelphia where this shooting happened. We're seeing plenty of tents that were set up out there, food trucks set up as well. So clearly some kind of an event was happening this afternoon. And that is where the gunfire transpired there at the park. So multiple people shot again. No idea as to how many just yet uh, and the conditions of those victims either. Still trying to gather that information as well. Uh, but again, this is West Philadelphia chopper hovering above this scene as we are waiting on our crews to make their way there to the scene to hopefully get more information. Also, to talk to witnesses because we can only imagine this happening again at, at what seemed to have been a community event. There must have been multiple, multiple witnesses to this gunfire. Uh, multiple people shot. We can only imagine again multiple witnesses to this shooting as this was some kind of a community event with the tent set up. Food trucks, you can see the massive police presence there trying to cordon off that scene and also many people still walking around that area uh, still likely processing what happened there this afternoon. Several people though in custody, still no idea as to a motive behind the shootings, no idea as to what may have sparked this violence. Uh, but this is West Philadelphia, 48th and Girard Avenue. Clara Muhammad Park is what we're looking at here from an aerial view, Chopper 3 hovering above there as we see a flurry of activity again. Police. Also, people that were attending this event still lingering around as police continue to investigate this shooting. Uh, again, we're just hoping to get more information as police are setting up a staging area for the media. You can see the police presence there. Again, a large police presence to what was likely a large community event as we're seeing people still lingering around there even at this hour as they've cordoned off that park where this all happened. So we're, we're hoping to gather more information from our crews who are heading there on the ground, hopefully, to get more information from witnesses out there. There seems to be no shortage of them likely because this was a community event, it would appear, and many people still lingering around as police are continuing to investigate exactly what sparked this multiple shooting. So just to recap again, this is 48th and Girard in West Philadelphia, Clara Muhammad Park there. Multiple people shot some kind of a community event was happening there in that park. You can still see people lingering around. You can still see tents that were set up and food trucks that were there as well. Uh, but everything has been brought to a standstill now as police continue to investigate. Several people are in custody. We do know that much, but we don't know the catalyst behind this violence this afternoon in West Philadelphia. But still plenty of people there, again, uh, lingering around, possibly trying to figure out exactly what happened. Uh, there should be no shortage of witnesses for police to talk to, as this was some kind of a community event that was happening there in West Philadelphia. So we, of course, are, are following all the details that we have, hoping to hear more from our ground crews as they make their way to this scene. It looks like a large scene as well. This was a large area that appeared to be having this community event, a large out just outside of the park as well. You can see there, it looks to be a school there possibly. Uh, it looks to be a school there in that area as well. We're not sure how they're affected or if at all at this point, um, but we'll hope to get that information for you as well. Chopper 3 widening out for us to give us some idea as to the scope of how large this uh, gathering may have been in that area of West Philadelphia. Multiple people shot this afternoon just before three o'clock. Several people in custody, still no idea as to the motive behind this. Also, no idea as to the condition of the victims in this case, but a large police presence there. As you can see, 
in, and necessarily so because this does appear to be a large area uh, that was having this community event, a large part of that West Philadelphia area there at 48th and Girard where this community event was taking place today. Uh, so we still are trying to gather more information about what kind of an event this was, who was hosting it possibly, uh, how many people may have been out there uh, when all of this uh, started happening, when the shooting started happening just before 3 o'clock this afternoon. A uh, large police presence. Everything has been shut down. It looked to me, I also saw what looked to be a SEPTA bus uh, or a trolley or something that was, was in the midst of all this being shut down as well. So there, there's no movement there, as you can imagine, as police continue to investigate this crime scene. So we're hoping to, to get our crews out there as quickly as possible. They're on the way. Chopper is giving us this vantage point from above, which really kind of shows you the magnitude and the scope of how large this investigation is and how large this community event may have been there in West Philly at 48th and Girard. Again, it looks to be a school there as well. Uh, a community event certainly taking place. We saw the tents. We saw the food trucks. We saw multiple people and can still see multiple people walking around and lingering around the area as police continue to investigate this crime scene at this point. Uh, so we, we are still waiting to hear more information about what may have been happening, what kind of an event this was, how many people again may have been there, but we can still see the residual effects of how big this was uh, with all the tents and the food trucks and the people still out there gathering uh, around that scene. So um, again, a, a, a huge scene, multiple police cars, multiple police cars around the area, multiple police officers in that park uh, standing there gathering more evidence and more information. So we are still waiting to, to hear more. There's a police staging area that's being set up as uh, we get more information, hopefully, from the ground and from police officers about what may have happened here at Clara Muhammad Square in West Philadelphia, 48th and Girard Avenue on a, a nice warm afternoon, ultimately, uh, and what looked to be possibly a community event uh, that was happening out there in West Philly on a nice warm Wednesday afternoon. So we're still hoping to... to We've been listening to CBS News Philadelphia uh, carefully reporting what's known at this stage, which is that multiple people have been shot during some type of community event with several others in custody right now. It appears police will be um, addressing the media and sharing new information on this. And as soon as that happens, we'll bring it to you live. We'll continue listening in to CBS News Philadelphia. And at this stage, take a very short break and be back momentarily. But stay right where you are. You're streaming CBS News. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. Does this carrier strike group stand ready? It's just incredible to see there's an active search and rescue operation going on 12 hours after this accident. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the 
the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful. To keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land this power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. People with developmental disabilities were once sequestered by the hundreds of thousands in institutions. Many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because lack of attention, lack of imagination, lack of uh, adequate manpower. Disability activists have since torn down barriers blocking them from living at home or in the community. We conclude that Title II of the ADA requires states to provide community-based treatment for persons with mental disabilities. But of the 16,000 people who remain in state-operated institutions, half are in five states, and Illinois is one of them. I don't want to live in the institution. It makes me feel discriminated against. Do you think there are people living in institutions in Illinois that don't need to be living there? Yeah, because they're proving it as soon as they get out. Meryl Barnett at the CBS Broadcast Center here in New York. We are following breaking news out of Philadelphia. You're seeing coverage from our CBS News uh, Philadelphia affiliate. There are reports there of a shooting at a community event in West Philadelphia. There were a number of people shot, and at this stage, several people are in custody. Let's listen in now. I think our local affiliate is listening to what witnesses say happened police investigation. I'm assuming you're, you're seeing photos of what is this unfolding investigation right now. Best information we have from our police sources, multiple people shot and uh, the word multiple people used again to describe those taken into custody. Um, who did what? How this happened? Uh, sources telling me that uh, they believe it's an argument, uh, but uh, there was uh, a large gathering there and uh, some festivities. It is not clear yet if there is a connection to what was happening there and, and why, uh, you know, gunfire burst out uh, on what is a uh, rather relatively cloudy but nice afternoon there in, uh, in West Philadelphia. Uh, that specific part of West Philadelphia, I know it well. It's, uh, there's a park there. Uh, there's a square. Uh, and the uh, concentration, though, of this investigation right now seems to center on this gathering. And again, our best information suggesting that with um, multiple people injured, wounded uh, from gunfire, uh, we're awaiting word on the nature of their conditions. You know, Penn Presbyterian Hospital, if that was one of the facilities to receive the uh, wounded, that is not far at all, maybe within a m half a mile to three quarters of a mile. And as well as um, those taken into custody, whether they went right to uh, the shooting investigation division, which is at 15th and Calla Hill, or to the nearby, um, I believe would be the 16th district, all left to be sorted out. So still working my sources, and uh, I, I will make note, uh, it is unusual to not be able to get some better information at this rate. I believe we are into uh, maybe a half hour now of what was uh, a call for every officer in the city to respond. I can't remember, Natasha, in, in, in my memory, uh, the last time I, I saw one of those radio calls go out for a, a citywide dispatch of all available officers to respond. But in my own efforts to get to this section of West Philadelphia, I saw police units struggling to get around traffic along the parkway, along Kelly Drive, the art museum, onto the Schuylkill Expressway. Uh, they were coming in from all directions trying to access this area that is not very far from the uh, Philadelphia Zoo. Uh, Natasha, I'll hand it back to you if you have any questions or anything that we can kind of sort out. Again, we're at the mercy of some of our sources who uh, typically are good about getting right back to us, but uh, are somewhat quiet for the moment. Yeah, Joe, uh, speaking of our sources, I'm just getting word here from a source uh, that the shooting occurred at the end of a Ramadan celebration 
near the mosque. Uh, so a, a huge police presence there, but that is just the latest information, just getting that. I'm certain you can work your sources more and, and, and possibly add to that or possibly get some more clarification on that. Uh, but again, that is the latest that I'm hearing through a, a trusted source here. Um, so we will, of course, uh, stay on top of this and, and gather more information, hopefully, once we get to that staging area where police will be giving us more details about what was happening there, what kind of gathering this was, and what may have prompted this violence this afternoon, Joe. Yeah, Natasha, I'm at 47th and Parkside right now, so right at the edge of Fairmount Park, right in the Parkside neighborhood, and uh, the, uh, the street is shut down at this point, so can't go any further. Let's see, it would be south or eastbound on uh, Belmont. So I'm, it's south, make that, on Belmont. Uh, so that's a very large perimeter, and I know Obviously, we're not going to reveal identities or, or, or play clips of minors, but for reporting sake, you know, a number of children took to the Citizens app describing an absolutely horrific and, 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 and scary number of events running from, uh, uh, from gunfire. You know, the thing that really sticks with me is that the child described that this wasn't the usual West Philadelphia shooting. And I just can't really effectively describe, I'm trying to understand through the eyes of a child what that could be. You said, I'm sorry, Joe, you said what, what you're hearing is that the children are describing it as, as not a typical uh, type of shooting. Or Tell me again what, what you were hearing. Not a typical type of shooting. Uh, that it is so, it, he was, his words suggested that these things are so commonplace in in his neighborhood and that today was not the typical kind of shooting which is is just um there are no words to describe those uh so small sentiments from the mouth of a child yeah uh natasha i'm i'm uh, actually in an area it's um it's a charter school and there are an awful lot of parents out here. I know the Philadelphia Police Department, I see just a few moments ago, tweeting out that they are working to reunite families, children and their parents. Mm -hmm. So I'm on Belmont and uh, I'm still in my car, but I'm gonna get out and see if I can sort of round up here. I'll yeah, Joe, we can definitely see, um, just don't, don't wanna interrupt you as you're getting out of the car there and you'll be able to gauge for yourself when you get closer, but we're just seeing a lot of people still lingering around this scene. I, I can't tell if there are children or, you know, it, it's an aerial perspective here, as you know, uh, but there's still a lot of people lingering around this scene uh, as police are continuing to invest, investigate. This is near the Philadelphia Masjid Sister Clara Muhammad School. It's near the square where the shooting happened. Uh, it ha the shooting happened at the Clara Muhammad Square in West Philadelphia at the park there. Uh, but again, according to my sources, uh, this was, a, it looks to be a, a big celebration. It was the end of Ramadan celebration. Uh, so that is what I'm hearing. Uh, so we, we again, are, are trying to get more clarification as to what was taking place there. What could have possibly led to this kind of violence with multiple people shot, several people in custody now, as you've been mentioning, Joe. Our, so I have, uh just looking here on the ground and, and, and people are just uh, really congregated outside of a location. It's on Belmont near um, Leedy Street. So it's a very small side street. It's next to a self storage. And it looks like it is the Discovery Charter School. I'm trying to make out the full name. But what I do see is a large congregation of people who appear to be parents. And it looks like they are just waiting outside of the, of the fence of the school itself. Uh, police are sort of um, controlling who's kind of coming and going around here. But uh, again, I, the, the look of, um, I mean, you, you see this, on, on, unfortunately, all too, it's on the all too familiar scene, sadly, with parents waiting for information. Uh, lots of folks on their phones. And again, uh, officers, I believe it was Officer Tanya Little with Public Affairs tweeting out not too long ago their efforts to try to reunite family members, which 
you know, certainly suggest that it was uh, just chaos yeah. uh, over at that square. Yeah, just a, a frightening... Off, like going, yes. Yeah, just a frightening scene. I can only imagine if these are parents who are trying to be reunited with their kids in the midst of this, what just happened to be a multiple shooting that just took place. I'm certain they've got to be frightened and terrified, uh, as you can imagine, Joe. Um, so we're seeing, again, a, a massive police presence here from Chopper 3 hovering above this scene. We are also seeing folks who are on the ground as well, police officers walking through the park, gathering evidence, gathering information, still people lingering about, walking around the scene as police have cordoned off a certain, uh, the park there, certain parts of it. But, but from what we're seeing here from, from Chopper 3, this is a, this is a huge scene. Uh, because, again, this was a community event that was taking place there. We see the tents. We see food trucks. Uh, we see even uh, debris littering the area, likely because when this happened, people went scurrying away from, from, from the violence and from the shooting. Yeah, and I see on the, and I'm looking on Google Maps here to get, uh, obviously, a sense of exactly how wide an area this is. So for folks not too familiar, Lancaster Avenue seems to be on one side of it and 48th and 47th and down to Westminster. Uh, there's the old Cathedral Cemetery in this area, and it is just roped off from as far as I can see. I can't get any closer th than where I'm at now. Um, most of these parents are on their phones right now, and I I'm trying to make a, a an introduction to find out if we can learn some information about what, what they're doing here. And um, so I'm going to keep working that. And again, to summarize, Natasha, we're still waiting to hear exact particulars. Multiple, multiple several people make that shot, we're told, uh, according to confirmation from our assignment desk and nurse sources, mm -hmm. as well as several arrests made. Yeah, so we're hearing that too, Joe. And also, Joe, we're also getting this information We've been listening to the CBS News Philadelphia station cover this incident, which happened within the past 60 minutes. Multiple people shot at what was meant to be a celebratory community event. At this stage, several people are in custody, but in police rushing to the scene and closing down surrounding streets, our station there sharing that police are still working at this moment to reunite children with their parents. So an extremely unnerving moment for so many people. We will continue listening in um, to all the developments as they unfold and bring you updates as soon as there is more to report. We wanted to show you in real time there what was happening. Um, at this moment, we'll take a short break. And after that break, we're going to speak with the Attorney General of Arizona about that state's near total abortion ban that everyone's talking about and could have an impact on the uh, presidential election later this year. So stay where you are. You're streaming CBS News. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Nate has one of the quickest minds I've ever seen. Tony has a way of making people feel comfortable. Gail has this unbelievable knack to ask the question that you're asking at home. I've been told I could talk to a tree, and that's pretty much true. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. It didn't seem like anything could happen because nothing ever happens in East Palestine, but it did. Authorities released toxic fumes from five derailed train cars. Resident, please evacuate. Acute bronchitis due to chemical fumes. Did you ever have these problems before the derailment? No, ma'am. This neighborhood's not safe no more. We can assure the community that there's not vinyl chloride entering their communities. Then why are there so many people feeling these various symptoms of bloody noses or difficulty breathing and bronchitis? That's a hard question to answer. We're talking about one of the most blatant releases of a mixture of some of the most toxic chemicals that we've seen in America. I feel like now I have a duty to warn other communities. If my daughter has to watch me die of cancer, at least it saves someone else.
this case. It's like a screenplay, something straight out of Hollywood. But it's not fiction. It's 48 hours. Human remains found this week. Four families shattered. There's no physical evidence. The mystery would haunt investigators for years. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Get it, like a John Grisham novel. A gripping true crime original. 48 Hours, now streaming on the free CBS News app. This is CBS. of a lifetime. Seeing the Earth from space, it was so exhilarating. But the risks that come with the territory. There have been four fatal accidents. That's a 1% fatal accident rate. Might make you look before you launch. If you had one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, we'd have a public crisis. Space Tourism, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Errol Barnett at the CBS Broadcast Center in New York. You are watching aerial footage coming into our newsroom out of West Philadelphia, where within the past hour, there has been a shooting and multiple people have been shot. At this stage, we understand several people are in custody. There's a major police presence around this park where a community event earlier today um, commemorating the end of Ramadan, it's Eid al-Fitr, was taking place. So you had a lot of families um, celebrating this afternoon. At this stage, we understand police are working to reunite children with their parents. Uh, we did see a potential staging area for police to give the press updates on exactly what's unfolding right now. Uh, we will continue to watch this and uh, stay close to our Philly station to bring you updates as they become available. For now, though, we turn to this other major story we're following today. Former President Donald Trump is now weighing in on the Arizona Supreme Court, allowing the enforcement of a near total abortion ban. The former president says it goes too far, adding that abortion is, quote, all about states' rights. He goes on to say it will be straightened out. Yesterday, Arizona Supreme Court ruled that a law which criminalizes most abortions can be enforced, eventually, essentially superseding a 15-week ban that's also on the books. For context here, this 1864 law, which is now back in effect, was created nearly half a century before Arizona became a state, before automobiles were even invented, and before Alfred Nobel patented dynamite. I think that puts this into context. Governor Katie Hobbs, who's a Democrat, is one of many politicians who's come out against the court's decision. On CBS Mornings, she appeared confident that voters in Arizona will approve a proposed constitutional amendment that would add the right to an abortion to the state's constitution. Arizonans don't, don't support extreme abortion bans, and this 15-week ban is still extreme. It, again, no exception for rape or incest, no regard for complications of pregnancy. Uh, that's what will be in place. Uh, and again, Arizonans will have the ability to weigh in on this uh, with a constitutional amendment in November. We're now joined by Arizona's Attorney General, Chris Mays, uh, for further discussion on this. Uh, we, we appreciate you spending time with CBS News today. I just want to highlight for our viewers that you've said you will not prosecute doctors or women in violation of this law. That's a very firm stance, but help us understand it. How can you make that decision and ensure that no woman or doctor goes to jail in these next weeks or months? Hi, Errol. Thanks for having me. Uh, well, look, yeah, I have made that promise to the people of Arizona 
that we will never prosecute a doctor, a nurse, a pharmacist, a woman, anybody helping a, a woman seek an abortion in Arizona, despite this 1864 abortion ban. Uh, I will add another thing that uh, didn't exist when this ban was passed, which is women couldn't even vote in Arizona at that time. So, you know, we... Um, we, I will not uh, enforce what is essentially an unconstitutional abortion ban. We also are, are still in the process now of looking at our options to potentially appeal this, uh, uh, either down uh, to a superior court or up to the United States Supreme Court. Um, so we're looking, th everything is on the table right now to try to stop the implementation of this outrageous, egregious uh, abortion ban that is an affront, an affront to the freedom of, of all Arizonans. And so, um, you know, that's why I have said we're not going to prosecute this. We have a lot of other important things we have to deal with in Arizona. And putting doctors and nurses in jail for abortion care is definitely not one of them. Yeah. And, and because Arizona was not yet a state, this was actually a law enacted by the first territorial legislature, and this was happening during the Civil War. Just to give you as context of how old the law that stands now is, but you would agree that there is a real chilling effect that this type of ruling and this type of news coverage will give to women who are seeking this type of treatment and health care in the short term, even if this ruling has been stayed and there's a delay until it actually is enacted. What does this mean? For people in Arizona right now who will or may need for medical reasons an abortion. So true. And that's what's so uh, frankly enraging about this decision is that it will have a chilling effect on uh, reproductive care in Arizona, on abortion care. That is why so many uh, Democratic attorneys general have called me and offered uh, to the state of Arizona their help. Um, and we're working with our surrounding states to, you know, try to set up a system where we can get women to states like California or or Nevada that have uh, abortion rights. Um, the vice president of the United States called me yesterday to offer her support. So we know that there until in the period between, you know, a, 45 to 60 days from now, and then that ballot initiative that our governor talked about in November, there will be a period potentially where women could completely lose the their access to abortion care. And, you know, I'm worried that women will die as a result of this. And, you know, shame on Donald Trump, to be honest with you, shame on Donald Trump and the United States Supreme Court for making this a possibility. Donald Trump appointed the justices on the Supreme Court that overturned Roe versus Wade in the Dobbs decision and made this possible in states like Arizona that we could be taken back to 1864, to 1864, and that's what the people of Arizona woke up to yesterday and are now grappling with today. It's a major wake-up call for people in Arizona, a, a purple state, a state in which you yourself, I think, won your most recent election by a few hundred votes back in 2022. Uh, Republicans like Donald Trump, like Carrie Lake, uh, where you are, have voiced displeasure with this ruling. I'm wondering if, while in the short term, women could lose their lives and this has a chilling effect, if that then changes the political calculation in November as far as issues that will be on the ballot and independents who have a, a massive voice in Arizona and, and what they might change in the process. Absolutely. And, you know, you're right. I won my, my election by 280 votes, and I won because, I believe, because uh, of the Dobbs decision and because so many independents and Republicans were outraged by the decision of the United States Supreme Court to deprive American women of the right to uh, control their own bodies. And so, you know, this was, I think, a political earthquake in Arizona. 
everything changed uh, when the Arizona Supreme Court decided to reimpose an 1864 ban on Arizona women. Uh, absolutely everything changed. And I think that uh, Republicans are um, sort of like the dog that caught the bus on this one. I think that they're going to uh, they are going to rue the day um, that that they decided to, uh, you know, uh, advocate for this total abortion ban in my state. And to provide a bit of context for viewers, every ballot measure on this issue since the overturning of Roe versus Wade, uh, these ballot measures measures to reinstate uh, women's rights on this front has been successful, even in red states. And Arizona would be a must win uh, for potential President Donald Trump again. Um, Arizona Attorney General Chris Mays, we appreciate you spending some time with CBS News today. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, we are still watching an unfolding situation in West Philadelphia where a shooting a short time ago has led to a massive police presence. A number of uh, people are in custody, but police are trying to reunite parents with their children. You can just imagine what that feels like. We're going to stay close to our station there in Philadelphia and bring you the latest information after this short break. Washington is the seat of power. Um, national security, foreign policy, global economics, every story comes through Washington in some way. We bring some of the most powerful voices in America to the table. We don't just ask the questions, you have to go deeper. We try to understand what's at the heart of the issue we're talking about to then come forward with solutions. Face the Nation on CBS. The justices ruled that Harvard and the University of North Carolina violated the Constitution. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to end affirmative action in college admissions, uncertainty sets in for some students of color. Affirmative action really gave us an equal opportunity. CBS Reports explores the historic decision and what it means for those chasing an opportunity to change their lives. I knew that college was the ticket to break this cycle. The end of affirmative action, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Okay, let's go. You guys good? Hey. All right, we good? Keep going. The clock, it's ticking. Off we go. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. It's time for 60 Minutes, Sundays on CBS. An original documentary from CBS Reports. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever. Curing diseases, scientific breakthroughs, making lives better. It can help us with medical discovery, scientific discoveries, doing better agriculture, having cures for things like Alzheimer's. It's also going to really transform the way we work. The uplifting potential of artificial intelligence is limitless. It gives you a friend, somebody to chat with 24-7 that is non-judgmental. He makes me feel loved and desired. And so are its downfalls. The problem with all this AI is that it's unpredictable and uncontrollable. The choices we make now will have lasting effects for decades, maybe even centuries. The ChatGPT revolution, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We are about to see American weapons in the hands of Mexican cartels. A gun pipeline to Mexico. We are arming the cartels. 100%, no doubt about it. Happening right under our noses. Uh, who's doing something about this? Nobody. A CBS Reports exclusive. Most Americans have no idea that we are effectively arming the enemy next door. This is the story the American people need to know. Arming cartels, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides, Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Meryl Barnett at the CBS Broadcast Center in New York as we follow breaking news out of Philadelphia. What you're seeing now on the right of your screen is aerial footage of a park where earlier today there were celebrations commemorating the end of Ramadan. Shooting took place, multiple people were shot, and at this hour a number of people are in custody. On the left of your screen, you're seeing our CBS News Philadelphia anchors 
Yuki Washington and Natasha Brown walk viewers through the latest information as police try to reconnect children disconnected from their parents. Let's listen in to their coverage and see what new information unfolds. Watching us, there's no need to go out and try to find out what is going on. More information, we will definitely provide that to you once it is provided to us in our newsroom. And just stay in the house, stay safe, because you never know where the people are that were shot. I mean, that, that word. Well, yeah, I'm sorry, yeah. I'm just getting information in my that, ear. Yeah, okay. Joe Holden, he's working his sources as well, Yuki. Let's okay. get back to him. I know he's on the ground. Hey there, Joe, what do you know? Hey, Natasha and Yuki, I'm at uh, Wyalusine and Belmont. Just spoke to some of the neighbors out here. They're giving me some of the information that they saw as responding units were rushing in here. Uh, they're giving me some idea of just the, the emergency response, uh, how police were flooding the area after reports of gunshots in the middle of what they're describing to be prayer in the park. Uh, clearly, uh, it was a, a gathering uh, for a religious event, uh, according to one of the eyewitnesses uh, who had just been passing by. I, I was interviewing a woman who works in a uh, home health care setting behind me. And as uh, we were chatting about what we were trying to get our heads around, and uh, this uh, young man passes by and describes it was prayer in the park, and all they did was just start shooting. Uh, we are still trying to determine uh, to what extent how many people uh, are possibly wounded uh, in this mid-afternoon shooting in the Parkside section of West Philadelphia. Also, our sources are telling us that, uh, you know, several people have been taken into custody. Uh, how that all got sorted out so quickly, it's another question that remains on the table. You saw Ray Strickland earlier in this stream. Uh, I'm about a block away from him. Just wanted to head out and uh, speak to some folks who I see coming and going here. Um, now headed back in the direction of Girard Avenue. So to give you some perspective of where I'm at and where this chaos erupted is um, where Chopper was hovering over. Uh, you saw Old Cathedral Cemetery there and the park and the square. Uh, that is to my left by about two blocks. And all I've seen since the time here trying to talk to some folks is, you know, the responding police that are continuing to zoom in and out of this neighborhood. It's as much a traffic control situation that is unfolding as it is we see, you know, numerous uh, school-aged children and their parents uh, coming and going through the neighborhood. The uh, media staging area that you've referenced is what I'm heading back towards right now. So that's at Gerard and Belmont. So trying to see if there's anybody else who might be able to give us some perspective and, and explain to us what it was that they saw or understand what they heard. But uh, I don't know, Natasha and Yuki, if we have that sound turned around just yet. The woman's name mm -hmm. was Teresa. And she described it, you know, just a series of very alarming and, and, and you know, really surprising series of events. And Joe, yeah, we, I understand from the control room, we can listen to that once again. Is that correct, uh, Becca? Okay, let's listen to that, Joe, and we will get back to you in just a bit. Hold on, here it is. We just got shot at, two people got shot, and we was just at the park, too. Like, literally, like, literally just at the park. And they just, they, they just caught somebody. Bro, like, this is scary because I almost got shot. Yeah, Natasha and Yuki, I referenced that when I was on the phone with you about 20 minutes ago. Um, the level of description there from that young man, not a uh, typical shooting uh, in his experience here in West Philadelphia. Stop and think about that for a moment, because he, in his words while he was on the Citizen app, further described um, bullets coming so close to him. And again, wrapping up with the words, stay safe out there. So uh, from the mouths of babes and just the innocence there of a young man running home out of breath and describing what was a, a certainly a harrowing series of events for him. Yeah, it's really disturbing, uh, as you've been Extremely. saying, Joe. And just to hear him recount having to escape being shot at a park 
when he said they were just chilling, ultimately, in his words, uh, you know, and the fact that there, there's now normalcy to shootings where even he knew this wasn't normal. That's the saddening part about it. And I, I guess, you know, with, with technology today, you have an immediate uh, take, a hot take, as they call it, on, on what uh, just happened. And, and that was this young man living, uh, helping us to understand what it was that he had just witnessed. And um, it's an extremely personal moment. To, I watched as he was doing it live. That's more than an hour ago at this point. And it sticks with me that he draws the comparison between uh, what is an everyday shooting in his neighborhood and then what we have here today, where other folks have described what was a prayer in the park completely disrupted uh, by bullets. Speaking of those bullets, Joe, uh, from the people there on the street, have you gathered any information as far as... I've been listening to some, some really eye-opening and insightful coverage from CBS News Philadelphia. The team there on the ground still gathering information after a shooting at a park at what was meant to be a celebratory community event led to multiple people being shot and a number of people in custody uh, and the child there coming to terms with the fact that he could have been shot and how scared he was. We'll continue listening. We'll take a short break and be back with more after this. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh! <laughs> and reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Multiple to the idea of being a human being. Innovative <laughs> and truly original That's reporting. Right. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. At this moment, terrorists could be plotting another attack. 9-11 triggered a counter-terrorist system that included a secret database. This person needs a closer look. A growing list of nearly 2 million people, including some Americans who say they're innocent. For one hour flight, I have to spend six hours to go and come back. CBS Reports explores the system, the people responsible for it, and those pushing for change. I'm not fighting against them. I'm fighting for them to do the right thing. The Watch List, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Don't miss true crime anytime you want, anywhere you go. With the 48 Hours Podcast, real crimes, real lives, real justice. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Listen to 48 Hours on Apple Podcasts. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Imagine yourself in Manhattan with no police, no army, no mayor. The people of Haiti stare down poverty, corruption, natural disasters, and violence. 90% of the guns that are used by gangs in Haiti are American guns. But with an unbreakable spirit and eternal optimism. There are days where I cry, but we can't be discouraged. We still believe in Haiti. They're still able to look ahead with hope. Haiti is on the brink of transformation, a radical shift. Haitians are coming together and saying things must change. Fighting for Haiti, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Everybody wakes up in the morning and they are pelted with alerts that frighten them, news that agitates them. With this show, we have the time to explain what's going on. These migrants, they've been released. Explain the status that allows them to be released, to slow things down a little bit. What are the big sets of questions for China and its ambitions? Hackers are stepping up their attacks to extort victims. Let's start with easy. Who's attacking? Here's a deeper understanding of what's happening. Prime Time with John Dickerson. Stream on the free CBS News app. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. On our places, bright, shiny faces. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. Tonight, what does $100 buy you at the grocery store versus five years ago? How inflation is affecting the food staples. Then, a rare chance of daytime tornadoes in the South. And the new rules that can make water safer to drink. On the CBS Evening News.
We appreciate you staying with CBS News. I'm Errol Barnett at the CBS Broadcast Center in New York as we track two major stories this afternoon approaching 4 p.m. here on the East Coast. What you're seeing here is footage from CBS News Philadelphia, our station there, now switching to an aerial on the right side of your screen after a shooting took place with the number of people shot and the number of people in custody. On the left of your screen is the Dow Jones Industrial Average as the markets close on Wall Street following a hotter-than-expected inflation report. We're going to dig into the economics of things hitting your pocketbook in just a moment. But first, we want to bring you the latest out of Philadelphia. Uh, right now, CBS News Philadelphia is still gathering information, and putting details together. Let's quickly listen in to what happened at this community celebration that turned into what a child said uh, that they could have been shot and how scared young people are. Let's listen. Of those wounded, we don't have any conditions on um, the extent of their injuries, but this was described uh, by a, a, a juvenile to me who I spoke to off camera uh, as a prayer in the park event when yeah. at 245 shots rang out here. Clearly, we continue to work our sources and find out the reasons why. Breaking news right now at 4 on CBS News Philadelphia. Several people are shot at a large gathering at 47th and Girard Avenue in West Philadelphia. Chopper 3 live over that scene there in West Philly this afternoon. It happened about an hour ago, just before 3 o'clock this afternoon. We're told several people are in custody. Multiple people were shot, still don't know the extent of their injuries. There is a very large police presence still there at that scene, and Mayor Sherelle Parker is on on the way to the scene. That's the latest that we have right now. Good afternoon to you, everyone. We're also streaming live on CBS News Philadelphia. I'm Natasha Brown. And I'm Siafa Lewis. We have several crews on the scene in the neighborhood where the shooting, shooting occurred. Let's get right back to CBS News Philadelphia reporter Joe Holden. Joe. Well, Joe's been on the phone uh, with us throughout uh, most of this, about the last 35 minutes or so, kind of walking us through the scene there, the surrounding area, the, the media staging area, which is happening at Belmont and Girard. Not sure if he can still hear us. Well, there he is now. Joe, let's get back out to you because you've been kind of walking us through what you're seeing out there at this point. And you were just there in the park where this happened. Tell me what more you know at this point. So the media staging area is a good two blocks that way. So we're right on top of where uh, this really unfortunate uh, incident occurred, this emergency incident, uh, almost an hour and 15 minutes ago. Uh, this is the square where eyewitnesses described to me as they were walking away, uh, peace, prayer in the park, make that prayer in the park when uh, gunfire erupted and Philadelphia police sources confirming to our assignment desk that uh, multiple people were struck, were hit by gunfire. We don't know how badly and the extent of their, their wounds and that uh, a number of people were taken in, into custody. Uh, there is no information right now about a motive. If this was perhaps a targeted shooting, if uh, there was information or, or is there information developing that brought, uh, you know, uh, a shooter or shooters uh, to this event. But in the last five minutes, we have word now that the FBI is on its way uh, to lend assistance to the investigation. I'm going to swing my camera around here on the ground. I see Chopper is up as well. But this is the area in question from the ground. Uh, you see a parking lot in front of me. Uh, I'm stopped by a crime scene tape, and there's a parking lot. And then beyond the parking lot is the square. And in the distance of the square, you see a, 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 a white tent. And uh, this is just a very large park that is now completely uh, surrounded by yellow crime scene tape. Uh, certainly uh, the markers of uh, a terrible situation and a development uh, after uh, the conclusion of Ramadan that uh, people were gathered here to pray and to celebrate. And now it has uh, it ended in chaos with, once again, multiple people um, hit by gunfire and a number of people taken into custody. Yeah, we had yeah. some. Go ahead, Joe. Okay. It, we had some sound. I'm not sure if we've been able to turn it around. Um, a woman by the name of Teresa White, who I interviewed on the spot here, 
uh, gave us uh, it, her thoughts and described what she saw. I don't know if we have that available. I'm sorry, Joe. What, um, what were you saying, Joe? Are you trying to get this, the sound? Who, who did you talk to out there at the scene? So the sound was of a woman named Teresa White, and she seemed to be leaving work. Uh, we had a very quick conversation, but she just told me about the volume of police who responded to this. We've been listening to CBS News Philadelphia gather information and speak to witnesses after a shooting, after a community event there in West Philadelphia. It's left a number of people shot, and also others are in custody. But if you were with us a few minutes ago, you heard a child explain how afraid they were um, realizing that they were playing in the park one minute and then moments later shots rang out. The child said, I could have been shot. Uh, police are trying to reunite families and get to the bottom of what happened. We also expect an update from police as well. As soon as that happens, we will bring it to you live. For the moment, though, we want to switch to the other major uh, development we're watching right now, which is uh, the stock market's close after um, numbers came out showing that inflation is still moving strong across the country. The Dow Jones closed the day way into red territory, down more than 400 points, 422 points, in fact. The S&P 500 and NASDAQ also took on heavy losses today, both down nearly 1%. So let's digest all of this with Javier David. He's with us here in Studio 57, CBS News contributor and managing editor of business and markets at Axios. I mentioned that hotter than, hot, uh, hotter than expected inflation number, uh, Javier, what else is playing into these pullbacks we saw in Wall Street Yeah, uh, one investor said to me or said uh, sent me an email that said Goldilocks has left the building. And Goldilocks is that reference to this whole idea that the economy is not too hot and not too cold, but it's just right. Mm. Um, but inflation just isn't coming down as quickly as expected. So between CPI, uh, the Fed minutes, which came out this afternoon, and spiking yields that drove down stocks, you had all of these sort of rivers that converged at once, and all of them flow from the same central source, which is inflation. It's way more entrenched in the economy than most people expected. Um, and that means any sort of timetable that we have for, um, you know, lower interest rates is going to be pushed back. And as you speak about that timetable, I think coming into this week, an expectation was that in the best case scenario this summer, perhaps the Fed would keep rates where they are or start to ease them down again. Mm -hmm. What's the reality now? The reality is they we may still see rate hikes, but it's not it's more than likely that the June uh month that we had sort of planned for, that seems to be increasingly off the table. The Fed can ignore one report, but we've now had two or three reports that say the exact same thing. But also um, explain why it touches so many things and it's such a sobering wake-up call. Right. It's housing costs. It's uh, if you're a corporation and you want to tap the debt market or you want to refinance, it affects that. If you're a homeowner waiting on the sidelines, as you have for at least a couple of years, waiting for um, interest rates to come down, it affects that. If you are a credit card user who is carrying balances, this is particularly important for you. Um, those That number or that APR that you pay is more than likely to either remain where it is or even go higher. Because some people actually were planning on rates coming down and Indeed. predicting that they could make certain uh, decisions because of that. Minutes from um, the Fed's meeting last month were released today, and they indicate a concern about inflation not moving lower quickly enough. So it's almost as if there are many signs that inflation isn't cooling, perhaps it gets worse. What, mm -hmm. what else should we be considering as we look at the picture? Yeah, it's, it's just a, a sense that um, inflation could be reaccelerating. And the jobs data that we just got last week um, is another indication of that. The fact that, you know, on the one hand, uh, there's plentiful jobs and people are earning money. And a good thing is wages uh, are people are earning more than the rate of inflation. So that's a good thing. But that means demand is high. And that means the more money you have, the more money you're inclined to spend, the more demand sort of supports high prices. And companies get the signal that they can continue to sort of hike prices because we're going to continue to eat them. Mm. All right. A wake up, sobering wake up call. Goldilocks has left the building. Javier <laughs> David, thanks for walking into the building today. It's always <laughs> Absolutely. great to have you here. Thank, Thank you very you. much. All right. We want to pivot back, of course, to the breaking news out of Philadelphia. A shooting in West Philadelphia has left a number of people injured. Uh, a few people are also in custody. But young people, families, all alarmed by this. Uh, you're seeing aerial footage from our station, CBS News Philadelphia, right now. And I believe we have former FBI Special Agent Doug Coons with us. Uh, Doug, help us understand 
how police will be, will be piecing this picture together. We heard a local reporter there say that the FBI is on their way to the scene. They'll be uh, providing assistance. How exactly will that unfold? Well, there, there's already a big response, and so that will involve processing this as a crime scene, which is, is big in this case, multiple shooters, multiple injured, lots of witnesses. So you're going to have to uh, conduct a lot of interviews of the people that were there and get their accounts. You're going to have to uh, look for video footage from surrounding homes and businesses that may have captured what happened. Uh, there will be shell casings. There are several weapons, I believe, that have been found. And it looks like, from what I've read, that are, there are several people already in custody. Uh, I think what we don't know is, you know, what the, the motivation is, why this occurred, which is the big thing on everyone's mind. But there's a lot of work to do. Um, it looks like, based on the aerial footage that we're seeing, that the, the urgency has died down. People are kind of just milling about and uh, starting to process the scene. Um, lots going to be going on. A lot of information will be released in the next hours and, and day. Yeah, and we should be as transparent as possible with our viewers. We, the earliest reporting we have is that this incident took place somewhere between 2.45 and 3 p.m. Eastern. Doug, you and I are speaking at 4.10 Eastern. I mean, this, this just happened. What has struck me the most from what we've watched from CBS News Philadelphia is a child speaking to one of our reporters saying that they were playing, this was scary, this child realizing that they could have been shot. How do the police approach gathering useful investigative data from children while also respecting the fact that minors have been traumatized? It just depends on the age of, of the witness. If they're children, typically you try to get the consent of the parents before you talk to that child. Uh, but they may have seen something that nobody else saw. So it's important that you you get as much information from everybody that you can. Certainly, it's going to be traumatic for everyone, especially children. Um, and it's just unfortunate that this happens so often. People are a little bit uh, numb to it, perhaps. Um, but when it happens right in your backyard or, or right next to you, it really hits home and it changes things because you see it on TV, but it certainly isn't the same as, as when it affects you or somebody you know directly. I'm remembering one of the most recent shootings we covered in Kansas City after a Super Bowl parade. Um, you know, to your point, this is just way too common in America. But at that time, people who were seen on video and taken into custody ended up not being connected to that shooting. We have these early reports that a number of people were taken into custody. How do police unfold if they were connected and not lose time getting closer to people who actually were? It's, it's difficult. Again, you just have to get a lot of resources involved. Like you said, the FBI is on their way. You've got the state and local police, uh, a lot of interviews to conduct. And the more you and more quickly you can gather that information, the quick, more quickly you can sort that out. Uh, I know everybody's speculating about what may what this may be about, you know, with the end of the of Ramadan and the Eid celebration. Uh, but it's too early to jump to those conclusions. Like you said, in Kansas City, it turned out to be kind of an unrelated thing to the event, and it was a, a shooting between people that were having a disagreement. So we don't know that yet. So we can't jump to these conclusions. We have to be patient, let the investigators do their jobs, and as they release that information, we'll know more. It's a good point that you raise, you know, the location, the timing. There's a mosque nearby. There's also a church nearby. There's a school nearby. I mean, these are all just early details that we're trying to piece together. Um, as we watch some of this aerial footage, we're seeing police uh, close down the area. A local reporter spoke about roads being closed off. And of course, we're approaching kind of a rush hour time of day. How do police balance the gathering of evidence, perhaps shell casings, perhaps anything else they need in a massive park? but also allow the city to resume its normal functions? It's, it's just difficult. It depends, uh, again, on the, the specific scene. It looks like, although that's a, a big scene there, that they've got it pretty well cordoned off. There are police cars everywhere. 
uh, you need to try to maintain the witnesses so you can still interview them while they're in pocket before they go home. There are people that are not going to want to stick around that may have seen something. Uh, they'll probably put out some sort of a, a phone number, a hotline to call if you saw something to, to call uh, and provide that information. Uh, and again, rush hour, uh, people are going to just have to figure out a way around it and, and deal with it. It's just an unfortunate thing that we have to deal with lately. Um, you know, I know when we do security work, consulting and whatnot, people just don't feel safe anywhere, be it their their house of worship, parks like this, celebrations, schools, hospitals, nightclubs. We've seen these things happen everywhere, and it's just unfortunate. And as we're speaking with you, Doug, we can report that your former agency, the FBI, um, is en route to the scene. Uh, members of the Bureau of Alcohol and Tobacco and Firearms, that's the ATF, they will be heading to the scene to um, offer what they can provide. And so it sounds like, as always, it will take time to get to the bottom of what really happened here. When, how do the police decide when to address the rest of us as we press for answers on what happened? And will it be very telling if in when they speak to the press, they ask for more information and more witnesses to step forward? Is that more common or only in incidents where they really need witnesses to return to the scene or to get back in contact with the police? That's a good question. I, I believe you'll probably see a, a press conference in the next few hours where somebody officially releases what they want the public to know. Um, I think it's always prudent to ask people if they have information to come forward, um, even if they think they know what was going on. You're never 100% sure, at least this quickly. So it, it's a good idea to encourage people that might have information to come forward and provide that. There will also be the double-edged sword to that is there will be a lot of people that call that don't really know anything that, that uh, are speculating or, or just provide nonsense and that has to all be filtered out. Um, you know, as far as the motivation that's important as far as who's gonna be the lead investigative agency and, and how it's prosecuted. You know, if it had something to do with race or religion, that, that's going to fall under the FBI. If it's just a, a conflict between people or gang war or something like that that got out of hand, you know, that that's not going to be likely a, a federal case. It'll be state or local. Um, yeah, and I, I just want to... the things that can... Go ahead. Yeah, no, just to your sentiment, you know, we spoke about the Kansas City parade shooting. That was February 14th, what, two months ago. And another mm -hmm. memory I have is speaking with a father who took his autistic daughter to that event so that she could have joy and he was traumatized and he had to run with her away. And we just heard from a, a, a boy uh, here who said he was scared that he could have been shot. Let's quickly listen into the police update for now, Doug. Well, listen, I, I walked through uh, this event and, and, and we know that, that the majority, 99% of the individuals at this event are good people who wanted to have a good time. And once again, we have young people engaging in gunfire who, who just really destroyed the sanctity of what happened. There was a, man, a gentleman who I was walking by said, you know, we have to learn how to love each other. And he was really frustrated. One thing I do know, uh, the mayor was on location, as many of you saw, to come down here, not just to support us, but to also support the community. She is actively engaged now in reaching out to our Islamic community to make sure that they have all the supports they have. Immediately after this incident, I contacted her as well and we were able to bring support services. So we do have support services at, at, at our recovery center over here at the, at the Claire Muhammad uh, uh, you know, school to be able to have uh, trauma services uh, there. Uh, but the mayor you know, clearly has sent her message to the community, how important it is for her to be on location, and she knows that we're here to support them. We would ask, though, at this time, uh, that anyone has any uh, information that they would call 215-686-TIPS or call our homicide division. We did not have a homicide in this situation, but considering the magnitude of the situation and their capacity to deal with, we, would, we have our homicide and our shooting investigation team working collectively on this. We asked them to call 215-686-3334. Two weeks ago, you had a panel and you were talking about the study you were finding that young people were often shooting around the time that this happened. And you were really trying to dive into the context that can prevent more things like this happening. 
judging from what you've learned from that study now, what would you apply to a situation? Like I, I don't know in this case we would apply it to, to this scenario only because schools closed today. Right. And so because of the holiday uh, and in this situation, until we get the true understanding of what the context over here, we won't know be able to answer that. Clearly the data shows us the types of incidents that I shared previously what's happening after school time. I don't know if this translates into this scenario here, but just because of the dynamics and the way it played out today. And the commissioner, as far as injuries, was there also um, a child that was Oh yeah, I, I do apologize. Yeah, so unfortunately, unfortunately, uh, during our, re our, our large response, at the time when we were responding, there were multiple calls coming over the air. Uh, for those of you know, we have our assist officer. I think we went to three or four assists in this, and we had a large portion of the city deployed. Unfortunately, during this incident, one of our patrol wagons struck a young child and she recovered a fractured leg uh, in that scenario. And clearly we send our prayers out to her and her family. That is not our intended purpose. And we will make sure we'll be following up with her and her family to let them know that. And we also heard reports somebody had a heart attack that maybe they were, that was running like during the commotion. I, I, I don't know. I mean, it okay. is one of the most traumatic situations. I was able to take a quick glimpse of the film uh, and just to see the mass of people running away from the park. Clearly, I'm sure there may have been some kind of underlying medical I issues that may have resulted from that, but we have no information at this point that anyone suffered a, a heart attack uh, that was transported from here by us or rescue uh, to the hospital. Commissioner, do you have anything like that? Uh, we have no information on a car involved at this point. Commissioner, do you have any message for parents if these young people it, it, were involved in a shooting, minors? Is there any message to parents looking after kids who are wrapped up in things like well, this? Well, listen, I, I've made this message multiple times about parent engagement and their responsibility in, in all of this. If you're not engaged with your child and trying to figure out what they're doing, where they're hiding the guns in your house, and the activity involved, then you're not doing your duty, right? And so that it may not even a parent. We have to understand that many of our kids are being raised by second generation and grandparents who don't have the capacity oftentimes to do the things that we ask them to do. But we always are going to lean on a true adult to be able to engage these young people. But the stuff we see out here, I mean, the guns that we're recovering, I think we're in a totally different process now. Can't make excuses for all of these kids. Some of them are out here actively engaging in gunfire, actively wanting to be involved in shootings and want to, and as you see today, uh, do that. And there's no zero tolerance for that. Right? And we're not going to make any excuses for that. And we're going to do everything. We now have four in custody, and we'll be looking for those others that were involved. Commissioner, hard to hear back here, but can you just, for, for clarity's sake, the event, prayer in the park that was going on, it's been described to us separate from the incidents that happened on the street with the shootings? Or well, I, it's all, I mean, we don't have any disconnection of the two. We have the incident. Our showcases are in the park. So it is not a, you know, the incident was happening as a result of the celebration that was going on. Not that the celebration caused it, individuals coming, it was a public event. Anyone can have access to come into this event. So it was not a ticketed event. And so clearly we had some individual who decided to use this as a way to, I mean, just like anything else we see, when we see individuals who are beefing and going at each other, oftentimes they don't care where they see, them at, see each other at. And so in this case, clearly they saw something going on in the park what that was, it caused two factions to start to pull out guns and shoot at each other. The investigation, we'll, we'll be looking into that. Commissioner, what about the 15 year old coming into eye contact with the Philadelphia police officer and still having the officer have to shoot? Uh, listen, I mean, you know, I, I met with the officer, uh, I commended for her actions. Uh, we're fortunate today that she was not uh, fired upon, and at the same time, fortunate that she did not have to take a juvenile's life. But the bravery that she displayed and the valor that she displayed by taking not only engaging the individual, but also recognizing that she had a child in front of her and we did her due diligence to put her, him in their car and transport to the hospital is a testament to the men and women who work for me. And I applaud her efforts and the work that she did. And to be clear, so the 15 year old was shot after the police officer? No, we did not. We, did not, we, did we, not we were still fire. investigating all of that. We don't know if that weapon was discharged at this point. I do not want to get into the police shooting part of it. What I can tell you is that my officer did shoot that juvenile two times, one in the shoulder and one in the leg. As far as any other information related to that, we will not be providing that at this time. Is he in stable Mr. condition? That's yes, the all the people, or the individual shot in the stomach, 22-year-olds in stable condition, the 15-year-olds in stable condition. Commissioner, Commissioner are other partners are working now. with yours? Other partners uh, working with yours right now in, under the investigation? Oh, we always all right, we've all been part. listening there to Philadelphia Police Commissioner Kevin Bethel give press an update on what was an unfortunate sequence of events. Um, during what was meant to be a positive community event there in West Philadelphia, a number of people were shot, the commissioner believes, by potential juvenile assailants. Um, he's been asked about 
his message to parents and, and, and taking care of their children. Um, he was clear to say that they do not believe the shooting was connected or caused by the community event, but he also described what was a scene of chaos with so many calls coming into the local police of the shooting that at one point a patrol wagon, in his words, struck a young child and fractured that young child's leg. Um, he also was asked about a police officer shooting a juvenile who may have been one of the assailants and then helped that juvenile seek treatment. He mentioned a 15-year-old who was shot in the shoulder and leg. Uh, their investigation continues. We also have former FBI Special Agent Doug Coons listening to this as well. Uh, Doug, you're the founder and CEO of global intelligence firm Veracity IIR. Based on what the commissioner just laid out, how has your impression of this shooting changed and, and what are your views? A little bit. Uh, you know, we kept hearing young people. Uh, they don't think it was related to the event, but they haven't ruled it out talking about responsibility of parents in these situations. So it uh, sounds like it was a lot of chaos early on. Like you said, the, the child was hit by a car, police car responding to the scene, um, but they've got four suspects in custody. Nobody dead is, is good news. Um, so that those are the things that I heard during that. And, you know, and that's just in a couple hours of investigation. So um, it's, Pretty impressive, really, how quickly they have determined and been able to release all that. We also heard that they did uh, put out a telephone number to call for more information, as we discussed before the conference. Mm -hmm. uh, so th those were the things that I picked up on as I watched that. And again, all of this just happened within the past two hours now. So this is a breaking story as we try to gather as much of the confirmed information as possible as they explore this possibility that it was a, a juvenile. Can you help us understand that moment for, for a police officer in which they're trying to secure an area, they see a young person with a gun who may have shot others, and they make a decision to shoot, but then make a decision to get that juvenile treatment? That's always tough, you know, these shoot, don't shoot situations. You know, so many people have guns in this day and age. You don't know if that's one of the suspects or if that's somebody that's that has pulled out their gun to defend themselves if necessary, especially if it's a child. And when you're the law enforcement officer responding, you don't have the luxury of time to, to sort that all out. You've got a, a person standing there with a gun. You have to make up your mind in a split second based on all of the information that you have just taken in. Um, without being there, it's hard to speculate on, you know, what happened and, and why that officer chose to uh, engage. But uh, usually you're given a warning to drop the gun. And if it doesn't happen right away, uh, it's probably going to be bad news for that person. It does speak to the split second decision uh, police officers have to make on a regular basis and also the importance of, of, of very strong training. As we uh, before we heard what the police commissioner had to say, I was sharing with you how jarring it is to see so many families, especially young children, experience and grow up in a world where shootings, mass shootings, happen in public places. This was a, a joyful community event, as far as we know, before younger assailants came in and opened fire. Where are you on the notion of celebrating in public with a lot of people around? Are you comfortable with going to large events or is your calculation, even as a former FBI you know, special agent, has it changed in recent years and months? I would say it's changed along with everybody. I was probably a little more vigilant than the average person at these things, uh, knowing that uh, it can happen anytime, anywhere. Uh, you kind of have to have your head on a swivel. You have to look around and see where your potential threats are. Um, public awareness and training, that, those are things that, that we recommend all the time. Um, but yeah, it's, I've always, we've talked about these things on different venues and, you know, for example, here we have the Indy 500. My thoughts are the biggest threat are not in the venue, but outside as people are gathering the parking lots where the tailgating is going on. Those are all such soft targets and, uh, no matter what the motivation, it's it can be dangerous. Uh, we have shootings here in Indianapolis quite often 
uh, the city of Indianapolis has put a, a, a curfew for, for children recently because of the gun violence. And it's just uh, unfortunate, like you said, that these kids have to grow up in this kind of world. Doug Coons, we really appreciate uh, you, your guidance and insight on this uh, breaking news event. Thank you for your time today. And just to summarize for our viewers, there was a shooting in West Philadelphia just a few hours ago after a celebratory community event. A number of people have been shot. There may have been juvenile assailants. Um, a young girl uh, has a fractured leg after a patrol wagon was rushing to the scene. More information is coming in, and we'll get you connected with our local station there, CBS News Philadelphia, uh, throughout the afternoon and evening. Uh, coming up next, though, we'll have a look at the day's other top stories, including severe weather right now rolling its way through the south. Stay right where you are. You're streaming CBS News. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. Does this carrier strike group stand ready? It's just incredible to see there's an active search and rescue operation going on 12 hours after this accident. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To so land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. People with developmental disabilities were once sequestered by the hundreds of thousands in institutions. Many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because lack of attention, lack of imagination, lack of uh, adequate manpower. Disability activists have since torn down barriers blocking them from living at home or in the community. We conclude that Title II of the ADA requires states to provide community-based treatment for persons with mental disabilities. But of the 16,000 people who remain in state-operated institutions, half are in five states, and Illinois is one of them. I don't want to live in the institution. It makes me feel discriminated against. Do you think there are people living in institutions in Illinois that don't need to be living there? Yeah, because they're proving it as soon as they get out. All right, another wave of severe weather right now is sweeping through parts of the south and the Mississippi Valley. Look at that. This will continue throughout the afternoon. In fact, we have some video to show you from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, harsh thunderstorms there, downing trees and utility poles. That's happening beneath the radar images you're seeing. Some homes have been destroyed, and while around thousands of people in Mississippi uh, at this moment also are without power. CBS News correspondent Tom Hansen is covering the storm in Jackson, Mississippi, getting soaked. Tom, what else are you feeling and seeing on the ground there? 
Errol, this storm has been powerful and fast moving. You know, I flew through this storm, in fact, last night as I was getting into Jackson. It tossed our plane around like a toy. Now we are seeing some of the impacts on the ground. I want you to take a look around me. You can see that there are downed power lines, something that is happening in many neighborhoods across Jackson. You can see the yards here littered with branches. And then take a look at this house. A massive tree fell on this house, essentially splitting the house in two. Now, we've talked with emergency management here in Jackson. They say that they are watching the Pearl River very closely. The primary concern here, of course, is flooding. Elsewhere, the concern are those powerful tornadoes that we have already seen, one overnight in Houston that leveled a church, and then another tornado in Louisiana. So this storm is packing a punch, certainly nothing to balk at. Errol? Yeah, and with those down power lines... Uh also provide a danger. We want everyone to remain safe, including you and the crew there. We know the power is out, but how long will folks in this part of the country experience this severe weather, Tom? We are nowhere near out of the woods just yet. This storm system is expected to last throughout the day, possibly into the night. And if you zoom out, just to get a context of how powerful this storm system is and how much of a concern there should be, if you look at the Torcon map, there is a large portion of pink in southern Louisiana, southern Alabama, Mississippi, uh, and that is a level seven. That basically means that there is a very strong likelihood of tornadoes, not just in that area that is pink, but also in a 50-mile radius surrounding that area. Officials are urging people not to go out in this storm and to seek shelter if there is a tornado on the ground. We've already seen other precautions being taken. Louisiana closing all state offices today and schools here in Jackson are remote. So people are taking this storm very seriously, Errol, and we are certainly nowhere near out of the woods just yet. All right. Great warning there, Tom. We want everyone there to stay safe. Thank you very much. An 18-year-old who was arrested for allegedly plotting a terror attack on churchgoers in the name of ISIS is appearing in court today. Alexander Scott Mercurio was arrested Saturday. The FBI says he intended to carry out deadly attacks on multiple churches across his hometown the next day. According to court documents, he was planning to die while killing others using makeshift flamethrowers, a machete, and other weapons that were found in his home. Authorities took the suspect into custody just days after federal law enforcement warned of potential threats to public gatherings in the U.S., and that included, at the time, houses of worship. Six Mississippi law enforcement officers who tortured and abused two black men learned their sentences in their state courses to, uh, court cases today. The members of the so-called Goon Squad receive sentences ranging from 15 to 45 years. They'll serve those concurrently with the federal prison sentences they received last month. If you remember, I was in Jackson, Mississippi reporting on that. The attack happened in January of last year after a white person called a deputy to complain. Two black men were staying with a white woman. The six former officers tortured and humiliated the men with various objects. Former President Donald Trump is now weighing in on the Arizona Supreme Court, allowing the enforcement of a near total abortion ban. The former president says it goes too far, adding that abortion is, quote, all about states' rights. He goes on to say it will be straightened out. Yesterday, Arizona Supreme Court ruled that a law which criminalizes most abortions can be enforced, eventually, essentially superseding a 15-week ban that's also on the books. For context here, this 1864 law, which is now back in effect, was created nearly half a century before Arizona became a state, before automobiles were even invented, and before Alfred Nobel patented dynamite. I think that puts this into context. Governor Katie Hobbs, who's a Democrat, is one of many politicians who's come out against the court's decision. On CBS Mornings, she appeared confident that voters in Arizona will approve a proposed constitutional amendment that would add the right to an abortion to the state's constitution. Arizonans don't, don't support extreme abortion bans, and this 15-week ban is still extreme. It, again, no exception for rape or incest, no regard for complications of pregnancy. Uh, that's what will be in place. Uh, and again, Arizonans will have the ability to weigh in on this uh, with a constitutional amendment in November. 
want to report on a new study that found some of the nation's largest employers may be biased in their hiring practices. Coming up next, what experts say can be done to address discrimination. You're streaming CBS News. Washington is the seat of power. Um, national security, foreign policy, global economics, every story comes through Washington in some way. We bring some of the most powerful voices in America to the table. We don't just ask the questions, you have to go deeper. We try to understand what's at the heart of the issue we're talking about to then come forward with solutions. Face the Nation on CBS. The justices ruled that Harvard and the University of North Carolina violated the Constitution. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to end affirmative action in college admissions, uncertainty sets in for some students of color. Affirmative action really gave us an equal opportunity. CBS Reports explores the historic decision and what it means for those chasing an opportunity to change their lives. I knew that college was the ticket to break this cycle. The end of affirmative action, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Okay, hey, let's go. You guys good? Hey. All right, we good? Keep going. The clock, it's ticking. Off we go. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. It's time for 60 Minutes, Sundays on CBS. An original documentary from CBS Reports. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever. Curing diseases, scientific breakthroughs, making lives better. They can help us with medical discovery, scientific discoveries, doing better agriculture, having cures for things like Alzheimer's. It's also going to really transform the way we work. The uplifting potential of artificial intelligence is limitless. It gives you a friend, somebody to chat with 24-7 that is non-judgmental. He makes me feel loved and desired. And so are its downfalls. The problem with all this AI is that it's unpredictable and uncontrollable. The choices we make now will have lasting effects for decades, maybe even centuries. The ChatGPT revolution, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We are about to see American weapons in the hands of Mexican cartels. A gun pipeline to Mexico. We are arming the cartels. 100%, no doubt about it. Happening right under our noses. Uh, who's doing something about this? Nobody. A CBS Reports exclusive. Most Americans have no idea that we are effectively arming the enemy next door. This is the story the American people need to know. Arming cartels, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America Decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education. Both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bringing you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides, Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. Officials in Chicago have released body cam video that shows officers firing 96 times at a driver who they pulled over. We have to give you a warning here. This video is disturbing. Initial evidence from an independent investigation shows the driver, a 26-year-old named Dexter Reed, fired the first shot. Reed was killed and one officer was injured. The plainclothes officer says they'd stop Reed on suspicion of not wearing a seatbelt. Reed's family is calling for charges to be filed. Chicago's mayor says the footage is deeply disturbing. I'm personally devastated to see yet another young black man lose his life during an interaction with the police. I've also been praying for the full recovery of the officer who was shot during this interaction. Now, the Chicago Fraternal Order of Police has not responded to CBS News' request for comment on this. A new report suggests some of the nation's biggest companies are discriminating against black job applicants. In the largest of its kind study, a group from the National Bureau of Economic Research sent out 80,000 resumes to 97 companies over a three-year span between 2019 and 2021. They use fake resumes, but with equal qualifications, changing only personal details to imply an applicant's race, age, and gender. Overall, researchers found employers contacted white applicants more than black ones, with the widest gap being between 
companies, genuine parts, and AutoNation. So far, neither company has responded to our requests for comment. However, genuine parts did tell the New York Times, quote, we are always evaluating our practices to ensure inclusivity and break down barriers, and we will continue to do so. AutoNation did not respond to the New York Times. Let's bring in Evan Rose now. He is a co-author of this report and is an assistant economics professor at the University of Chicago. Evan, great to have you with us on this topic. I'm just wondering from your point of view, with all the research you've done, what were the most significant findings and what it tells us about the U.S. labor market as a whole? Great, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, so this was uh, a, a huge study, as you mentioned. We sent thousands and thousands of resumes to many hundreds of companies. And I think the most important thing that we learned from the study is that companies seem to really differ in the extent to which they discriminate based on the characteristics uh, that we're looking at, which is both, both race and gender. You highlighted the fact that two companies appear to discriminate much more than the other companies in our study. I think it's also important to recognize that some companies appear to discriminate a, uh, quite a bit less or, or even not at all in our study. It's just massive heterogeneity in the economy and the extent to which we see this discrimination against distinctively black names. Now, importantly, that discrimination doesn't seem to be random. It's concentrated in particular industries for race discrimination, for example, firms that do things with cars and car parts like AutoNation and Genuine Parts, which owns the Napa, Napa Auto Parts brand, seem to discriminate much more than firms in other industries, including industries like uh, food stores and grocery stores, for example. So we think this is important because I think it means, first of all, there might be something we could do about this from an enforcement perspective. We also think it might be it might mean that there are things firms can do themselves that might mitigate or exacerbate the type of discrimination that you could see in their organization. The fact that all firms don't seem to discriminate in the same way suggests that this is just an inevitable feature of the labor market, that there's going to be discrimination out there always. Instead, it may be that policies and practices that firms can, can adopt, how they structure hiring, the type of training they give people might actually have an impact on these on these measures. And we hope that by releasing these data, we can start to learn some of those uh, policies and practices and share those across firms in a way that can help reduce the type of discrimination that we're seeing here. It's a fascinating study, extensive research that you've done. We mentioned areas in which we're more likely to discriminate, which companies and which areas were less likely. Yeah, so we see less discrimination on the basis of race against our distinctively black names and these fictional applications we sent in the food store industries, which I mentioned earlier. You can think about that like grocery stores. Uh, we see less discrimination in freight and transport, which include companies like FedEx and UPS, um, as well as some in other utility companies uh, and communications companies like Charter and, and, and Spectrum. So again, it's not a universal phenomenon. It's not sort of inevitable that there's going to be discrimination in, in the types of job we're studying here. It does seem to have strong concentration in particular firms and, and among firms that are concentrated in these particular industries. And again, for our viewers, the resumes were identical. The qualifications and the skills were the same. It was the personal information that you changed. How then, if, if companies are watching this, people who can actually Im, you know, Im, uh, impact change, what can companies do to address discrimination and, and you know, extinguish this type of behavior? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And, and hopefully, hopefully something that we can continue to work on in, in future research. You know, the short answer is we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes at these companies. We see what our uh, our experiment is establishing is that companies do differ in the extent of discrimination that they exhibit as measured in an experiment like ours. We have some clues about what policies and practices might matter here, including things like how centralized their HR operation seems to be. Some companies, it seems that many individuals are involved in making hiring decisions at a single establishment. So it might be four or five different people calling back job applications at one store. At other companies, it looks like there might be just one person who's overseeing hiring for a couple a couple different stores across a broad, broader set of establishments. And what we infer from that is that it seems like companies where maybe they've invested a little bit more in professionalizing the hiring function and offered some kind of training, maybe that's one way in which you can mitigate the type of discrimination that you'd measure in a, in a study like ours. But you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this project and release these names and talk about the, which companies are actually in our list is to open the way for other researchers and policymakers and everyone to dig into what policies and practices really do seem to differ across these firms and think about what we can learn about how to, how to address this problem at a more systematic level. Yeah, it's a sobering report, but hopefully it's just part of a step in the right direction. Evan Rose, we really appreciate you discussing your findings with us, uh, joining us from Chicago. Okay, yeah, thanks so much. All right, let's get you something that hopefully makes you smile. Many across the country will remember Monday's total solar eclipse as one of the highlights of their lives. But for one Texas family, another event happened that day that easily 
outshone the eclipse. We'll explain. You're streaming CBS News. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh! <laughs> and reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da -da -da. and truly original That's reporting. Right. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. At this moment, terrorists could be plotting another attack. 9-11 triggered a counter-terrorist system that included a secret database. This person needs a closer look. A growing list of nearly 2 million people, including some Americans who say they're innocent. For one hour flight, I have to spend six hours to go and come back. CBS Reports explores the system, the people responsible for it, and those pushing for change. I'm not fighting against them. I'm fighting for them to do the right thing. The Watch List, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Don't miss true crime anytime you want, anywhere you go. With the 48 Hours Podcast. Real crimes, real lives, real justice. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Listen to 48 Hours on Apple Podcasts. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Imagine yourself in Manhattan with no police, no army, no mayor. The people of Haiti stare down poverty, corruption, natural disasters, and violence. 90% of the guns that are used by gangs in Haiti are American guns. But with an unbreakable spirit and eternal optimism. There are days where I cry, but we can't be discouraged. We still believe in Haiti. They're still able to look ahead with hope. Haiti is on the brink of transformation, a radical shift. Asians are coming together and saying things must change. Fighting for Haiti, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Everybody wakes up in the morning and they are pelted with alerts that frighten them, news that agitates them. With this show, we have the time to explain what's going on. These migrants, they've been released. Explain the status that allows them to be released, to slow things down a little bit. What are the big sets of questions for China and its ambitions? Hackers are stepping up their attacks to extort victims. Let's start with easy. Who's attacking? Here's a deeper understanding of what's happening. Prime Time with John Dickerson. Stream on the free CBS News app. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. On our places, bright, shiny faces. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. The summer travel season is almost here, and to ease the stress of flying, one airport is helping travelers relax with the help of some furry friends. CBS News' is Ian Lee. These reports. pups are on patrol at Istanbul Airport. They're not sniffing out drugs, but searching for tense travelers passing through Turkey. This dog handler says, we see a lot of demand for therapy dogs. They help people to relax. Border Collie Alida leads the pack of this pilot project, giving kisses and comfort. After your long flight or your gas stressful or you lost something, you need something like can keep you calm down and uh, something that's like the dog is wonderful. Italian retriever Cookie loves belly rubs. I think it looks nice to how like friendly dogs in the airports. And research shows this positive approach has health benefits, reducing stress, raising feel good hormones and lowering blood pressure. They stop people worrying. And, and they make people happy. The idea is being unleashed at airports around the world, from the UK to Miami International. He's here to keep you happy and de-stressed. He's doing a great job. Is he? <laughs> He's doing a great job, hey, bro. It's dogs doing what they do best. This is Brody. See how soft he is? Being hey, our Brody. best friends. Ian Lee, CBS News, here, London. Brody. For one family in Texas, the excitement of Monday's total eclipse was outdone by an even bigger event, the birth of their baby. And as CBS News' as Brooke Rogers tells us, this little girl will have a story to tell the rest of her life with a name to match. 
Congratulations, Mom. Meet Sol Celeste Alvarez, who came into the world at six pounds, nine ounces, and nine days early. So I started feeling contractions around four. So I didn't think in my wildest dream that she would be born. That was very, very close. When Alicia's labor pains picked up, their only concern about time was making it to the hospital. But we ran into a lot of traffic just because yeah. everybody was going to the um, eclipse, like wanted to see the eclipse. So it took us about an hour and 30 or 30, 30 minutes to get here. Sol Celeste, whose name means celestial sun in Spanish, made her appearance just as the sun was disappearing. And then I just saw, you know, while she was in the bat in the bassinet that it started turning dark. The Alvarez's actually decided they were going to name her Soul months ago, and they chose that because they had named her big sister Luna, which means the moon. So I wanted something that they could share together. So I love the continuous name of um, Sun and Moon, and it was just a continuous love. Dad Carlos, an Army veteran, says he's still marveling at her timely arrival. It was really surprising, I think, that um, I didn't wake up that day thinking it was going to be this plus a baby at the same time. But they know that somehow the stars aligned to give them the sun. When it did, you're like, okay, there must be a better purpose behind it or something that's going on maybe that I'm out, out of my control. And the fact that I have a moon already, mm -hmm. and now I have a sun and a moon, and then she was born during the eclipse, that's just, you just can't, the odds of that is just crazy. Brooke Rogers, CBS News, Texas. I'm Errol Barnett, the CBS Broadcast Center in New York. Thanks for being with me. Coming up next, it's America Decides. The Biden campaign held reproductive rights events across the battleground state of North Carolina today. Now they're looking to put abortion access front and center ahead of November. Plus, Republicans get a lot of credit for their record on crime, but Democrats are increasingly trying to make it a winning issue of their own. We'll take a look at why. America Decides is next. You're streaming CBS News. Okay, so let's just start at the beginning. Well, let me start with this. What is at stake here? What is the answer then? Do you know why? You want me to just keep going? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Were there death threats? How is this possible? What's wrong with that argument? Are you saying they lied? Have you told the government that? Why won't you say the word crisis? You're not answering my question. This really is that scary? Does that make sense? What do you mean? What does that mean? Did it? any of that make what sense? You What's your response? What happened? Why? 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 It's time for the CBS News Original 60 Minutes, Sunday on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. There is no more room in our city. New York City is receiving record numbers of migrants. Today, we're going to have more than 500 adults and children come through that door. Tensions rise as shelters reach max capacity. We don't have to take care of them. CBS Reports goes inside a crisis cities and families are facing as they fight to survive. The United States still has that glimmer of hope for people to come here. Fighting for a future. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. On Face the Nation, the way to learn is to listen. We may have a recession. Listening to how someone explains themselves is so key to understanding their perspective. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Since you started La Soup in 2014, do you have any sense as to how much food you've rescued from the landfill? We've rescued four and a half million pounds. I can't even fathom how much food that is. And that's one little person in one little city in America. We're going to call this chicken piccata. We did 450 of these meals today. This is the exact dish that you and I are going to have. Yep. Oh, my really God. Is it good? Mm-hmm. Having a plan of how to keep people fed should be in every single city. So if we eliminated food waste, could we eliminate... Hunger, yes. Eating Trash, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America Decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. This 
Sunday morning, actor Kirsten Dunst, plus Wayne Brady on Broadway, and a beloved cherry tree named Stump. This is a devastating decision that will have huge consequences. I thought that the ruling was asinine, um, but it's up to Arizona to fix it. And it sounds like they're going to, uh, to do that. This is about restoring stability in the region, and I think we have a chance of doing that. Hello, I'm Ed O'Keefe, CBS News in Washington. Welcome to America Decides, the Arizona Supreme Court's decision to let a Civil War-era ban on abortion services take effect is earning bipartisan condemnation. Democratic Governor Katie Hobbs, President Biden, and former President Donald Trump all say they don't like it. The Grand Canyon State's High Court upheld an 1864 law that allows for abortions to save the life of the mother, but not in cases of rape or incest. Hobbs called on the state's legislature to repeal the ban during an appearance on CBS Mornings. Arizonans across the state are reeling from this devastating decision that reinstates a near total ban, a ban that was passed in 1864, before Arizona was even a state, before uh, women had the right to vote. We have a team of journalists on the story tonight across the country with a look at the fallout from the ruling and the politics of abortion rights. We begin with Elizabeth Campbell in Phoenix. Elizabeth, good to see you. You spoke with an abortion provider in the state about the ruling, as well as an attorney for an anti-abortion rights organization. What did they tell you? Good to be with you, Ed. And fallout is right as people try to regroup and figure out where they're going to go from here. Now, it's important to emphasize that we do not yet know when this ruling will go into effect. There's at least 45 more days before that happens. I talked to one provider. They perform about 100 abortions a week, both by the pill and the procedure. Take a listen to the concern she has now that this has passed. Increased maternal mortality, forced pregnancy, increased infant mortality, and just this despair and the devastation that people feel when they find out that they don't have bodily autonomy and they don't have the ability to access abortion. Forced pregnancy is real, and pregnancy is really hard on the body, and there's so many risks. It is riskier to go through an entire pregnancy than to have an abortion, and it will just have a devastating effect on the people of Arizona. Now, that clinic does promise me that they will perform procedures up until the day that the law goes into effect. On the flip side, also keeping up that fight with a possible ballot measure coming down this fall is the law firm that took this case to the Supreme Court. Take a listen to what their lead lawyer had to say today as well. Life is always worth protecting. Think about everything we've learned over the past 50 years. Unborn children start having a heartbeat at six weeks, fingers and toes at eight weeks, and unique fingerprints at 10 weeks. Uh, a people does well when they uh, elect officials that work vigorously to protect life from the moment of conception. Now, as you said, this is the Grand Canyon State, and it's also a swing state, Ed. So this debate is not going anywhere come the fall. You took the words right out of my mouth, Elizabeth, in Phoenix. Thank you for that. Thanks to those that you spoke with today. Now on to another battleground state. Shana Mazel is in Charlotte, North Carolina, where the Biden campaign is holding events focused on abortion rights across the Tar Heel state. Shana, you were there as two women affected by abortion bans campaigned for the president today. What did they have to say? That's right, Ed. So they started out this morning in Durham. They went to the Winston-Salem and they ended in Charlotte. They both spoke about their personal experiences in Louisiana and in Texas being impacted by the restrictive abortion bans that both states 
have, and they really shared that personal experience during roundtables with physicians, medical professionals, but as well as state lawmakers. And they're sending a similar message that we've seen from the Biden campaign, and that is laying the blame at the feet of former President Donald Trump for those restrictive abortion bans. Now, the Biden campaign featured one of the two women in a new ad. What did she have to tell you? Correct. Amanda, I spoke with her and I asked her why it was important for her to share her story and repeat it so often and even on large platforms like the Biden campaign ad. Here's what she had to say. I think my greatest fear is that what happened to me will happen to other people. And if we don't reelect President Biden and Vice President Harris in November, that will be the reality of this country. And it's really difficult to relive this over and over again. But there's nothing more important to me right now than this campaign and making sure that President Biden is reelected. So that's Amanda from Texas, and she tells me that she has plans to continue what she's been doing, hitting the campaign trail. She'll be in Milwaukee next week. Ed? Shana Mazel in Charlotte, thank you so much. I know you've been tracking the abortion issue closely in there, of course, in the battleground states. Now, this is what former President Donald Trump had to say about the controversial abortion ruling today while campaigning in Georgia. Well, yeah, they did, and that'll be straightened out. And as you know, it's all about states' rights. That'll be straightened out. And I'm sure that the governor and everybody else are going to bring it back into reason, and that will be taken care of, I think, very quickly. Saying that it will be straightened out. He was also asked whether he would sign a national abortion ban if he's elected president again, and if such a ban ever passes Congress. He shook his head in response and said no. We're joined now by Molly Ball and Deepa Shivram. Molly is a senior political correspondent for The Wall Street Journal. Deepa is a White House correspondent for NPR. Good to see both of you. This afternoon, I know both of you've been tracking this quite closely as well, uh, from a national political perspective. Uh, talk about the Department of Odd Timing. The former president comes out with this abortion announcement earlier this week, uh, seems to try to brush it off and say states will deal with this, and then Arizona goes and drops this huge ruling that now upends the politics of that battleground state. Absolutely. This is now the most restrictive abortion law in any of the uh, swing states. Uh, and it goes all the way back to the 19th century. I think that uh, it was a big surprise to a lot of people, including in Arizona, uh, that the Supreme Court made this decision and reactivated this very old law. And it does uh, really underscore, I think, the Biden campaign couldn't have asked for a better confluence of events to underscore uh, the message that they're trying to send, which is not only the, you know, the side that he's on on this important issue, but putting it on the top of voters' minds. You know, we have seen in a lot of polls uh, that uh, this is really the only top issue on which the president is trusted over Donald Trump. And when voters are asked what's the most important issue, they tend to say immigration, they say the economy, they say a lot of other things. Uh, and those are issues where Trump does better. This is the issue that the Biden campaign hopes will decide the election because it is an issue where voters take his side. And in Arizona, the fact that uh, it's likely to be on the ballot this November uh, makes it that much more of what Democrats hope will be a driver of turnout in their favor. If anything, that's what brings people to the polls, and then they'll conceivably vote hoping, for the president. Yeah. Now, Deepa, as someone tracking the Biden campaign, talk about how they're recalibrating now in the wake of this decision, especially in Arizona. I mean, the, almost immediately you saw the vice president's team, Kamala right. Harris, who has been the lead spokesperson on this issue for the administration, immediately announced that she's headed to Tucson later this week. She'll be there on Friday. That really utilizes that kind of shoot out of the cannon uh, effort that she usually does with these very hot button issues, abortion included. And th she'll be on the ground. She'll be rallying with voters. Um, this is exactly the kind of momentum that they're hoping to carry into November. And not only did, did that happen this week, but as you see Trump's announcements playing out and, and whether or not he'll, you know, sign a national abortion ban, things like that, the Biden campaign is very much trying to remind reporters and also remind uh, voters right now, you know, Trump is someone who has toggled a lot on this issue. And even though he's saying something right now, you know, look back at everything else he's done when it comes to this issue and, and really trying to keep that top of mind, like you said. Both of you uh, and this reporter have been around these campaigns long enough to observe in the last few days, at least I did, that they seemed to anticipate this quite well, the Biden campaign, between last week when there was that ad they released uh, with the woman in Texas uh, in response to President Trump saying that he was going to go down this road and introduce this decision to then anticipating this Arizona ruling, the vice president had pre-taped a bunch of things that they released on social media, immediately announced that they're going to Tucson. They seem to be ready for this one in ways that we don't always see 
especially national campaigns, ready to react quickly to something? Well, what I'm hearing from Democratic sources is that the ads that they are, of course, producing on this issue are among the best testing ads in their arsenal. Mm. And they are very effective because, as we know, this is a, an election that a lot of voters are not excited about. Right. These are two candidates that a lot of voters are not excited about. And so it is incumbent on the campaigns to remind them of the stakes, remind them of the policies that are at stake and the potential consequences of your vote. So I think we can expect both campaigns uh, to be hammering on the policy stakes of that election of this election. And for the Biden campaign, that is going to mean, as we've heard repeatedly from them, democracy and Dobbs. They see those as the winning issues and they're, they're, they are, of course, prepared to hammer them home. So when these new developments reinforce their message, and unfortunately for former President Trump, there are going to continue to be new developments. This is the meaning uh, you know, when he said this is up to the states, this is federalism, this is states' rights, this is what that means. It means states are constantly going to making these kinds of moves. We're going to constantly be seeing new uh, cases reminding people of, of the unsettled abortion regime when it comes to policy. And there's going to continue to be uh, ways to remind voters of, of the importance of this issue. And keep in mind, this is an issue that has been a winning issue for Democrats ever since the Dobbs decision came out. I mean, Democrats, Biden, Harris, right. they have that on their side, right? They, they've seen in states across the country and even conservative states, right, where voters have come out and said, no, we want to protect abortion rights. So it kind of helps in that regard to have all of this stock piled up. Like you said, they're ready to go because they've seen it work in the past several months and years. And Although I would, I would quibble ahead. with that just a little bit to say the abortion has been a winning issue for abortion. It hasn't necessarily been a winning issue for Democrats. We have yet to see a Republican gubernatorial or Senate candidate lose because of the abortion issue, or at all, since since Roe was overturned. And, and you this mean is an incumbent? Exactly. Okay. Because Daniel Cameron, of course, struggled in the gubernatorial race in Kentucky. We have seen it be that. an issue in right. some races, uh, but we have not seen it defeat incumbents, and we have never seen it play in a presidential race. This That's is right. the first presidential race since the overturning of Roe. Uh, and so I think Deepa's right. It certainly has a lot of potential for Democrats, but we don't yet know how it's going to interact with the presidential when so much else is on voters' minds. And when we have so much time to go, because it right. is just April. But uh, certainly uh, this week's zig is uh, to the benefit of the Democrats. We'll see uh, where the zags are going forward. Molly Ball, Deepa Shivram, so great to have both of you here. Thank you, because you both know what you're talking about, and that's, uh, <laughs> that's helpful. Today, President Biden tried to focus attention on what the U.S. is doing across Asia and the Indo-Pacific region. Coming up, we head to the White House for the latest on the president's big meetings with the prime minister of Japan and learn more about who's joining them tomorrow. You're streaming America Decides. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. Does this carrier strike group stand ready? Just incredible to see there's an active search and rescue operation going on 12 hours after this accident. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful. 
for. To keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. People with developmental disabilities were once sequestered by the hundreds of thousands in institutions. Many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because lack of attention, lack of imagination, lack of that adequate manpower. Disability activists have since torn down barriers blocking them from living at home or in the community. We conclude that Title II of the ADA requires states to provide community-based treatment for persons with mental disabilities. But of the 16,000 people who remain in state-operated institutions, half are in five states, and Illinois is one of them. I don't want to live in the institution. It makes me feel discriminated against. Do you think there are people living in institutions in Illinois that don't need to be living there? Yeah, because they're proving it as soon as they get out. President Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida announced plans today for closer military and intelligence cooperation. The president called the U.S.-Japan alliance a beacon to the entire world. CBS's Weisha Zhang joins us now from the White House. Weisha, good to see you. How exactly do the United States and Japan plan on working together to counter China? Well, Ed, the announcements today really center around these two countries' militaries and finding ways that they can cooperate better so that they can fend off a potential uh, adversary. Although I should say that the president did not explicitly talk about China or its president Xi Jinping at length. Uh, those two topics were certainly the backdrop and the entire undercurrent of this uh, discussion today. And so to that end, they are looking for ways to, as an example, produce a defense weapons together. They are also trying to bolster their military command center in that region to see if there are new ways that they can collaborate. And so all of this, as you mentioned it, is because, as we very well know, every piece of the president's foreign policy is attached to Beijing. And so as Beijing continues its offensive, especially in the South China Sea, the president wants to show that it is getting as many allies as possible in the region and sort of sending a message without saying it that we're prepared in case we have to be. And, and to that point, they're, they're having a, a third leader join them tomorrow, right? That's right. This is going to be the president of the Philippines, Marcos Tamaro, Fernandez Marcos Jr., and he will be here for a trilateral meeting. This comes as in that South China Sea I was just talking about, China has been aggressive towards Philippines Coast Guard, and they're also worried about how China could try to control the seas there. And they're really focused on economic uh, collaboration and growth in the area. But again, Ed, as you know, this points back to China and what they can do as a show of force, if you will, uh, before anything actually happens. And while the president wants to keep as much focus as possible on Asia and the Indo-Pacific, he did have to talk today about the war in Gaza. What did he have to say about ceasefire negotiations? Well, it's really interesting, Ed, because just yesterday here at the White House, hostage families expressed frustration that they seem to, that, you know, when people mentioned ceasefires and a temporary ceasefire, they were not hearing that being linked back to their loved ones, hostages being released. And so that is exactly what we heard from President Biden today, reminding everyone what's at stake. Take a listen. The new proposal on the table, uh, Bill Burns led the effort to, uh, for us. We're grateful for his work. There's a now up to Hamas. They need to move on the proposal that's been made. And as I said, uh, we get these hostages home where they belong, but also bring back a six-week ceasefire that we need now. President Biden was also asked about recent comments he made during an interview that Netanyahu is making a mistake in his handling of the war in Gaza, and he was asked explicitly whether the U.S. was prepared to condition aid. But the president sort of talked around it. He talked about all the things Netanyahu is doing to open more humanitarian corridors, all the promises he has made to better protect civilians and humanitarian aid workers. So President Biden said, we'll see. 
Hui Zhejiang at the White House. I guess the other interesting thing is that the Japanese prime minister brought along, what, 200 more cherry blossom trees to be planted here in Washington? That's and then two, right. And two Japanese astronauts get to go to the moon with the U.S. whenever we get back there. So that's a pretty extensive day for them. Yes, and it will be capped off with a very extravagant state dinner tonight where Paul Simon is performing. So, you know, a lot of work and a lot of pomp and circumstance, which is why we love covering state dinners, Ed. Don't we? That's right. One day we'll get invited to one. Li Zhejiang, good to see you over there at the White House. Thank you. Sure. For decades, politicians have used the threat of crime to try to win over voters. Next, we explore its effectiveness, even when crime rates start dropping. You're streaming. America decides. On our places, right shiny faces. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Nate has one of the quickest minds I've ever seen. Tony has a way of making people feel comfortable. Gail has this unbelievable knack to ask the question that you're asking at home. I've been told I could talk to a tree, and that's pretty much true. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. It didn't seem like anything could happen. Because nothing ever happens in East Palestine. But it did. Authorities released toxic fumes from five derailed train cars. Resident, please evacuate. Acute bronchitis due to chemical fumes. Did you ever have these problems before the derailment? No, ma'am. This neighborhood's not safe no more. We can assure the community that there's not vinyl chloride entering their communities. Then why are there so many people feeling these various symptoms of bloody noses or difficulty breathing and bronchitis? That's a hard question to answer. We're talking about one of the most blatant releases of a mixture of some of the most toxic chemicals that we've seen in America. I feel like now I have a duty to warn other communities. If my daughter has to watch me die of cancer, at least it saves someone else. This case. It's like a screenplay, something straight out of Hollywood. But it's not fiction. It's 48 hours. Human remains found this week. Four families shattered. There's no physical evidence. The mystery would haunt investigators for years. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Get like a John Grisham novel. A gripping true crime original. 48 hours. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. This is CBS. of a lifetime. Seeing the Earth from space, it was so exhilarating. But the risks that come with the territory. There have been four fatal accidents. That's a 1% fatal accident rate. Might make you look before you launch. If you had one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, we'd have a public crisis. Space Tourism, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes. Welcome back to America Decides. Those who've long followed politics on the impact of ads promising to fight crime, including the infamous Willie Horton ad you just saw there. Violent crime is down. But Republicans continue campaigning on concerns about crime and violence. A recent poll found Latino voters, for example, gave former President Donald Trump an 11-point advantage over President Biden on fighting crime, but that gap is actually starting to narrow. Both the Democratic and Republican candidates in a recent race to replace Congressman George Santos out on Long Island campaigned on crime and immigration as well. 
Swazi and Biden's defund the police agenda has led to more crime and violence. I'll work across the aisle to do what our leaders haven't, secure our border. Close the routes used for illegal immigration. Let's bring in Insha Rockman. She serves as vice president of advocacy and partnerships at the Vera Institute of Justice. The organization says its mission is to end the overcriminalization and mass incarceration of people of color, immigrants, and the poor. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Now, look, despite violent crime being down, why is it that Republicans, you think, continue to win on this issue of crime and violence? So I'm going to challenge one thing you just said, Ed, which is that Republicans continue to win on this issue. So we just saw the Willie Horton ad. That was from 1988. And back then, indeed, running on crime was a winning issue. The GOP started hitting Michael Dukakis on crime and Willie Horton, and we saw Dukakis's multi-digit lead drop. And yet, what we see now is that voters have actually evolved since 1988, but the political strategy that both parties, the GOP runs hard on crime, they spend millions and millions of dollars on ads hitting Democrats on crime, and Democrats either run away from the issue or they run to the right thinking that's the best we can do. Turns out that voters aren't buying either strategy. And so I actually challenge uh, the notion that Republicans are winning on this issue because we have examples. We just saw uh, Swazi win in Long Island. Uh, he's a Democrat. He actually fought off the soft on crime attacks, the soft on the border attacks. And he did it actually not by running away from the issue or running to the right but running on a new message, which is we can be serious about the things the American public cares about, which is safety, security, and stability. It's not about being tough or soft on crime or being tough or soft on the border. It's actually being serious about the issues that voters care about. So I actually think we've got to let go of that conventional political wisdom, that tough on crime always works, that Democrats always lose. They lose when they are silent on the issue and they run away. They lose when they sound just like their opposition and they run to the right. But they win, like Tom Suozzi demonstrated, like many other Democrats have demonstrated in the past couple of years, when they turn the narrative away from right. tough or soft to actually serious. I, I want to show you something that's been airing, or at least a montage of things that have been airing uh, on Fox News in the last few days, and then we'll chat about it on the other side. Tonight, we will show you the latest record-breaking crime statistics, uh, the latest big crime carjackings. President Biden is staring down a raging border crisis that's bringing violent crime to America. New York City, the overrun of hotels and high schools, the organized crime gangs, the beating of cops, the squatting in homes, the revolving Rikers Island door. Part of this is, is that they're hearing a lot about this in the conservative media, right, or that it gets it gets brought up a lot there. And, and so these Republican candidates feel the need to talk about it. Your argument is, OK, fine. If that's what they're talking about, Democrats shouldn't shirk from that fight, shouldn't shirk from that conversation, should try to take it on, right? That's right. So Republicans have already signaled they're going to spend millions and millions of dollars on ads attacking Democrats for being soft on crime. We just saw President Trump last week in Michigan saying, you know, the border's out of control. Migrant crime is out of control. There's blood on the streets. What did you hear from President Biden and the Democrats? Pretty much nothing other than, well, there was a tough on the border deal that the GOP walked away from. But there's no multi-million dollar ad talking about what actually makes communities safe. So Democrats are unfortunately doing the thing that they often do, which is to run away from the issue or sort of run to the right. And it turns out, again, as I mentioned, uh, Swazi winning in Long Island, defeating literally millions and millions of dollars of ads calling him the defund candidate or calling him soft on crime. He did it not by going to the right and sounding just like his opposition, but you heard his first sentences, which is, we can find common ground, we can address the issues that matter to voters. And Ed, I want to point out in that stat you just showed about Latino voters, 31 percent prefer Trump on crime to 20 yep. percent. Biden. The most important thing to take away there is neither party is above majority. Neither party is above water. Voters actually think both parties are doing a bad job on this issue. Republicans historically have had a small advantage, and it's because of volume, because Fox News and Republican candidates talk about the issue all the time. Democrats uh, disadvantage the sort of voter trust gap, if you will, for Democrats. It's not about policy. 
It's about volume. They simply don't address the issue. And first of all, voters want to know you care about the thing they care about across the political spectrum, which is safety. Do you, do you get a sense that not even just on crime, but just in general, that you, you got Democratic candidates out there who see something being talked about in the conservative media space or on a channel they don't necessarily spend a lot of time watching and think, I'm not going to talk about that because it means the other side is setting the agenda. Here's what I want to talk about instead. Your argument, in essence, is saying, okay, fine. If that's what voters are talking about, at least on that other channel where I need to win voters, take it on, whether it's crime okay. and violence, whether it's something else, right? And, and your argument is Democrats don't do enough of that. Yeah, that's exactly right. So if right. Democrats are silent on the issue, it's getting defined by Republicans, and that's a disadvantage for Democrats. All right. Insha Rockman, uh, interesting conversation. Thank you for bringing it to us, and uh, we'll do it again. Thanks for having us. All righty. That does it for today. We'll be back with another edition of America Decides tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. Thank you for streaming CBS News. Washington is the seat of power. Um, national security, foreign policy, global economics, every story comes through Washington in some way. We bring some of the most powerful voices in America to the table. We don't just ask the questions, you have to go deeper. We try to understand what's at the heart of the issue we're talking about to then come forward with solutions. Face the Nation on CBS. The justices ruled that Harvard and the University of North Carolina violated the Constitution. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to end affirmative action in college admissions, uncertainty sets in for some students of color. Affirmative action really gave us an equal opportunity. CBS Reports explores the historic decision and what it means for those chasing an opportunity to change their lives. I knew that college was the ticket to break this cycle. The end of affirmative action, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Hey, let's go. You guys good? Hey. All right, we good? Keep going. It's the clock, it's ticking. Off we go. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. It's time for 60 Minutes, Sundays on CBS. An original documentary from CBS Reports. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever. Curing diseases, scientific breakthroughs, making lives better. They can help us with medical discovery, scientific discoveries, doing better agriculture, having cures for things like Alzheimer's. It's also going to really transform the way we work. The uplifting potential of artificial intelligence is limitless. It gives you a friend, somebody to chat with 24-7 that is non-judgmental. He makes me feel loved and desired. And so are its downfalls. The problem with all this AI is that it's unpredictable and uncontrollable. The choices we make now will have lasting effects for decades, maybe even centuries. The ChatGPT revolution, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We are about to see American weapons in the hands of Mexican cartels. A gun pipeline to Mexico. We are arming the cartels. 100%, no doubt about it. Happening right under our noses. Uh, who's doing something about this? Nobody. A CBS Reports exclusive. Most Americans have no idea that we are effectively arming the enemy next door. This is the story the American people need to know. Arming cartels, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America Decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education. Both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bringing you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides, Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. All right, friends, welcome back to CBS News. I'm Errol Barnett. Here's a recap of the top stories we're tracking for you right now. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is at the White House today for an official state visit with President Biden. The White House calls Japan the pivotal member of the Quad. That's the nickname for the informal alliance between the U.S., Japan, Australia, and India. High-level talks this afternoon will be followed by a formal state dinner at the White House tonight. 
A New York judge sentenced former Trump CFO Alan Weisselberg to five months behind bars for perjury. He admitted to lying while testifying on behalf of the former president in the company's civil fraud trial. Weisselberg served 100 days in prison last year for tax evasion. Consumer inflation rose higher than expected. The CPI is up a little less than half a percent from last month, but it also rose 3.5% from this time last year. Experts say the stubborn rise in prices may prompt the Federal Reserve to hold off on plans to begin lowering interest rates this year. All right, another wave of severe weather right now is sweeping through parts of the south and the Mississippi Valley. Look at that. This will continue throughout the afternoon. In fact, we have some video to show you from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, harsh thunderstorms there are downing trees and utility poles. That's happening beneath the radar images you're seeing. Some homes have been destroyed, and while around thousands of people in Mississippi uh, at this moment also are without power. CBS News correspondent Tom Hansen is covering the storm in Jackson, Mississippi, getting soaked. Tom, what else are you feeling and seeing on the ground there? Errol, this storm has been powerful and fast moving. You know, I flew through this storm, in fact, last night as I was getting into Jackson. It tossed our plane around like a toy. Now we are seeing some of the impacts on the ground. I want you to take a look around me. You can see that there are downed power lines, something that is happening in many neighborhoods across Jackson. You can see the yards here littered with branches. And then take a look at this house. A massive tree fell on this house, essentially splitting the house in two. Now, we've talked with emergency management here in Jackson. They say that they are watching the Pearl River very closely. The primary concern here, of course, is flooding. Elsewhere, the concern are those powerful tornadoes that we have already seen, one overnight in Houston that leveled a church, and then another tornado in Louisiana. So this storm is packing a punch, certainly nothing to balk at. Errol? Yeah, and with those down power lines, uh... Uh, also provide a danger. We want everyone to remain safe, including you and the crew there. We know the power is out, but how long will folks in this part of the country experience this severe weather, Tom? We are nowhere near out of the woods just yet. This storm system is expected to last throughout the day, possibly into the night. And if you zoom out, just to get a context of how powerful this storm system is and how much of a concern there should be, if you look at the Torcon map, there is a large portion of pink in southern Louisiana, southern Alabama, Mississippi, uh, and that is a level seven. That basically means that there is a very strong likelihood of tornadoes, not just in that area that is pink, but also in a 50-mile radius surrounding that area. Officials are urging people not to go out in this storm and to seek shelter if there is a tornado on the ground. We've already seen other precautions being taken. Louisiana closing all state offices today and schools here in Jackson are remote. So people are taking this storm very seriously, Errol, and we are certainly nowhere near out of the woods just yet. All right, great warning there, Tom. We want everyone there to stay safe. Thank you very much. Former exchange student Amanda Knox is on trial once again in Italy, this time for slander. She's charged with wrongly accusing a Congolese man of murdering her roommate back in 2007. Now, you may remember Knox was convicted for that murder and uh, served four years in prison for being, before being exonerated. During her interrogation, Knox pointed the finger at the owner of the bar where she worked. She later recanted that claim in a note she wrote the following afternoon. CBS News foreign correspondent Chris Livesay joins us now from Rome with the latest on this. Chris, I think I've basically tried to give the broad brush strokes, but explain better in detail what this trial is really about. Hey, Errol. Yeah, you know, you have to remember, this happened when Amanda Knox was just 20 years old. Uh, she barely spoke Italian at the time. She was living in Perugia on, on a college study abroad program. Just imagine the circumstances. She finds out that her housemate, her, her roommate, has been murdered. And then after sleepless nights, she has to give testimony. And then in the midst of that testimony, speaking in very broken Italian, sometimes without an official interpreter on hand, she wrongly accuses somebody, uh, putting them at the scene of the crime who absolutely was not there. But that person still had to spend two weeks 
under arrest as a result of that accusation. So this is what this case is all about. She was found guilty of slandering this other person. Now is an opportunity for her to finally clear her name and, and set the record straight as she sees it and show the circumstances that she was under. At the time she issued, there was a four page statement that was taken by police, but that's since been ruled inadmissible because of those circumstances. Now she has an opportunity to submit a 20 page letter that she's written herself. We can only presume in perfect Italian because she was able to perfect her Italian in the four years that she had to spend in prison. I bet, and that's a really interesting uh, detail. We know that Knox is not in court for this. What do we know about how she's living her life now? Yeah, you know, so ever since then, she's been able to pull the pieces of her life back together and, uh, you know, start a family. She's married, she has two children, she's 36 years old, and today she works mostly as an advocate, uh, specifically for people who are caught up in the same types of circumstances that she was, you know, wrong people who have been wrongly accused or people who have been victims of forced confessions. Um, you know, she's also spoken out about this at length. Uh, she has made a podcast. Uh, she continues to work on a podcast with her husband. Uh, she's also made uh, a series on a meditation app where she talks about resilience. So she's definitely not gone anywhere. She seems to have turned this massive setback into something that gives her more and more energy to move forward and turn it into a strength. And perhaps next she'll do a language translation app. Who knows? Uh, Chris Livesay, appreciate the update on this. Thank you very much. Former President Donald Trump is now weighing in on the Arizona Supreme Court, allowing the enforcement of a near total abortion ban. The former president says it goes too far, adding that abortion is, quote, all about states' rights. He goes on to say it will be straightened out. Yesterday, Arizona Supreme Court ruled that a law which criminalizes most abortions can be enforced, eventually, uh, essentially superseding a 15-week ban that's also on the books. For context here, this 1864 law, which is now back in effect, was created nearly half a century before Arizona became a state, before automobiles were even invented, and before Alfred Nobel patented dynamite. I think that puts this into context. Governor Katie Hobbs, who's a Democrat, is one of many politicians who's come out against the court's decision. On CBS Mornings, she appeared confident that voters in Arizona will approve a proposed constitutional amendment that would add the right to an abortion to the state's constitution. Arizonans don't, res don't support extreme abortion bans, and this 15-week ban is still extreme. It, again, no exception for rape or incest, no regard for complications of pregnancy. Uh, that's what will be in place. Uh, and again, Arizonans will have the ability to weigh in on this uh, with a constitutional amendment in November. Officials in Chicago have released body cam video that shows officers firing 96 times at a driver who they pulled over. We have to give you a warning here. This video is disturbing. Initial evidence from an independent investigation shows the driver, a 26-year-old named Dexter Reed, fired the first shot. Reed was killed and one officer was injured. The plainclothes officer says they'd stop Reed on suspicion of not wearing a seatbelt. Reed's family is calling for charges to be filed. Chicago's mayor says the footage is deeply disturbing. I'm personally devastated to see yet another young black man lose his life during an interaction with the police. I've also been praying for the full recovery of the officer who was shot during this interaction. Now, the Chicago Fraternal Order of Police has not responded to CBS News' request for comment on this. All right, at this point, we're gonna take a very short break. Stay with us, you're streaming CBS News. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Ah! And reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da, 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 da. and truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. 
this moment, terrorists could be plotting another attack. 9-11 triggered a counter-terrorist system that included a secret database. This person needs a closer look. A growing list of nearly 2 million people, including some Americans who say they're innocent. For one hour flight, I have to spend six hours to go and come back. CBS Reports explores the system, the people responsible for it, and those pushing for change. I'm not fighting against them. I'm fighting for them to do the right thing. The Watch List, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Don't miss true crime anytime you want, anywhere you go. With the 48 Hours Podcast. Real crimes, real lives, real justice. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Listen to 48 Hours on Apple Podcasts. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Imagine yourself in Manhattan with no police, no army, no mayor. The people of Haiti stare down poverty, corruption, natural disasters, and violence. 90% of the guns that are used by gangs in Haiti are American guns. But with an unbreakable spirit and eternal optimism. There are days where I cry, but we can't be discouraged. We still believe in Haiti. They're still able to look ahead with hope. Haiti is on the brink of transformation, a radical shift. Haitians are coming together and saying things must change. Fighting for Haiti, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Everybody wakes up in the morning and they are pelted with alerts that frighten them, news that agitates them. With this show, we have the time to explain what's going on. These migrants, they've been released. Explain the status that allows them to be released, to slow things down a little bit. What are the big sets of questions for China and its ambitions? Hackers are stepping up their attacks to extort victims. Let's start with easy. Who's attacking? Here's a deeper understanding of what's happening. Prime Time with John Dickerson. Stream on the free CBS News app. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. On our places, bright, shiny faces. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. The Environmental Protection Agency has issued groundbreaking regulations designed to make drinking water safer for people all over the United States. Now, the agency is requiring public water utilities to test for six different types of substances known as PFAS to reduce people's exposure to them in drinking water. PFAS, also commonly known as forever chemicals, are found in a wide variety of products. And that's despite a growing body of research demonstrating their negative health effects on all of us. This new effort marks the first ever national regulations for PFAS in drinking water. These new standards really are a breakthrough because what they do is they will address six of these forever toxic chemicals, um, six of the ones that we know are pretty common and are extremely toxic. So by regulating those, EPA's estimate is that as many as 105 million people have these chemicals in their water right now. That stuff is getting into people's bodies and is threatening their health. CBS News senior national and environmental correspondent Ben Tracy joins us now to dive into this historic announcement. And Ben, I feel like there's two reactions to this. On one side, it sounds like an encouraging development that we're better protected. But on the other side, it's only six of these so-called forever chemicals. Help us understand why they're so dangerous and how long they really do last. So these are really incredibly strong man-made chemicals. They're resistant to heat and water and oil and dirt. And that makes them great for all the products that they're used in. You saw some of those products up on the screen. It's everything from nonstick cookware to water-resistant clothing. But the problem is they're very hard to break down. They can last for thousands of years in the environment. And they have been linked to serious health issues. Everything from you know liver damage and immune system damage to certain forms of cancer and then developmental issues with children. So that is the concern that this stuff is in the water supply that nearly 2 million, um, 200 million Americans are drinking. And how exactly, Ben, will the EPA try to enforce these regulations? 
Well, these are legally enforceable. Basically, water, public water utilities around the country are going to have to make changes to comply with these new rules. They have some time to do it. They have about three years to monitor their water system, find out how much PFAS is actually in their system, report that to the public, make that public so people know what they're drinking, and then they get about two years to comply with these rules. So they're going to have to install equipment to basically bring those levels down if they exceed these new EPA rules to the levels that would comply. And as I mentioned, and as we spoke about coming into this, uh, the EPA is restricting the use of a total of six uh, PFASs in, in drinking water. But what, there are more than 15,000 of these kinds of chemicals. So how significant from your point of view, Ben, on reporting on environmental and climate issues, how significant are these regulations specifically? It's still really significant. Yes, you hear six versus the 15,000, but the reason they're focusing on those six are those are the six that are really toxic. Those are the ones that are causing the really significant health issues and ones that have found to be prevalent in drinking water systems. So the thought is by going after those and forcing these systems to reduce those to near zero levels that you really will mitigate some of the health risks uh, that currently exist. And for folks watching who, you know, want to follow better guidance and reduce their risk, and exposure to any type of forever chemicals, what would you recommend? Well, we got to be honest, this is this is not easy. I mean, this is not as simple as, you know, running your water through a Brita filter at your house or something like that. You'd have to install basically a reverse osmosis system, the kind of thing that goes underneath your sink. It costs a lot of money. So what EPA is doing is they're saying we would rather do this at the utility level. So you folks at home, when you turn on your tap, you don't have to worry about it. You can actually trust what is coming out of there. So some of that technology will be installed at these water treatment plants. And therefore, you wouldn't have to worry about it as much when it comes out of your tap. All right. I'll take some time for this to kick in, but at least it seems like a step in the right direction. Ben Tracy, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Errol. A new report suggests some of the nation's biggest companies are discriminating against black job applicants. In the largest of its kind study, a group from the National Bureau of Economic Research sent out 80,000 resumes to 97 companies over a three-year span between 2019 and 2021. They use fake resumes, but with equal qualifications, changing only personal details to imply an applicant's race, age, and gender. Overall, researchers found employers contacted white applicants more than black ones, with the widest gap being between companies' genuine parts and auto nation. So far, neither company has responded to our requests for comment. However, Genuine Parts did tell the New York Times, quote, we are always evaluating our practices to ensure inclusivity and break down barriers, and we will continue to do so. AutoNation did not respond to the New York Times. Let's bring in Evan Rose now. He is a co-author of this report and is an assistant economics professor at the University of Chicago. Evan, great to have you with us on this topic. I'm just wondering from your point of view, with all the research you've done, what were the most significant findings and what it tells us about the U.S. labor market as a whole? Great. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so this was uh, a, a huge study, as you mentioned. We sent thousands and thousands of resumes to many hundreds of companies. And I think the most important thing that we learned from the study is that companies seem to really differ in the extent to which they discriminate based on the characteristics uh, that we're looking at, which is both both race and gender. You highlighted the fact that two companies appear to discriminate much more than the other companies in our study. I think it's also important to recognize that some companies appear to discriminate a, uh, quite a bit less or, or even not at all in our study. It's just massive heterogeneity in the economy and the extent to which we see this discrimination against distinctively black names. Now, importantly, that discrimination doesn't seem to be random. It's concentrated in particular industries for race discrimination, for example, firms that do things with cars and car parts like AutoNation and Genuine Parts, which owns the Napa, Napa Auto Parts brand seem to discriminate much more than firms in other industries, including industries like uh, food stores and grocery stores, for example. So we think this is important because I think it means, first of all, there might be something we could do about this from an enforcement perspective. We also think it might be it might mean that there are things firms can do themselves that might mitigate or exacerbate the type of discrimination that you could see in their organization. The fact that all firms don't seem to discriminate in the same way suggests that this is just an inevitable feature of the labor market, that there's going to be discrimination out there always. Instead, it may be that policies and practices that firms can, can adopt, how they structure hiring, the type of training they give people might actually have an impact on these, on these measures. And we hope that by releasing these data, we can start to learn some of those uh, policies and practices and share those across firms in a way that can help reduce the type of discrimination that we're seeing here.
It's a fascinating study, extensive research that you've done. We mentioned areas in which we're more likely to discriminate, which companies and which areas were less likely. Yeah, so we see less discrimination on the basis of race against our distinctively black names in these fictional applications we sent in the food store industries, which I mentioned earlier. You can think about that like grocery stores. Uh, we see less discrimination in freight and transport, which include companies like FedEx and UPS. Um, as well as some in other utility companies uh, and communications companies like Charter and, and, and Spectrum. So again, it's not a universal phenomenon. It's not sort of inevitable that there's going to be discrimination in, in the types of jobs we're studying here. It does seem to have strong concentration in particular firms and, and among firms that are concentrated in these particular industries. And again, for our viewers, the resumes were identical. The qualifications and the skills were the same. It was the personal information that you changed. How then, if, if companies are watching this, people who can actually Im, you know, Im, uh, impact change, what can companies do to address discrimination and, and you know, extinguish this type of behavior? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And, and hopefully, hopefully something that we can continue to work on in, in future research. You know, the short answer is we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes at these companies. We see what our uh, our experiment is establishing is that companies do differ in the extent of discrimination that they exhibit as measured in an experiment like ours. We have some clues about what policies and practices might matter here, including things like how centralized their HR operation seems to be. Some companies, it seems that many individuals are involved in making hiring decisions at a single establishment. So it might be four or five different people calling back job applications at one store. At other companies, it looks like there might be just one person who's overseeing hiring for a couple a couple different stores across a broad, broader set of establishments. And what we infer from that is that it seems like companies where maybe they've invested a little bit more in professionalizing the hiring function and offered some kind of training, maybe that's one way in which you can mitigate the type of discrimination that you'd measure in a, in a study like ours. But you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this project and release these names and talk about the, which companies are actually in our list is to open the way for other researchers and policymakers and everyone to dig into what policies and practices really do seem to differ across these firms and think about what we can learn about how to, how to address this problem at a more systematic level. Yeah, it's a sobering report, but hopefully it's just part of a step in the right direction. Evan Rose, we really appreciate you discussing your findings with us, uh, joining us from Chicago. Okay, thanks so much. I'm Errol Barnett, the CBS Broadcast Center in New York. Thanks for being with me. Coming up next, it's America Decides. The Biden campaign held reproductive rights events across the battleground state of North Carolina today. Now they're looking to put abortion access front and center ahead of November. Plus, Republicans get a lot of credit for their record on crime, but Democrats are increasingly trying to make it a winning issue of their own. We'll take a look at why. America Decides is next. You're streaming CBS News. Okay, so let's just start at the beginning. Well, let me start with this. What is at stake here? What is the answer then? Do you know why? You want me to just keep going? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Were there death threats? How is this possible? What's wrong with that argument? Are you saying they lied? Have you told the government that? Why won't you say the word crisis? You're not answering my question. This really is that scary? Does that make sense? What do you mean? What does that mean? Did any of that make what sense? Have you What's your response? What happened? Why? 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 It's time for the CBS News Original 60 Minutes, Sunday on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. There is no more room in our city. New York City is receiving record numbers of migrants. Today, we're going to have more than 500 adults and children come through that door. Tensions rise as shelters reach max capacity. We don't have to take care of them. CBS Reports goes inside a crisis cities and families are facing as they fight to survive. The United States still has that glimmer of hope for people to come here. Fighting for a future. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. On Face the Nation, the way to learn is to listen. We may have a recession. Listening to how someone explains themselves is so key to understanding their perspective. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Since you started La Soup in 2014, do you have any sense as to how much food you've rescued from the landfill? We've rescued four and a half million pounds. I can't even fathom how much food that is. And that's one little person in one little city in America. We're going to call this chicken piccata. We did 450 of these meals today. This is the exact dish that you and I are going to have. Yep. 
Oh, my really good. Is it good? Mm-hmm. Having a plan of how to keep people fed should be in every single city. So if we eliminated food waste, could we eliminate hunger? Yes. Eating Trash, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education. Both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bringing you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. This is CBS. Sunday morning, actor Kirsten Dunst, plus Wayne Brady on Broadway, and a beloved cherry tree named Stumpy. Vladimir Putin is about to be elected to a fifth term as the unchallenged authority of Russia. So what does his opposition look like, and where are they? You would be in a Russian prison just for doing this interview. Oh, for sure. 60 Minutes introduces you to the Russian resistance. This is a devastating decision that will have huge consequences. I thought that the ruling was asinine, um, but it's up to Arizona to fix it. And it sounds like they're going to, uh, to do that. This is about restoring stability in the region, and I think we have a chance of doing that. Hello, I'm Ed O'Keefe, CBS News in Washington. Welcome to America Decide. We have a team of journalists on the story tonight across the country with a look at the fallout from the ruling and the politics of abortion rights. The Arizona Supreme Court's decision to let a Civil War-era ban on abortion services take effect is earning bipartisan condemnation. The Democratic Governor Katie Hobbs, President Biden, and former President Donald Trump all say they don't like it. The Grand Canyon State's High Court upheld an 1864 law that allows for abortions to save the life of the mother but not in cases of rape or incest. Hobbs called on the state's legislature to repeal the ban during an appearance on CBS Mornings. Arizonans across the state are reeling from this devastating decision that reinstates a near total ban, a ban that was passed in 1864, before Arizona was even a state, before uh, women had the right to vote. We begin with Elizabeth Campbell, in Phoenix. Elizabeth, good to see you. You spoke with an abortion provider in the state about the ruling, as well as an attorney for an anti-abortion rights organization. What did they tell you? Good to be with you, Ed. And fallout is right as people try to regroup and figure out where they're going to go from here. Now, it's important to emphasize that we do not yet know when this ruling will go into effect. There's at least 45 more days before that happens. I talked to one provider. They perform about 100 abortions a week, both by the pill and the procedure. Take a listen to the concern she has now that this has passed. Increased maternal mortality, forced pregnancy, increased infant mortality, and just this despair and the devastation that people feel when they find out that they don't have bodily autonomy and they don't have the ability to access abortion. Forced pregnancy is real and pregnancy is really hard on the body and there's so many risks. It is riskier to go through an entire pregnancy than to have an abortion and it will just have a devastating effect on the people of Arizona. Now, that clinic does promise me that they will perform procedures up until the day that the law goes into effect. On the flip side, also keeping up that fight with a possible ballot measure coming down this fall, is the law firm that took this case to the Supreme Court. Take a listen to what their lead lawyer had to say today as well. 
Life is always worth protecting. Think about everything we've learned over the past 50 years. Unborn children start having a heartbeat at six weeks, fingers and toes at eight weeks, and unique fingerprints at 10 weeks. Uh, a people does well when they uh, elect officials that work vigorously to protect life from the moment of conception. Now, as you said, this is the Grand Canyon State, and it's also a swing state, Ed. So this debate is not going anywhere come the fall. You took the words right out of my mouth, Elizabeth. In Phoenix, thank you for that. Thanks to those that you spoke with today. Now on to another battleground state. Shana Mazel is in Charlotte, North Carolina, where the Biden campaign is holding events focused on abortion rights across the Tar Heel State. Shana, you were there as two women affected by abortion bans campaigned for the president today. What did they have to say? That's right, Ed. So they started out this morning in Durham. They went to the Winston-Salem and they ended in Charlotte. They both spoke about their personal experiences in Louisiana and in Texas being impacted by the restrictive abortion bans that both states have. And they really shared that personal experience during roundtables with physicians, medical professionals, but as well as state lawmakers. And they're sending a similar message that we've seen from the Biden campaign. And that is laying the blame at the feet of former President Donald Trump for those restrictive abortion bans. Now, the Biden campaign featured one of the two women in a new ad. What did she have to tell you? Correct. Amanda. I spoke with her and I asked her why it was important for her to share her story and repeat it so often and even on large platforms like the Biden campaign ad. Here's what she had to say. I think my greatest fear is that what happened to me will happen to other people. And if we don't reelect President Biden and Vice President Harris in November, that will be the reality of this country. And it's really difficult to relive this over and over again. But there's nothing more important to me right now than this campaign and making sure that President Biden is reelected. So that's Amanda from Texas, and she tells me that she has plans to continue what she's been doing, hitting the campaign trail. She'll be in Milwaukee next week. Ed? Shana Mazel in Charlotte, thank you so much. This is what former President Donald Trump had to say about the controversial abortion ruling today while campaigning in Georgia. Well, yeah, they did, and that'll be straightened out. And uh, as you know, it's all about states' rights. That'll be straightened out. And I'm sure that the governor and everybody else are going to bring it back into reason, and that will be taken care of, I think, very quickly saying that it'll be straightened out. He was also asked whether he would sign a national abortion ban if he's elected president again, and if such a ban ever passes Congress. He shook his head in response and said no. We're joined now by Molly Ball and Deepa Shivram. Molly is a senior political correspondent for The Wall Street Journal. Deepa is a White House correspondent for NPR. Good to see both of you this afternoon. I know both of you have been tracking this quite closely as well uh, from a national political perspective. Uh, Talk about the Department of Odd Timing. The former president comes out with this abortion announcement earlier this week, uh, seems to try to brush it off and say states will deal with this, and then Arizona goes and drops this huge ruling that now upends the politics of that battleground state. Absolutely. This is now the most restrictive abortion law in any of the uh, swing states. Uh, and it goes all the way back to the 19th century. I think that uh, it was a big surprise to a lot of people, including in Arizona, uh, that the Supreme Court made this decision and reactivated this very old law. And it does uh, really underscore, I think, the Biden campaign couldn't have asked for a better confluence of events to underscore uh, the message that they're trying to send, which is not only the, you know, the side that he's on on this important issue, but putting it on the top of voters' minds. You know, we have seen in a lot of polls uh, that uh, this is really the only top issue on which the president is trusted over Donald Trump. And when voters are asked what's the most important issue, they tend to say immigration, they say the economy, they say a lot of other things. Uh, and those are issues where Trump does better. This is the issue that the Biden campaign hopes will decide the election because it is an issue where voters take his side. And in Arizona, the fact that uh, it's likely to be on the ballot this November uh, makes it that much more of what Democrats hope will be a driver of turnout in their favor. If anything, that's what brings people to the polls and then they'll... Conceivably vote for the president. Yeah. Now, 
Deepa, as someone tracking the Biden campaign, talk about how they're recalibrating now in the wake of this decision, especially in Arizona. I mean, the, almost immediately you saw the vice president's team, Kamala right. Harris, who has been the lead spokesperson on this issue for the administration, immediately announced that she's headed to Tucson later this week. She'll be there on Friday. That really utilizes that kind of shoot out of the cannon uh, effort that she usually does with these very hot button issues, abortion included. And th she'll be on the ground. She'll be rallying with voters. Um, this is exactly the kind of momentum that they're hoping to carry into November. And not only did, did that happen this week, but as you see Trump's announcements playing out and, and whether or not he'll, you know, sign a national abortion ban, things like that, the Biden campaign is very much trying to remind reporters and also remind uh, voters right now, you know, Trump is someone who has toggled a lot on this issue. And even though he's saying something right now, you know, look back at everything else he's done when it comes to this issue and, and really trying to keep that top of mind, like you said. Both of you uh, and this reporter have been around these campaigns long enough to observe <laughs> in the last few days, at least I did, that they seemed to anticipate this quite well, the Biden campaign, between last week when there was that ad they released uh, with the woman in Texas uh, in response to President Trump saying that he was going to go down this road and introduce this decision to then anticipating this Arizona ruling, the vice president had pre-taped a bunch of things that they released on social media, immediately announced that they're going to Tucson. They seem to be ready for this one in ways that we don't always see, especially national campaigns, ready to react quickly to something. Well, what I'm hearing from Democratic sources is that the ads that they are, of course, producing on this issue are among the best testing ads in their arsenal. Mm. And they are very effective because, as we know, this is a, an election that a lot of voters are not excited about. Right. These are two candidates that a lot of voters are not excited about. And so it is incumbent on the campaigns to remind them of the stakes, remind them of the policies that are at stake and the potential consequences of your vote. So I think we can expect both campaigns uh, to be hammering on the policy stakes of that election of this election. And for the Biden campaign, that is going to mean, as we've heard repeatedly from them, democracy and Dobbs. They see those as the winning issues and they're, they're They are, of course, prepared to hammer them home. So when these new developments reinforce their message and unfortunately for former President Trump, there are going to continue to be new developments. This is the meaning uh, you know, when he said this is up to the states, this is federalism, this is states' rights, this is what that means. It means states are constantly going to be making these kinds of moves. We're going to constantly be seeing new uh, cases reminding people of, of the unsettled abortion regime when it comes to policy. And there's going to continue to be uh, ways to remind voters of, of the importance of this issue. And keep in mind, this is an issue that has been a winning issue for Democrats ever since the Dobbs decision came out. I mean, Democrats, Biden and Harris, right. they have that on their side, right? They, they've seen in states across the country and even conservative states, right, where voters have come out and said, no, we want to protect abortion rights. So it kind of helps in that regard to have all of this stock piled up. Like you said, they're ready to go because they've seen it work in the past several months and years. And Although I would, I would quibble with that just a little bit to say yeah. the abortion has been a winning issue for abortion. It hasn't necessarily been a winning issue for Democrats. We have yet to see a Republican gubernatorial or Senate candidate lose because of the abortion issue or at all since since Roe was overturned. And, and you this mean is an incumbent? Exactly. OK, because Daniel Cameron, of course, struggled in the gubernatorial race in Kentucky. We have seen it be that. an issue in right. some races, uh, but we have not seen it defeat incumbents and we have never seen it play in a presidential race. This That's is right. the first presidential race since the overturning of Roe. Uh, and so I think Deep is right. It certainly has a lot of potential for Democrats, but we don't yet know how it's going to interact with the presidential when so much else is on voters' minds. And when we have so much time to go, because it right. is just April. But uh, certainly uh, this week's zig is uh, to the benefit of the Democrats. We'll see uh, where the zags are going forward. Molly Ball, Deepa Shivram, so great to have both of you here. Thank you, because you both know what you're talking about, and that's, uh, <laughs> that's helpful. Today, President Biden tried to focus attention on what the U.S. is doing across Asia and the Indo-Pacific region. Coming up, we head to the White House for the latest on the president's big meetings with the prime minister of Japan and learn more about who's joining them tomorrow. You're streaming America Decides. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. Does this carrier strike group stand ready? It's just incredible to see there's an active search and rescue operation going on 12 hours after this accident. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. 
I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm gonna use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. People with developmental disabilities were once sequestered by the hundreds of thousands in institutions. Many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because lack of attention, lack of imagination, lack of uh, adequate manpower. Disability activists have since torn down barriers blocking them from living at home or in the community. We conclude that Title II of the ADA requires states to provide community-based treatment for persons with mental disabilities. But of the 16,000 people who remain in state-operated institutions, half are in five states, and Illinois is one of them. I don't want to live in the institution. It makes me feel discriminated against. Do you think there are people living in institutions in Illinois that don't need to be living there? Yeah, because they're proving it as soon as they get out. President Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida announced plans today for closer military and intelligence cooperation. The president called the U.S.-Japan alliance a beacon to the entire world. CBS's Weisha Zhang joins us now from the White House. Weisha, good to see you. How exactly do the United States and Japan plan on working together to counter China? Well, Ed, the announcements today really center around these two countries' militaries and finding ways that they can cooperate better so that they can fend off a potential uh, adversary. Although I should say that the president did not explicitly talk about China or its president Xi Jinping at length, uh, those two topics were certainly the backdrop and the entire undercurrent of this uh, discussion today. And so to that end, they are looking for ways to, as an example, produce a defense weapons together. They are also trying to bolster their military command center in that region to see if there are new ways that they can collaborate. And so all of this, as you mentioned it, is because, as we very well know, every piece of the president's foreign policy is attached to Beijing. And so as Beijing continues its offensive, especially in the South China Sea, the president wants to show that it is getting as many allies as possible in the region and sort of sending a message without saying it that we're prepared in case we have to be. And, and to that point, they're, they're having a, a third leader join them tomorrow, right? That's right. This is going to be the president of the Philippines, Marcos Tomorrow, Fernandez Marcos Jr., and he will be here for a trilateral meeting. This comes as in that South China Sea I was just talking about, China has been aggressive towards Philippines Coast Guard, and they're also worried about how China could try to control the seas there. And they're really focused on economic uh, collaboration and growth in the area. But again, Ed, as you know, this points back to China and what they can do as a show of force, if you will, uh, before anything actually happens. 
And while the president wants to keep as much focus as possible on Asia and the Indo-Pacific, he did have to talk today about the war in Gaza. What did he have to say about ceasefire negotiations? Well, it's really interesting, Ed, because just yesterday here at the White House, hostage families expressed frustration that they seem to that, you know, when people mentioned ceasefires and a temporary ceasefire, they were not hearing that being linked back to their loved ones, hostages being released. And so that is exactly what we heard from President Biden today, reminding everyone what's at stake. Take a listen. A new proposal on the table, Bill Burns led the effort to, uh, for us, we're grateful for his work. There's a now up to Hamas. They need to move on the proposal that's been made. And as I said, uh, we'll get these hostages home where they belong, but we'll also bring back a six week ceasefire that we need now. President Biden was also asked about recent comments he made during an interview that Netanyahu is making a mistake in his handling of the war in Gaza. And he was asked explicitly whether the U.S. was prepared to condition aid. But the president sort of talked around it. He talked about all the things Netanyahu is doing to open more humanitarian corridors, all the promises he has made to better protect civilians and humanitarian aid workers. So President Biden said, we'll see. We Zhang at the White House. I guess the other interesting thing is that the Japanese prime minister brought along, what, 200 more cherry blossom trees to be planted here in Washington. That's and then two, right. And two Japanese astronauts get to go to the moon with the U.S. whenever we get back there. So that's a pretty extensive day for them. Yes, and it will be capped off with a very extravagant state dinner tonight where Paul Simon is performing. So, you know, a lot of work and a lot of pomp and circumstance, which is why we love covering state dinners, Ed. Don't we? That's right. One day we'll get invited to one. Li Zhang, good to see you over there at the White House. Thank you. For decades, politicians have used the threat of crime to try to win over voters. Next, we explore its effectiveness, even when crime rates start dropping. You're streaming America Decides. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Nate has one of the quickest minds I've ever seen. Tony has a way of making people feel comfortable. Gail has this unbelievable knack to ask the question that you're asking at home. I've been told I could talk to a tree, and that's pretty much true. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. It didn't seem like anything could happen. Because nothing ever happens in East Palestine. But it did. Authorities released toxic fumes from five derailed train cars. Acute bronchitis due to chemical fumes. Did you ever have these problems before the derailment? No, ma'am. This neighborhood's not safe no more. We can assure the community that there's not vinyl chloride entering their communities. Then why are there so many people feeling these various symptoms of bloody noses or difficulty breathing and bronchitis? That's a hard question to answer. We're talking about one of the most blatant releases of a mixture of some of the most toxic chemicals that we've seen in America. I feel like now I have a duty to warn other communities. If my daughter has to watch me die of cancer, at least it saves someone else. This case. It's like a screenplay, something straight out of Hollywood. But it's not fiction. It's 48 hours. Human remains found this week. Four families shattered. There's no physical evidence. The mystery would haunt investigators for years. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Get it, Like a John Grisham novel. A gripping true crime original, 48 Hours, now streaming on the free CBS News app. This is CBS. Welcome. 
out here in space. Sightseers in space, the thrill of a lifetime. Seeing the Earth from space, it was so exhilarating. But the risks that come with the territory. There have been four fatal accidents. That's a 1% fatal accident rate. Might make you look before you launch. If you had one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, it would have a public crisis. Space Tourism, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Tonight, what does $100 buy you at the grocery store versus five years ago? How inflation is affecting the food staples. Then, a rare chance of daytime tornadoes in the South. And the new rules that can make water safer to drink. On the CBS Evening News. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes Welcome back to America Decides. Those who've long followed politics on the impact of ads promising to fight crime, including the infamous Willie Horton ad you just saw there. Violent crime is down, but Republicans continue campaigning on concerns about crime and violence. A recent poll found Latino voters, for example, gave former President Donald Trump an 11-point advantage over President Biden on fighting crime, but that gap is actually starting to narrow. Both the Democratic and Republican candidates in a recent race to replace Congressman George Santos out on Long Island campaigned on crime and immigration as well. Swazi and Biden's defund the police agenda has led to more crime and violence. I'll work across the aisle to do what our leaders haven't, secure our border. Close the routes used for legal immigration. Let's bring in Insha Rockman. She serves as vice president of advocacy and partnerships at the Vera Institute of Justice. The organization says its mission is to end the over-criminalization and mass incarceration of people of color, immigrants, and the poor. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Now, look, despite violent crime being down, why is it that Republicans, you think, continue to win on this issue of crime and violence? So I'm going to challenge one thing you just said, Ed, which is that Republicans continue to win on this issue. So we just saw the Willie Horton ad. That was from 1988. And back then, indeed, running on crime was a winning issue. The GOP started hitting Michael Dukakis on crime and Willie Horton, and we saw Dukakis's multi-digit lead drop. And yet, what we see now is that voters have actually evolved since 1988, but the political strategy that both parties, the GOP runs hard on crime, they spend millions and millions of dollars on ads hitting Democrats on crime, and Democrats either run away from the issue or they run to the right thinking that's the best we can do, turns out that voters aren't buying either strategy. And so I actually challenge uh, the notion that Republicans are winning on this issue because we have examples. We just saw uh, Swazi win in Long Island. Uh, he's a Democrat. He actually fought off the soft on crime attacks, the soft on the border attacks. And he did it actually not by running away from the issue or running to the right but running on a new message, which is we can be serious about the things the American public cares about, which is safety, security, and stability. It's not about being tough or soft on crime or being tough or soft on the border. It's actually being serious about the issues that voters care about. So I actually think we've got to let go of that conventional political wisdom, that tough on crime always works, that Democrats always lose. They lose when they are silent on the issue and they run away. They lose when they sound just like their opposition and they run to the right. But they win, like Tom Suozzi demonstrated, like many other Democrats have demonstrated in the past couple of years, when they turn the narrative away from right. tough or soft to actually serious. I, I want to show you something that's been airing, or at least a montage of things that have been airing uh, on Fox News in the last few days, and then we'll chat about it on the other side. Tonight, we will show you the latest record-breaking crime statistics, uh, the latest big crime carjackings. President Biden is staring down a raging border crisis that's bringing violent crime to America. New York City, the overrun of hotels and high schools, the organized crime gangs, the beating of cops, the squatting in homes, the revolving Rikers Island door. Part of this is, is that they're hearing a lot about this in the conservative media, right, or that it gets it gets brought up a lot there. And, and so these Republican candidates feel the need to talk about it. Your argument is, OK, fine. If that's what they're talking about, Democrats shouldn't shirk from that fight, shouldn't shirk from that conversation, should try to take it on, right? 
That's right. So Republicans have already signaled they're going to spend millions and millions of dollars on ads attacking Democrats for being soft on crime. We just saw President Trump last week in Michigan saying, you know, the border's out of control. Migrant crime is out of control. There's blood on the streets. What did you hear from President Biden and the Democrats? Pretty much nothing other than, well, there was a tough on the border deal that the GOP walked away from. But there's no multi-million dollar ad talking about what actually makes communities safe. So Democrats are unfortunately doing the thing that they often do, which is to run away from the issue or sort of run to the right. And it turns out, again, as I mentioned, uh, Swazi winning in Long Island, defeating literally millions and millions of dollars of ads calling him the defund candidate or calling him soft on crime. He did it not by going to the right and sounding just like his opposition, but you heard his first sentences, which is, we can find common ground, we can address the issues that matter to voters. And Ed, I want to point out in that stat you just showed about Latino voters, 31% prefer Trump on crime to yep. 20% Biden. The most important thing to take away there is neither party is above majority. Neither party is above water. Voters actually think both parties are doing a bad job on this issue. Inter Rockman, thank you so much. That does it for today. We'll be back with another edition of America Decides tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. You're streaming CBS News. Washington is the seat of power. Um, national security, foreign policy, global economics, every story comes through Washington in some way. We bring some of the most powerful voices in America to the table. We don't just ask the questions, you have to go deeper. We try to understand what's at the heart of the issue we're talking about to then come forward with solutions. Face the Nation on CBS. The justices ruled that Harvard and the University of North Carolina violated the Constitution. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to end affirmative action in college admissions, uncertainty sets in for some students of color. Affirmative action really gave us an equal opportunity. CBS Reports explores the historic decision and what it means for those chasing an opportunity to change their lives. I knew that college was the ticket to break this cycle. The end of affirmative action, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Okay, let's go. You guys good? Hey. All right, we good? Keep going. It's the clock, it's ticking. Off we go. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. It's time for 60 Minutes, Sundays on CBS. An original documentary from CBS Reports. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever. Curing diseases, scientific breakthroughs, making lives better. They can help us with medical discovery, scientific discoveries, doing better agriculture, having cures for things like Alzheimer's. It's also going to really transform the way we work. The uplifting potential of artificial intelligence is limitless. It gives you a friend, somebody to chat with 24-7 that is non-judgmental. He makes me feel loved and desired. And so are its downfalls. The problem with all this AI is that it's unpredictable and uncontrollable. The choices we make now will have lasting effects for decades, maybe even centuries. The ChatGPT revolution, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We are about to see American weapons in the hands of Mexican cartels. A gun pipeline to Mexico. We are arming the cartels. 100%, no doubt about it. Happening right under our noses. Who's doing something about this? Nobody. A CBS Reports exclusive. Most Americans have no idea that we are effectively arming the enemy next door. This is the story the American people need to know. Arming cartels, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America Decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides, Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. 
All right, friends, welcome back to CBS News. I'm Errol Barnett. Here's a recap of the top stories we're tracking for you right now. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is at the White House today for an official state visit with President Biden. The White House calls Japan the pivotal member of the Quad. That's the nickname for the informal alliance between the U.S., Japan, Australia, and India. High-level talks this afternoon will be followed by a formal state dinner at the White House tonight. A New York judge sentenced former Trump CFO Alan Weisselberg to five months behind bars for perjury. He admitted to lying while testifying on behalf of the former president in the company's civil fraud trial. Weisselberg served 100 days in prison last year for tax evasion. Consumer inflation rose higher than expected. The CPI is up uh, less than half a percent from last month, but it also rose three and a half percent from this time last year. Experts say the stubborn rise in prices may prompt the Federal Reserve to hold off on plans to begin lowering interest rates this year. All right, another wave of severe weather right now is sweeping through parts of the south and the Mississippi Valley. Look at that. This will continue throughout the afternoon. In fact, we have some video to show you from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, harsh thunderstorms there are downing trees and utility poles. That's happening beneath the radar images you're seeing. Some homes have been destroyed, and while around thousands of people in Mississippi uh, at this moment also are without power. CBS News correspondent Tom Hansen is covering the storm in Jackson, Mississippi, getting soaked. Tom, what else are you feeling and seeing on the ground there? Errol, this storm has been powerful and fast moving. You know, I flew through this storm, in fact, last night as I was getting into Jackson. It tossed our plane around like a toy. Now we are seeing some of the impacts on the ground. I want you to take a look around me. You can see that there are downed power lines, something that is happening in many neighborhoods across Jackson. You can see the yards here littered with branches. And then take a look at this house. A massive tree fell on this house, essentially splitting the house in two. Now, we've talked with emergency management here in Jackson. They say that they are watching the Pearl River very closely. The primary concern here, of course, is flooding. Elsewhere, the concern are those powerful tornadoes that we have already seen, one overnight in Houston that leveled a church, and then another tornado in Louisiana. So this storm is packing a punch, certainly nothing to balk at. Errol? Yeah, and with those down power lines, uh also provide a danger. We want everyone to remain safe, including you and the crew there. We know the power is out, but how long will folks in this part of the country experience this severe weather, Tom? We are nowhere near out of the woods just yet. This storm system is expected to last throughout the day, possibly into the night. And if you zoom out, just to get a context of how powerful this storm system is and how much of a concern there should be, if you look at the Torcon map, there is a large portion of pink in southern Louisiana, southern Alabama, Mississippi, uh, and that is a level seven. That basically means that there is a very strong likelihood of tornadoes, not just in that area that is pink, but also in a 50-mile radius surrounding that area. Officials are urging people not to go out in this storm and to seek shelter if there is a tornado on the ground. We've already seen other precautions being taken. Louisiana closing all state offices today and schools here in Jackson are remote. So people are taking this storm very seriously, Errol, and we are certainly nowhere near out of the woods just yet. All right, great warning there, Tom. We want everyone there to stay safe. Thank you very much. Former exchange student Amanda Knox is on trial once again in Italy, this time for slander. She's charged with wrongly accusing a Congolese man of murdering her roommate back in 2007. Now, you may remember Knox was convicted for that murder and uh, served four years in prison for being, before being exonerated. During her interrogation, Knox pointed the finger at the owner of the bar where she worked. She later recanted that claim in a note she wrote the following afternoon. CBS News foreign correspondent Chris Livesay joins us now from Rome with the latest on this. Chris, I think I've basically tried to give the broad brush strokes, but explain better in detail what this trial is really about. Hey, Errol. Yeah, you know, you have to remember, this happened when Amanda Knox was just 20 years old. Uh, she barely spoke Italian at the time. She was living in Perugia on, on a college study abroad program. Just imagine the circumstances. She finds out that her housemate, her, her roommate, 
has been murdered. And then after sleepless nights, she has to give testimony. And then in the midst of that testimony, speaking in very broken Italian, sometimes without an official interpreter on hand, she wrongly accuses somebody, uh, putting them at the scene of the crime who absolutely was not there. But that person still had to spend two weeks under arrest as a result of that accusation. So this is what this case is all about. She was found guilty of slandering this other person. Now is an opportunity for her to finally clear her name and, and set the record straight as she sees it and show the circumstances that she was under. At the time she issued, there was a four page statement that was taken by police, but that's since been ruled inadmissible because of those circumstances. Now she has an opportunity to submit a 20 page letter that she's written her herself. We can only presume in perfect Italian because she was able to perfect her Italian in the four years that she had to spend in prison. I bet. And that's a really interesting uh, detail. We know that Knox is not in court for this. What do we know about how she's living her life now? Yeah, you know, so ever since then, she's been able to pull the pieces of her life back together and, uh, you know, start a family. She's married. She has two children. She's 36 years old. And today she works mostly as an advocate, uh, specifically for people who are caught up in the same types of circumstances that she was, you know, wrong people who have been wrongly accused or people who have been victims of forced confessions. Um, you know, she's also spoken out about this at length. Uh, she has made a podcast. Uh, she continues to work on a podcast with her husband. Uh, she's also made uh, a series on a meditation app where she talks about resilience. So she's definitely not gone anywhere. She seems to have turned this massive setback into something that gives her more and more energy to move forward and turn it into a strength. And perhaps next she'll do a language translation app. Who knows? Uh, Chris Livesay, appreciate the update on this. Thank you very much. A whistleblower who came forward after a Boeing jet lost a door panel midair is raising safety questions about a different Boeing jet. Sources tell CBS News federal regulators are now looking into his claims, which the company strongly denies. CBS News senior transportation correspondent Chris Van Cleve brings us this story. The FAA is investigating claims by a Boeing quality engineer that he observed shortcuts during the production of the 787 Dreamliner. He worries they could lead to structural integrity issues years down the line as the jet ages. His concerns were spelled out in a letter by his attorney to the FAA in January, following the door panel that blew out of a 737 MAX mid-flight. His lawyer urged the FAA to widen its probe of Boeing to focus on the company's entire production process, not just the 737. But Boeing is pushing back strongly, saying, We are fully confident in the 787 Dreamliner. These claims about the structural integrity of the 787 are inaccurate and do not represent the comprehensive work Boeing has done to ensure the quality and long-term safety of the aircraft. The whistleblower letter cites concerns from 2021, around the same time when Boeing paused 787 deliveries for over a year to address quality control issues, a process the FAA signed off on. Officials in Chicago have released body cam video that shows officers firing 96 times at a driver who they pulled over. We have to give you a warning here. This video is disturbing. Initial evidence from an independent investigation shows the driver, a 26-year-old named Dexter Reed, fired the first shot. Reed was killed and one officer was injured. The plainclothes officer says they'd stop Reed on suspicion of not wearing a seatbelt. Reed's family is calling for charges to be filed. Chicago's mayor says the footage is deeply disturbing. I'm personally devastated to see yet another young black man lose his life during an interaction with the police. I've also been praying for the full recovery of the officer who was shot during this interaction. Now, the Chicago Fraternal Order of Police has not responded to CBS News' request for comment on this. Six Mississippi law enforcement officers who tortured and abused two black men learned their sentences in their state courses to, uh, court cases today. The members of the so-called Goon Squad received sentences ranging from 15 to 45 years. They'll serve those concurrently with the federal prison sentences they received last month. If you remember, I was in Jackson, Mississippi reporting on that. The attack happened in January of last year after a white person called a deputy to complain two black men were staying with a white woman. The six former officers tortured and humiliated the men with various objects. 
A new report suggests some of the nation's biggest companies are discriminating against black job applicants. In the largest of its kind study, a group from the National Bureau of Economic Research sent out 80,000 resumes to 97 companies over a three-year span between 2019 and 2021. They use fake resumes, but with equal qualifications, changing only personal details to imply an applicant's race, age, and gender. Overall, researchers found employers contacted white applicants more than black ones, with the widest gap being between companies' genuine parts and auto nation. So far, neither company has responded to our requests for comment. However, genuine parts did tell the New York Times, quote, we are always evaluating our practices to ensure inclusivity and break down barriers, and we will continue to do so. AutoNation did not respond to the New York Times. Let's bring in Evan Rose now. He is a co-author of this report and is an assistant economics professor at the University of Chicago. Evan, great to have you with us on this topic. I'm just wondering from your point of view, with all the research you've done, what were the most significant findings and what it tells us about the U.S. labor market as a whole? Great. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. Um, so this was uh, a, a huge study, as you mentioned. We sent thousands and thousands of resumes to many hundreds of companies. And I think the most important thing that we learned from the study is that companies seem to really differ in the extent to which they discriminate based on the characteristics uh, that we're looking at, which is both, both race and gender. You highlighted the fact that two companies appear to discriminate much more than the other companies in our study. I think it's also important to recognize that some companies appear to discriminate a, uh, quite a bit less or, or even not at all in our study. It's just massive heterogeneity in the economy and the extent to which we see this discrimination against distinctively black names. Now, importantly, that discrimination doesn't seem to be random. It's concentrated in particular industries for race discrimination, for example, firms that do things with cars and car parts like AutoNation and Genuine Parts, which owns the Napa, Napa Auto Parts brand seem to discriminate much more than firms in other industries, including industries like uh, food stores and grocery stores, for example. So we think this is important because I think it means, first of all, there might be something we could do about this from an enforcement perspective. We also think it might, be, it might mean that there are things firms can do themselves that might mitigate or exacerbate the type of discrimination that you could see in their organization. The fact that all firms don't seem to discriminate in the same way suggests that this is just an inevitable feature of the labor market, that there's going to be discrimination out there always. Instead, it may be that policies and practices that firms can, can adopt, how they structure hiring, the type of training they give people might actually have an impact on these, on these measures. And we hope that by releasing these data, we can start to learn some of those uh, policies and practices and share those across firms in a way that can help reduce the type of discrimination that we're seeing here. It's a fascinating study, extensive research that you've done. We mentioned areas in which we're more likely to discriminate, which companies and which areas were less likely. Yeah, so we see less discrimination on the basis of race against our distinctively black names and these fictional applications we sent in the food store industries, which I mentioned earlier. You can think about that like grocery stores. Uh, we see less discrimination in freight and transport, which include companies like FedEx and UPS, um, as well as some in other utility companies uh, and communications companies like Charter and, and, and Spectrum. So again, it's not a universal phenomenon. It's not sort of inevitable that there's going to be discrimination in, in the types of job we're studying here. It does seem to have strong concentration in particular firms and, and among firms that are concentrated in these particular industries. And again, for our viewers, the resumes were identical. The qualifications and the skills were the same. It was the personal information that you changed. How then, if, if companies are watching this, people who can actually Im, you know, Im, uh, impact change, what can companies do to address discrimination and, and you know, extinguish this type of behavior? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And, and hopefully, hopefully something that we can continue to work on in, in future research. You know, the short answer is we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes at these companies. We see what our, uh, our experiment is establishing is that companies do differ in the extent of discrimination that they exhibit as measured in an experiment like ours. We have some clues about what policies and practices might matter here, including things like how centralized their HR operation seems to be. Some companies, it seems that many individuals are involved in making hiring decisions at a single establishment. So it might be four or five different people calling back job applications at one store. At other companies, it looks like there might be just one person who's overseeing hiring for a couple a couple different stores across a broad, broader set of establishments. And what we infer from that is that it seems like companies where maybe they've invested a little bit more in professionalizing the hiring function and offered some kind of training, maybe that's one way in which you can mitigate the type of discrimination that you'd measure in a, in a study like ours. But you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this project and release these names and talk about the, which companies are actually in our list 
is to open the way for other researchers and policymakers and everyone to dig into what policies and practices really do seem to differ across these firms and think about what we can learn about how to, how to address this problem at a more systematic level. Yeah, it's a sobering report, but hopefully it's just part of a step in the right direction. Evan Rose, we really appreciate you discussing your findings with us, uh, joining us from Chicago. Okay, yeah, thanks so much. All right, at this point, we're going to take a very short break. Stay with us. You're streaming CBS News. of the earth right now we got something crazy <laughs> and reach for the stars here we are <laughs> Tom. yes it's my comeback <laughs> <laughs> hey this is pretty fun but wait there's more experience thought-provoking welcome to the idea of being a human being innovative da -da -da. and truly original That's reporting right. look through a telescope and go wow because there's always something new under the sun on cbs sunday morning at this moment, terrorists could be plotting another attack. 9-11 triggered a counter-terrorist system that included a secret database. This person needs a closer look. A growing list of nearly 2 million people, including some Americans who say they're innocent. For one hour flight, I have to spend six hours to go and come back. CBS Reports explores the system, the people responsible for it, and those pushing for change. I'm not fighting against them. I'm fighting for them to do the right thing. The Watch List, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Don't miss true crime anytime you want, anywhere you go. With the 48 Hours Podcast, real crimes, real lives, real justice. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Listen to 48 Hours on Apple Podcasts. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Imagine yourself in Manhattan with no police, no army, no mayor. The people of Haiti stare down poverty, corruption, natural disasters, and violence. 90% of the guns that are used by gangs in Haiti are American guns. But with an unbreakable spirit and eternal optimism. There are days where I cry, but we can't be discouraged. We still believe in Haiti. They're still able to look ahead with hope. Haiti is on the brink of transformation, a radical shift. Haitians are coming together and saying things must change. Fighting for Haiti, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Everybody wakes up in the morning and they are pelted with alerts that frighten them, news that agitates them. With this show, we have the time to explain what's going on. These migrants, they've been released. Explain the status that allows them to be released, to slow things down a little bit. What are the big sets of questions for China and its ambitions? Hackers are stepping up their attacks to extort victims. Let's start with easy. Who's attacking? Here's a deeper understanding of what's happening. Prime Time with John Dickerson. Stream on the free CBS News app. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. On our places, bright, shiny faces. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. Exit polls are suggesting South Korea's liberal opposition could win today's parliamentary election by a landslide. South Korean media reports the opposition is forecasted to win 197 seats in the 300-member National Assembly. Now, this would be a major blow to South Korea's conservative president, essentially making him a lame duck for his remaining three years in office. A sixth-grade Massachusetts student suffered burns on his left hand from a laptop that just spontaneously ignited during school hours. Imagining that happening to you. Uh, the superintendent of a school in Uxbridge, which is near Rhode Island's northern border, says the laptop began smoking as a student was taking a standardized test yesterday morning. This caused the fire alarm to go off and forced all students, teachers and staff to evacuate, of course. It has also uh, injured the young student. When I made contact, uh, he did not have bandages on his hand. He had an ice pack on his hand. Mm -hmm. And um, the, his mom was just preparing to take him for, uh, for treatment. The school district says it purchased the laptop at the beginning of this year. Officials are, of course, asking students with the same kind of laptop to power it down and hand it in to be inspected. 
The Environmental Protection Agency has issued groundbreaking regulations designed to make drinking water safer for people all over the United States. Now, the agency is requiring public water utilities to test for six different types of substances known as PFAS to reduce people's exposure to them in drinking water. PFAS, also commonly known as forever chemicals, are found in a wide variety of products. And that's despite a growing body of research demonstrating their negative health effects on all of us. This new effort marks the first ever national regulations for PFAS in drinking water. These new standards really are a breakthrough because what they do is they will address six of these forever toxic chemicals, um, six of the ones that we know are pretty common and are extremely toxic. So by regulating those, EPA's estimate is that as many as 105 million people have these chemicals in their water right now. That stuff is getting into people's bodies and is threatening their health. CBS News Senior National and Environmental Correspondent Ben Tracy joins us now to dive into this historic announcement. And Ben, I feel like there's two reactions to this. On one side, it sounds like an encouraging development that we're better protected. But on the other side, it's only six of these so-called forever chemicals. Help us understand why they're so dangerous and how long they really do last. So these are really incredibly strong man-made chemicals. They're resistant to heat and water and oil and dirt. And that makes them great for all the products that they're used in. You saw some of those products up on the screen. It's everything from nonstick cookware to water-resistant clothing. But the problem is they're very hard to break down. They can last for thousands of years in the environment. And they have been linked to serious health issues. Everything from you know liver damage and immune system damage to certain forms of cancer and then developmental issues with children. So that is the concern that this stuff is in the water supply that nearly 2 million, um, 200 million Americans are drinking. And how exactly, Ben, will the EPA try to enforce these regulations? Well, these are legally enforceable. Basically, water, public water utilities around the country are going to have to make changes to comply with these new rules. They have some time to do it. They have about three years to monitor their water system, find out how much PFAS is actually in their system, report that to the public, make that public so people know what they're drinking, and then they get about two years to comply with these rules. So they're going to have to install equipment to basically bring those levels down if they exceed these new EPA rules to the levels that would comply. And as I mentioned, and as we spoke about coming into this, uh, the EPA is restricting the use of a total of six uh, PFASs in, in drinking water. But what, there are more than 15,000 of these kinds of chemicals. So how significant from your point of view, Ben, on reporting on environmental and climate issues, how significant are these regulations specifically? It's still really significant. Yes, you hear six versus the 15,000, but the reason they're focusing on those six are those are the six that are really toxic. Those are the ones that are causing the really significant health issues and ones that have found to be prevalent in drinking water systems. So the thought is by going after those and forcing these systems to reduce those to near zero levels that you really will mitigate some of the health risks uh, that currently exist. And for folks watching who you know want to follow better guidance and reduce their risk, and exposure to any type of forever chemicals, what would you recommend? Well, we got to be honest, this is this is not easy. I mean, this is not as simple as, you know, running your water through a Brita filter at your house or something like that. You'd have to install basically a reverse osmosis system, the kind of thing that goes underneath your sink. It costs a lot of money. So what EPA is doing is they're saying we would rather do this at the utility level. So you folks at home, when you turn on your tap, you don't have to worry about it. You can actually trust what is coming out of there. So some of that technology will be installed at these water treatment plants. And therefore, you wouldn't have to worry about it as much when it comes out of your tap. All right. It'll take some time for this to kick in, but at least it seems like a step in the right direction. Ben Tracy, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Errol. All right. At this point, we're going to take a very short break. Stay with us. You're streaming CBS News. Okay, so let's just start at the beginning. Well, let me start with this. What is at stake here? What is the answer then? Do you know why? You want me to just keep going? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Were there death threats? How is this possible? What's wrong with that argument? Are you saying they lied? Have you told the government that? Why won't you say the word crisis? You're, You're not, not answering my question. This really is that scary? Does that make sense? What do you mean? What does that mean? Did any of that make what sense? Have you What's your response? What happened? Why? 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 
It's time for the CBS News Original 60 Minutes, Sunday on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. There is no more room in our city. New York City is receiving record numbers of migrants. Today, we're going to have more than 500 adults and children come through that door. Tensions rise as shelters reach max capacity. We don't have to take care of them. CBS Reports goes inside a crisis cities and families are facing as they fight to survive. The United States still has that glimmer of hope for people to come here. Fighting for a future. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. On Face the Nation, the way to learn is to listen. We may have a recession. Listening to how someone explains themselves is so key to understanding their perspective. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Since you started La Soup in 2014, do you have any sense as to how much food you've rescued from the landfill? We've rescued four and a half million pounds. I can't even fathom how much food that is. And that's one little person in one little city in America. We're going to call this chicken piccata. We did 450 of these meals today. This is the exact dish that that you and I are going to have. Yep. Oh, my really God. Is it good? Mm-hmm. Having a plan of how to keep people fed should be in every single city. So if we eliminated food waste, could we eliminate hunger? Yes. Eating Trash, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bringing you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. This is CBS. Sunday morning, actor Kirsten Dunst, plus Wayne Brady on Broadway, and a beloved cherry tree named Stumpy. Vladimir Putin is about to be elected to a fifth term as the unchallenged authority of Russia. So what does his opposition look like, and where are they? You would be in a Russian prison just for doing this interview. Oh, for sure. 60 Minutes introduces you to the Russian resistance. Welcome to CBS News Prime Time. I'm John Dickerson. Inflation is the house guest that won't leave. The more money you have, the more money you're inclined to spend, the more demand sort of supports high prices. Can't keep them down. Prices rise amid strong economic growth. Welcome, partner. Biden hosts Japan's leader, cementing ties to counter a rising China. Together, our countries are taking significant steps to strengthen defense security cooperation, our ties have never been more robust. And 211, how the Americans who dial that number fit into our economic story. Hello, thank you for joining us. We begin our report at the grocery store, the gas pump, and the leasing office, all places where the Labor Department says you're spending more money than you were a year ago. Prices rose at an annual rate of 3.5% last month. That's the highest since September, when inflation was at 3.7%. The cost of food is up 2.2% year over year. Gas prices rose 1.3%, and housing costs are up 5.7%. The Federal Reserve now has to figure out how those numbers fit into its larger strategy to bring inflation down to just 2%. That could mean delaying interest rate cuts. CBS News senior business and technology correspondent Jolene Kent reports. For the third straight month, prices have gone up more than expected, from the rising cost of car insurance and repairs. So how much you're paying at the grocery store every week? Do you know how much one of these costs? Two freaking dollars. 
this was two hundred dollars. We supposed to skip the power bill this month so we can buy groceries or the mortgage. Before the pandemic, all of these groceries, about 30 items, cost $100 on average. Now, five years later, according to Nielsen IQ, all this costs 33% more, meaning you'd have to skip about 10 items like chicken, bread, milk, and bananas to make your $100 budget. Five years ago versus today, the difference is remarkable. Is that normal? Oh goodness, it's not normal at all. So that's why really consumers are really, really scrutinizing their behaviors because you know prices are leveling off, but they're leveling off at these record high levels. Higher gas prices and rent also helped push inflation up three and a half percent over the last year. Also more expensive, baby food and formula spiking nearly 10 percent, elder care up over 14 percent, and veterinary care jumping almost 10 percent. President Biden responding today. We're better situated than, than we were when we took office, where we, inflation was skyrocketing, and we have a plan to deal with it. But until then, shoppers continue to cut corners where they can. We asked Americans, have you changed your behavior? And 87% of Americans have said yes to that. We may be seeing more, you know, white meat on the barbecue than red meat this um, summer because beef prices have gone up 9%. Everybody's been impacted by this. There's no way you can get around it. The good news is that wage growth did outpace inflation last month, but the inflation number we saw in March was the biggest jump we've seen on an annual basis in six months, and that makes it very unlikely that the Federal Reserve will be cutting rates anytime soon. John. Jolene Kent in Los Angeles, thank you. Later this hour, we'll take a deeper look at the inflation numbers and explore what it means for the Fed and the broader economy. Republican state lawmakers in Arizona blocked efforts by Democrats Wednesday to overturn a near-total abortion ban. The state policy is derived from a Civil War-era law from 1864. It comes as a number of national Republican leaders are now attempting to distance themselves from the move. CBS News Chief White House correspondent Nancy Cordes has the latest. Angry, let down. Frustrated. Anxiety in Arizona tonight after the state Supreme Court upheld an 1864 law that bans nearly all abortions and criminalizes those who perform the procedure. It's really upsetting that our politicians who are supposed to represent us are doing this. Democrats protested on the floor of the state legislature today. And with swing state Arizona up for grabs in November, some Republicans are slamming the ruling too, including former President Donald Trump, who just two days ago said abortion should be left to the states. Today, he said Arizona went too far. And I'm sure that the governor and everybody else are going to bring it back into reason, and that will be taking care of President, President Biden, who has United vowed States to restore Roe v. Wade, was asked today what his message is to Arizonans. Elect me. I'm in the 20, 20th century, 21st century. The controversial law could go into effect in Arizona this summer, forcing patients to travel to neighboring states with less restrictive laws. At the Camelback Family Planning Clinic in Phoenix, phones were ringing off the hook today. Calls from women concerned about abortion access. As long as we can pr practice medicine here, we will continue to provide services, whether that means that people need ultrasounds to see how far along they are to see if they do need to go to a different state. Arizona's highest court warned yesterday that doctors who perform the procedure could face between two to five years in prison, though the state's Democratic attorney general says she won't prosecute them. You are now having physicians who are scared to do their job that they did without batting an eye before the overturn of Roe. The uproar in Arizona is reigniting this issue at a national level, with Trump saying that he would not sign a national abortion ban if he were president, even if Congress sent one to his desk. But Democrats cast major doubt on that claim, noting, John, that he has repeatedly endorsed a ban at 20 weeks in the past. Nancy Cordes in Washington, thank you. CBS News producer Elizabeth Campbell joins us now from Phoenix. Elizabeth, you spoke recently with that uh, Arizona abortion provider, and let's play a little more of that real quick. It really 
makes me angry that we've been fighting this fight for so long. You know, we're tired. The folks like myself and my fellow abortion providers, the nurses, the front desk, our patient techs, all of us have been fighting day in and day out. Elizabeth, what more can you tell us about what providers in the state are dealing with? Well, the biggest thing they're dealing with, John, is just uncertainty. As you heard in Nancy's piece just then, there's still days before this could take effect. The attorney general here says that she won't prosecute any doctors who may perform abortions, but it still does become illegal. And that doctor told me she can't risk it. This is still her job. She still has her bills to pay. And so they're just dealing with the uncertainty of what happens next and will anything change. And you also spoke to the lead counsel for Alliance Defending Freedom. What's the other side saying? Well, they're also dealing with that uncertainty. Obviously, if the decision gets struck down before it goes into effect, there's a ballot measure coming down this November. But they do admit that this is a cause for celebration. Take a listen to what the lead prosecutor had to say. Abortion is never safe. Uh, what this law does is it protects human life from the moment of conception. And there's an exception to save the mother's life. So this law rightly balances the life interest of both the mother and the child. Life is a human right, and we should work our hardest to try to protect life as much as possible. Elizabeth Campbell. Now, in we've talked to oh. voters on both sides of this today. Sorry, Elizabeth, I interrupted <laughs> Sorry, you. Sorry, John, Carry I just on. said we talked to voters on... <laughs> We talked to voters on both sides of this today, and they said they were fired up. So that fight will continue on both sides. Sorry I interrupted you, John. Oh, Elizabeth, I'm the one that's supposed to behave. Appreciate your reporting, Elizabeth Campbell in Phoenix. Thank you. Police say at least three people were shot at an event celebrating the end of Ramadan in West Philadelphia Wednesday afternoon. Five people are in custody. The victims are a 22-year-old man and two juveniles. That includes an armed 15-year-old suspect who was shot by police. They are in stable condition. An eyewitness described the scene earlier. I was standing there. I walked in to go charge my phone. Everybody started running everywhere. Oh, my gosh, they're shooting, they're shooting. Everybody's running over each other. I'm helping people up. It was crazy. A child who was near the shooting also broke his leg after being accidentally hit by a police car that was responding to the incident. The FBI is on its way to investigate alongside local police. Severe storms are sweeping across the southeast, where residents are being warned about the possibility of hail and even tornadoes. Damage has already been reported in Texas and Louisiana. Strong winds have damaged strip malls and power lines in both states. New Orleans is seeing flooding. We're also monitoring potential tornadoes in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, which is where our Mark Strassman reports. As many as three tornadoes may have touched down in and around Slidell, Louisiana. Oh! Wind gusts of up to 110 miles per hour tore through the city just north of New Orleans. It came too fast, it did a lot of damage, and it left fast. About 50 people needed rescuing after winds sheared the roof off an apartment building. And it happened really fast. Um, while we were trying to pack a few things, his, my ceiling caved in, his ceilings caved in. The damage is unbelievable. Officials in St. Tammany Parish reported the impact was catastrophic and extensive, with more than 100 buildings damaged. This storm was no joke. It's something that we haven't seen here in Slido in, in a very long time. Flash flooding in New Orleans, swelled roads, overwhelming drivers, and marooning vehicles. As the storm moved east, this was the scene on I-10 in Mobile, Alabama. Water everywhere, flooding highways and causeways. It's the same storm system that lit up the sky overnight and brought heavy rain and hail to East Texas. In Port Arthur, a tornado flattened this church and another shredded this strip mall outside Houston. More than a foot of rain fell in some parts of the state and in Dallas, a month's worth of rain fell in just three hours. One death from the storm has been reported in Mississippi outside Jackson where the storm churned a swath of downed trees and power lines. And Mark joins us now. Uh, Mark, tell us about what you're seeing on the ground and where are you? What's all that behind you? Uh, this is uh, Slidell, Louisiana, just outside New Orleans. This is a ruined uh, general contracting business. Uh, I talked to the wife of the owner who said that, you know, she had seen tornado damage only on television before. 
but it doesn't begin to compare with the power of the storm and you see that it has ruined the business that you've put your, your, your heart and life into. Uh, we, the initial estimate here, John, is an EF1 tornado that winds up to 110 miles an hour. So what you're seeing here is a scarred landscape and a lot of shocked people walking around just like that woman who can't believe the damage that and how powerful um, nature can be. Yeah, it's shocking to look at what's behind you. What are the biggest areas that are, or the threats, I should say, heading into the area on Thursday? Okay, good news here, John, is that the damage, horrific as it is, is done. The threat is lifted, but the storm has moved east. And so, you know, the, that, that little corner of the world where Florida and Georgia and Alabama come together, they're under a tornado watch until 9 o'clock Eastern tonight. Mark Strassman in Slidell, Louisiana. Thank you so much, Mark. Wednesday marks the end of Ramadan with the prospect of an Israeli invasion of Rafa in southern Gaza looming as it was when the Muslim holy month started. A top Hamas leader says an Israeli airstrike killed three of his own sons. Meanwhile, an Israeli official tells CBS News Hamas has not been able to locate 40 Israeli hostages that would have been released in a potential ceasefire deal. CBS News foreign correspondent Deborah Pata reports. Palestinians pray amidst the rubble and ruin of Gaza, marking the end of Ramadan with the Muslim holiday of Eid al-Fitr. For many, the day was spent in mourning at the grave sites of loved ones killed in over half a year of war. It's enough, God, Anam Abda sobbed, enough with war. Instead of a joyful occasion filled with children's laughter, for this grandmother, it was a day of heartbreak, as she said a final farewell to her grandchildren while their father cradles the body of his youngest son. His wife and three children were killed in central Gaza. And for Hamas chief Ishmael Haniya, the conflict became personal. This is the moment he received the news that his three adult sons and four grandchildren were killed in an Israeli airstrike. As the war drags on and the humanitarian crisis worsens, the wider the rift grows between the U.S. and Israel, with President Biden yesterday sharply criticizing the way Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was conducting this war. I think what he's doing is a mistake. And today reiterating that he expected Netanyahu to make good on his promise to flood Gaza with aid. And the fact is that we're, uh, we're getting in somewhere in the last three days over 100 trucks. It's not enough. The rift between the U.S. and Israel comes at a precarious time. Tonight, we are learning that the commander of U.S. forces in the Middle East is heading to Israel amid increasing concerns that Iran is preparing to launch a major attack against Israel in retaliation for last week's bombing of the Iranian consulate in Damascus. John? Deborah Pata in Tel Aviv. Thank you. Forever chemicals are linked to cancer and developmental harm in kids. They've gotten into the water supply and the government is now stepping in. New standards will mean many towns and cities will need to make some upgrades. Plus, what do Jeff Bezos, Bill Clinton and Robert De Niro all have in common? Well, they're all eating ribeye at the White House with Japan's prime minister. More on the state visit ahead. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. Does this carrier strike group stand ready? It's just incredible to see there's an active search and rescue operation going on 12 hours after this accident. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. You've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone.
stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. People with developmental disabilities were once sequestered by the hundreds of thousands in institutions. Many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because lack of attention, lack of imagination, lack of uh, adequate manpower. Disability activists have since torn down barriers blocking them from living at home or in the community. We conclude that Title II of the ADA requires states to provide community-based treatment for persons with mental disabilities. But of the 16,000 people who remain in state-operated institutions, half are in five states, and Illinois is one of them. I don't want to live in the institution. It makes me feel discriminated against. Do you think there are people living in institutions in Illinois that don't need to be living there? Yeah, because they're proving it as soon as they get out. Former Trump Organization CFO Alan Weisselberg has been sentenced to five months in a New York jail as a part of a plea agreement. Weisselberg pleaded guilty to two felony counts of perjury in March he admitted to providing false testimony on the size of the former president's New York apartment. The 76-year-old served 100 days in jail last year for evading taxes on $1.7 million in Trump company perks. As a part of this deal in the perjury case, prosecutors have agreed not to call Weisselberg as a witness in the former president's criminal hush money trial that's beginning on Monday. Prosecutors say they will delay the bribery trial of New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez. The Democratic lawmaker asked to push back his May 6th trial, citing unspecified health concerns with his wife, who will need surgery in the coming weeks. Prosecutors want to try Menendez, his wife, and three other co-defendants together. Menendez is facing federal bribery and obstruction charges for allegedly accepting gifts in exchange for political favors to foreign governments. He has pleaded not guilty. Kevin McCarthy is blaming one of his former colleagues for being ousted from his role as House Speaker. I'll give you the truth why I'm not Speaker. It's because one person, a member of Congress, wanted me to stop an ethics complaint because he slept with a 17-year-old. An ethics complaint that started before I ever became Speaker, and that's illegal and I'm not going to get in the middle. The former speaker is referring to Florida Representative Matt Gates, who has been accused of having sex with a minor. If you'll remember, Gates led the successful effort to remove McCarthy from the speakership last October. Gates responded to the comments calling McCarthy a, quote, liar. President Biden used all of the tools of hospitality to announce deeper ties with Japan. He welcomed Prime Minister Fumio Kishida, to the White House Wednesday for a day of meetings capped with a lavish state dinner. The two leaders announced plans to upgrade military command and control operations, integrate their air defense networks, and bring Japan along for a U.S. mission to the moon. Together, our countries are taking significant steps to strengthen defense security cooperation. We're modernizing command and control structures, and we're increasing the interoperability and planning of our militaries that so they can work together in a seamless and effective way. This is the most significant upgrade in our alliance since the end of, since it was first established. CBS News Senior White House Correspondent Weijia Zhang joins me now from the White House. Weijia, much of this visit is about bolstering military cooperation between the U.S. and Japan, but the two countries already have a relationship, so what's changing now? Well, this is exactly how they are framing it, John, that this is really upgrading the existing relationship 
between these two militaries. And so there will be uh, more of an integration between the two militaries. The Pentagon will work out those details, especially to upgrade the current U.S. command center in Japan, which hosts about 54,000 U.S. troops. And they also have plans to work with Australia to establish a joint air defense system, as well as look at ways to produce defense weapons together. So it's all about expanding on what already exists. And the two leaders, as I understand it, are having, meeting with the, are having a meeting with the Philippines on Thursday. So what's, what's everybody meeting about and having all these defense arrangements about? Well, John, they're going to make announcements to talk about strategic partnerships, about the economy, about the South China Sea. And that really is what all of this hinges on, even though the president didn't talk at length about Beijing. It certainly was the undercurrent and the backdrop of both today's meeting and tomorrow's trilateral meeting, because it's all about showing a uh, stance together. It's about showing cooperation and that there is an alliance between these countries as China continues to ramp up its aggression in the South China Sea, especially when it comes to the Philippines. There have been several physical encounters with the Chinese Coast Guard and uh, vessels that belong to the Philippines. And so they want to send a message that they are essentially teammates and they are watching very closely what happens uh, in that part of the region with China. And John, I have to say, the Japanese prime minister almost summed it up perfectly when he said, uh, you know, they were talking about the conflict in Ukraine. He said today it could be Ukraine and yeah. tomorrow it could be the East, East Asia. And, and so they are eyeing this very closely. And speaking of backdrop, we should let our viewers know that while you were giving that wonderful answer, behind you was both the Honor Guard and the president's own Marine Band, which is all there for uh, the state dinner tonight, I would imagine. That's why everybody's there. Um, let me ask you the last question, uh, which is that um, there is this uh, Nippon Steel deal to buy um, U.S. Steel, uh, Japanese company. Was there discussion of that? It's a political, the president is against that deal, we should note. And um, was there any uh, discussion of that in uh, today's meeting? Well, both leaders were asked directly about this, and they tried to brush it off. The Japanese uh, prime minister saying that he believes the parties are still talking about it, and he hopes that it will ultimately result in a union that benefits both the U.S. and Japan. The president just said that he reaffirmed his commitment to American workers. You're right in that he opposed this deal because Japan would be acquiring U.S. steel, which really has a legacy here in the United States. And of course, uh, Biden, especially candidate Biden, um, has pledged so much support for steel workers to stay in this country. And so even though the company itself would remain headquartered in Pittsburgh, um, there are a lot of questions about how that might influence labor agreements, for example, and how, you know, day-to-day -day life is for those workers. So um, surely they talked about it in public. They didn't want to draw too much attention to this uh, tension as they talked in public, because you're right, John, when there is a state visit, there is a lot of diplomacy, there's a lot of work behind the scenes, and to your point, a lot of pomp and circumstance, because of course it all ends in a fancy state dinner happening here at the White House. That's right, and if you're, you're lucky, the U.S. Marine Corps Band will strike up and practice, and uh, you'll get to <laughs> hear it. We Zhang at the White House, thank you so much. Thanks. And just across the Korea Strait, from Japan, South Korea's liberal opposition parties are expected to win a majority of seats in the country's parliamentary election on Wednesday. If they succeed, conservative president Yoon suk Yul could spend his last three years in office as a lame duck. Exit polls by South Korea's three major TV stations forecast the liberal opposition will win up to 170, excuse me, 197 seats in the 300-member National Assembly. Another new Liberal Party is expected to win up to 14 seats. With that, the opposition will have legislative powers to pass bills vetoed by the president and can even impeach him. We're still learning about how the human race reacted to the eclipse. Tuesday, we told you that some people did not listen to their mothers and looked directly into the sun. That may be where the fun is, but Internet searches for eye pain informed us that the moment was long-lasting. 
Some people, however, were not searching for anything online at all. According to Cloudfare, in comparison to the week prior, total U.S. Internet traffic along the path of the totality was down 12 percent at 3 p.m. Eastern, proving that mankind can pull itself away from the machines when wonder arises. On the other hand, it took the movement of celestial bodies to do it, and we won't have the same chance for another 20 years. Markets turning red over the latest inflation numbers. Coming up, why prices are still rising and what the Fed might or might not do about it. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. Faces. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Nate has one of the quickest minds I've ever seen. Tony has a way of making people feel comfortable. Gail has this unbelievable knack to ask the question that you're asking at home. I've been told I could talk to a tree, and that's pretty much true. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. It didn't seem like anything could happen because nothing ever happens in East Palestine, but it did. Authorities released toxic fumes from five derailed train cars. Resident, please evacuate. Acute bronchitis due to chemical fumes. Did you ever have these problems before the derailment? No, ma'am. This neighborhood's not safe no more. We can assure the community that there's not vinyl chloride entering their communities. Then why are there so many people feeling these various symptoms of bloody noses or difficulty breathing and bronchitis? That's a hard question to answer. We're talking about one of the most blatant releases of a mixture of some of the most toxic chemicals that we've seen in America. I feel like now I have a duty to warn other communities. If my daughter has to watch me die of cancer, at least it saves someone else. This case. It's like a screenplay, something straight out of Hollywood. But it's not fiction. It's 48 hours. Human remains found this week. Four families shattered. There's no physical evidence. The mystery would haunt investigators for years. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Get it, Like a John Grisham novel. A gripping true crime original. 48 Hours, now streaming on the free CBS News app. This is CBS. The thrill of a lifetime. Seeing the Earth from space, it was so exhilarating. But the risks that come with the territory. There have been four fatal accidents. That's a 1% fatal accident rate. Might make you look before you launch. If you had one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, would have a public crisis. Space Tourism, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Welcome back to CBS News Primetime. I'm John Dickerson. Here are some additions to our top stories. Donald Trump's third attempt at trying to delay his upcoming criminal trial in New York has been rejected. He asked for a delay because the judge won't recuse and has refused to put the case on hold while the Supreme Court weighs in on his immunity claim. The hush money trial is set to begin on Monday. Georgia Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene met with House Speaker Mike Johnson Wednesday. It was their first meeting since Greene introduced a resolution to remove him from office. Over the speaker's handling of Ukraine aid, which she opposes, and reauthorization of Foreign National Security Surveillance Authority, which she believes threatens Americans. Green said she left the docks with no guarantees on those issues. The annual inflation rate hit 3.5 percent last month. That's the highest it's been since September. With prices on the rise, it could mean the Federal Reserve will hold off on cutting interest rates. Dow Jones fell 400 points on Wednesday. Let's bring in Martin Backerdax. He's the senior editor and chief markets correspondent at The Street. Oh, Martin, why'd it go up? 
<laughs> That's a great question. John, we saw a massive bet in the bond futures market yesterday, and that usually means that someone is trying to hedge themselves against a surprise. So we were braced for this kind of movement to the upside, but I don't think anybody expected it to be this fast, and I think that's why you see the reaction. If you're digging into the numbers, though, essentially what we're seeing is that the quicker inflation is tied to a stronger economy. There's no question about that. But we are seeing price pressures in things like hospital services, uh, in insurance, and in rents. And those are things that don't necessarily have much of an influence with respect to Fed interest rates. So they could stay hot for a number of months now, and that really what ha that's sort of what has markets worried right now. And so, so that's it. Really interesting. So, what do you think this means for the Federal Reserve, particularly if it's items that Federal Reserve policy doesn't maybe necessarily affect directly? This is where they find themselves, John, and it really is a difficult situation because they had primed the markets for three rate cuts this year. And as we sit now, it's very likely that we're going to have the longest gap between the last rate hike and the first rate cut on record. And that's, of course, if we get something in July. It might be September. It might be beyond. So the Fed is going to have to sit tight, preach more patience to an impatient market as it looks to see how some of these influences filter through into the economy. Gratefully, growth is still solid. We're adding jobs activity is quite strong, and we're seeing a decent amount of consumer spending. But all of that, John, comes with a price. And in this case, it is that faster inflation. And so everybody's impatient for the rate cuts. Uh, remind us why it's a bad idea or to cut rates too early, or why it could be a bad idea to cut rates too early. There's an old joke, John, that says the Fed tends to go up the escalator when it comes to raising rates and down the elevator when it comes to cutting them. In other words, they like to be in a singular direction, and therefore they are quite careful when they pivot. They don't want to pivot and then have to raise again if it turns out that they were incorrect about inflation. And they've already been caught on the back foot with that transitory debacle from a couple of years ago as we exited the pandemic. So they do want to be absolutely precise as to the timing of the cuts. But as I say, they are having to speak to a market which has been betting on six cuts, pared those bets down to three, and now is likely looking at two and maybe even one. And John, one of them is very likely to come smack in the middle of the presidential campaign in the fall. Which will have its own, uh, the, the market will belch a couple of times if that happens. What, help us think about the broader economy here, um, what the Fed's action or lack of action will mean for the broader economy. As you say, the economy is quite strong. Um, so what, how should we think through this next period now that we have these new numbers? And as you've so clearly laid out, we might not have cuts for a while. This is just it. I, I think, John, that you're serving two masters at the point if you're the Fed. Firstly, you have to deal with market anticipation and their assumption that a rate cut is going to come in the fall. But at the same time, if a rate cut does come more quickly, that's probably not going to be good news for most Americans because it would suggest that the economy is slowing into the second half of the year. There isn't much signal to that effect at the moment. As you noted, 303,000 new jobs were added to the economy last month. Activity benchmarks are, are looking strong, and consumers are relatively confident. But if there is a change, and there are some cracks deep underneath that economists are warning about, and we start to get a slowdown into the second half of the year, then the Fed might find itself in a very difficult quandary where inflation is still high, mm. but growth is slowing. And no longer do we have a soft landing, but we have the specter of stagflation, and that's absolutely something no one wants. Right, exactly. The worst of all worlds. Martin Bakardax with The Street. Thank you so much. Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas spent the day on Capitol Hill Wednesday discussing funding for his department. He urged the passing of President Biden's 2025 budget proposal, which includes billions in emergency funds for border security. Mayorkas also called on Congress to work on a bipartisan border agreement after Republicans blocked a deal earlier this year. Our administration worked closely with a bipartisan group of senators to reach agreement on a national security supplemental package, one that would make the system changes that are needed and give DHS the tools and resources needed to meet today's border security challenges. We remain ready to work with you to pass this tough, fair, bipartisan agreement. Illegal border crossings have gone down. Border Patrol apprehended around 137,000 people last month, a drop from nearly 141,000 in February.
House Republicans plan on sending articles of impeachment against Mayorkas to the Senate next week over his handling of the border. In 1955, Mamie Till opened her murdered son Emmett's casket because she said she wanted the world to see what was going on in Mississippi. Nearly 80 years later on Wednesday, the world saw a reckoning with what is still going on in the state of Mississippi. One former police officer and five former sheriff's deputies were sentenced to jail time ranging from 15 to 45 years for an attack on two black men they were sworn to protect. The Justice Department says the officers kicked in the door of the victim's home. The probable cause? They lived with a white woman. The officers called the men racial slurs, tased them, and assaulted them. One of the men was shot in the mouth. The officers later pleaded guilty to state and federal charges for their crimes. They'll serve the time for the state offenses alongside their federal sentences, which range from 10 to 40 years. Amanda Knox, the American jailed, then cleared of killing her roommate while studying abroad in Italy in 2007, is back on trial. Knox and her then-boyfriend served four years in an Italian prison for the murder of British student Meredith Kircher. They were both exonerated in 2015. However, Knox was convicted of slander for falsely accusing a local bar owner in Perugia, Italy, of killing Kircher. She is hoping this trial will remove any doubt about her innocence, and Knox's lawyers say she does plan on testifying at some point. For the first time, the Biden administration has laid out federal standards to limit so-called forever chemicals in the drinking water. As our Ben Tracy explains, the move is an effort to prevent serious illness and death. Everyone should be able to turn on their tap and trust that the water that they're drinking and giving their children is safe. EPA Administrator Michael Regan announced the new drinking water standard in North Carolina, where in 2017 it was discovered a chemical plant had been contaminating the local water supply by dumping PFAS into a nearby river. It was gut-wrenching to when we first learned about our contamination crisis. Emily Donovan lives near the river and has been fighting for PFAS regulations for years. How concerned have you been about the water you and your children have been drinking all these years? I mean, I've been terrified. No mother wants to be told that she contaminated her children. An estimated 200 million Americans are exposed to PFAS chemicals through drinking water. These forever chemicals last for thousands of years and are used in everything from food packaging to water-resistant clothing and cosmetics. They've been linked to certain cancers, liver damage, and developmental issues in children. You can't smell these chemicals, you can't taste them, you can't see them. So that's why these new rules are so important. Now, water utilities must reduce PFAS levels to near zero in the next five years. The EPA says 6 to 10 percent of the 66,000 public drinking water systems will likely need to make changes to comply. That could cost billions of dollars. The American Water Works Association, which represents the utilities, says polluters, not communities, should be held responsible. But for Emily Donovan... This, I think, is a, is a monumental... Um, change in how we look at public water in America. What matters is making the water safe to drink. Ben Tracy, CBS News, Los Angeles. The federal poverty line for a family of four is roughly $31,000, but United Way says that same family may need quadruple that amount just to get by. The disparity leaves many Americans in search of financial assistance. Ahead, we'll tell you about the workers who answer their calls for help. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. Washington is the seat of power. A national security, foreign policy, global economics, every story comes through Washington in some way. We bring some of the most powerful voices in America to the table. We don't just ask the questions, you have to go deeper. We try to understand what's at the heart of the issue we're talking about to then come forward with solutions. Face the Nation on CBS. 
the justices ruled that Harvard and the University of North Carolina violated the Constitution. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to end affirmative action in college admissions, uncertainty sets in for some students of color. Affirmative action really gave us an equal opportunity. CBS Reports explores the historic decision and what it means for those chasing an opportunity to change their lives. I knew that college was the ticket to break this cycle. The end of affirmative action, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Okay, let's go. You guys good? Hey. All right, we good? Keep going. It's the clock, it's ticking. Off we go. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. It's time for 60 Minutes, Sundays on CBS. An original documentary from CBS Reports. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever. Curing diseases, scientific breakthroughs, making lives better. They can help us with medical discovery, scientific discoveries, doing better agriculture, having cures for things like Alzheimer's. It's also going to really transform the way we work. The uplifting potential of artificial intelligence is limitless. It gives you a friend, somebody to chat with 24-7 that is non-judgmental. He makes me feel loved and desired. And so are its downfalls. The problem with all this AI is that it's unpredictable and uncontrollable. The choices we make now will have lasting effects for decades, maybe even centuries. The ChatGPT revolution, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We are about to see American weapons in the hands of Mexican cartels. A gun pipeline to Mexico. We are arming the cartels. 100%, no doubt about it. Happening right under our noses. Uh, uh, who's doing something about this? Nobody. A CBS Reports exclusive. Most Americans have no idea that we are effectively arming the enemy next door. This is the story the American people need to know. Arming cartels, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America Decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bringing you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides, Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. When you have a medical emergency, you call 911. But what happens in an economic emergency when you have to choose between paying your hospital bill and groceries for your family? The Wall Street Journal reports Americans are turning to 211, a social service helpline. Rachel Wolf spoke to some of those who work that help uh, that line. She is a consumer trends reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Thank you so much for joining us. It was such a fascinating story. What can you tell us about 211 and why people are turning to it? People are not able to make ends meet at levels far higher than what the federal poverty line represents, these call center operators were telling me. I got the chance to spend the day at a call center outside Hartford. And it was really staggering to hear the types of things that people were calling in about, just utterly unable to afford their basic needs at a time when the federal poverty line indicates that people should be getting by okay. The number of people under it really hasn't budged. So, Rachel, when they were calling in, what were some of the, um, what were some of the, the, the balances they were trying to, to meet or some of the challenges they were trying to meet? So people call in to two-on-one about all sorts of different things, people experiencing homelessness, who need to find a caretaker for their medical needs. What I have focused on for my story, though, is the population of people who are calling in in increasing and very large numbers who live above the federal poverty line of $31,200, but under what they call this Alice line or asset limited income constrained employed. And these are people who are working but still unable to pay their rent and their car payment and everything else and still have anything left over at the end of the month. So that's essentially what what's sometimes called the the working poor uh, who are um, and, and what kind of a position if you are in the working poor, what is that? How do, what kind of a fix does that put you in if you are not below the federal poverty line, but um, based on this, this Alice threshold, you're not living a life that anybody would, would define as kind of being out of poverty. 
Right. It's hard because most people in this group are not eligible for any services whatsoever. Most federal and state assistance is based on the federal poverty line. And again, according to the federal poverty line, there aren't more families living in poverty than there were 10 years ago. There are, however, way more Alice families. And again, these people are not eligible for the types of services that people under the poverty line are. They could be making $1 above the poverty line, or they could be making, in Connecticut, the bare minimum cost of living is as high as $126,000 for a family of four with two young kids having to pay for childcare. So it's a pretty big range. Uh, and it's, again, all people who are working very hard and just can't make it make it work. And and one of the things that's so interesting about the 211 calls is that, you know, navigating, even if there are uh, benefits that might be available to you, navigate, navigating them while you're trying to hold down a job or or find housing is itself a nightmare. Um, were there, for some of the callers, were there some um, help that, that the, those who answered the phone were able to get them to? Or, in other words, was it a lack of um, knowledge of what was out there? Uh, or was it mostly what, you've been, what we've been talking about, which is really they just don't qualify because of the income? It's really that they just don't qualify. 211 is amazing. They're able to route people to thousands of different services and providers. There are local 211s all across the country, and they help with truly anything you can possibly imagine, including people calling in about tax questions, identity theft. and But the people who they are really struggling to help are those who are not eligible for benefits. Where benefits exist, 211 operators are able to connect people to them. It's this group that's calling in, out of millions of calls that they receive every year, they said that this is really becoming one of the biggest shares, and they're hard-pressed to help. Rachel Wolf, Consumer Trends reporter for The Wall Street Journal, thank you so much for your reporting. A new survey finds Americans estimate they'll need to save $1.46 million to retire comfortably. But that same survey by Northwestern Mutual finds people have an average of $88,400 in their retirement accounts. According to our business analyst, Jill Schlesinger, some tips for retirement include this mildly complicated math. Calculate your current spending level and your future expenses and then how long you think you'll live. Then subtract any income assistance you may receive like Social Security and pensions. If there are still expenses left over after that subtraction, and what you're saving and investing won't cover those expenses, you have a few options. Two options, really. You can spend less now or work longer later. You could also plan a post-retirement career that provides additional income, low stress, and hopefully a little joy as well. They stepped up to the plate when the men went to war. Up next, we meet the real-life Rosie the Riveters as they receive a special honor in Washington. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. of the earth right now we got something crazy <laughs> and reach for the stars here we are <laughs> Tom. yes it's my comeback <laughs> <laughs> hey this is pretty fun but wait there's more experience thought-provoking multiple to the idea of being a human being innovative da -da -da. and truly original That's reporting right. look through a telescope and go wow because there's always something new under the sun on cbs sunday morning 
this moment, terrorists could be plotting another attack. 9-11 triggered a counter-terrorist system that included a secret database. This person needs a closer look. A growing list of nearly 2 million people, including some Americans who say they're innocent. For one hour flight, I have to spend six hours to go and come back. CBS Reports explores the system, the people responsible for it, and those pushing for change. I'm not fighting against them. I'm fighting for them to do the right thing. The Watch List, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Don't miss true crime anytime you want, anywhere you go. With the 48 Hours Podcast. Real crimes, real lives, real justice. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Listen to 48 Hours on Apple Podcasts. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Imagine yourself in Manhattan with no police, no army, no mayor. The people of Haiti stare down poverty, corruption, natural disasters, and violence. 90% of the guns that are used by gangs in Haiti are American guns. But with an unbreakable spirit and eternal optimism. There are days where I cry, but we can't be discouraged. We still believe in Haiti. They're still able to look ahead with hope. Haiti is on the brink of transformation, a radical shift. Haitians are coming together and saying things must change. Fighting for Haiti, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Everybody wakes up in the morning and they are pelted with alerts that frighten them, news that agitates them. With this show, we have the time to explain what's going on. These migrants, they've been released. Explain the status that allows them to be released, to slow things down a little bit. What are the big sets of questions for China and its ambitions? Hackers are stepping up their attacks to extort victims. Let's start with easy. Who's attacking? Here's a deeper understanding of what's happening. Prime Time with John Dickerson. Stream on the free CBS News app. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. On our places, bright, shiny faces. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. Tara Vanderveer, the NCAA's winningest basketball coach, is retiring after a legendary 45-year career. Vanderveer won three national championships as head coach of the Stanford women's team. She also won over 1,200 games. She was inducted into both the Naismith and Women's Basketball Halls of Fame. She also won five National Coach of the Year awards. We all know the image of Rosie the Riveter flexing her muscles in her polka dot bandana. She represented the more than six million women who joined the workforce during World War II. On Wednesday, the real-life Rosies were honored with the Congressional Gold Medal. Here's Natalie Brand. It's an honor decades in the making. I'm so proud to be able to symbolically accept this medal for all of you. This group of women bonded through their work during World War II, recognized today by congressional leaders for their initiative and patriotism. We felt it was very important work at that time. Dorothy Bogus of Washington, D.C., who turns 107 next month, worked as a typist and correspondence clerk for the Department of Defense. We were answering letters from families who were concerned about their families overseas. Sylvia Tanis of Michigan, just shy of 99, lied about her age during the war to get a job at a Ford plant working on the B-25 bomber. I was putting the, the what was called the de-icer on the B-25, it was all women, I and mean, we didn't know we were Rosies, we were just riveters. <laughs> Ernestine Ween of California, one of the youngest Rosies at 96, labored in agriculture while still in high school. I says, what did I do? And, uh, but I thought, well, I'm out here and I'm working for the war effort, so that's important and I'm sticking it out. What does it mean to get that gold medal? It means I did my country good during the war that I helped somehow. The women also share a bond of having loved ones, husbands and brothers who served. Women particularly hadn't been noticed as much as the men that went to serve. The Rosies say their work on the home front made a difference too. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Washington. 
up next. More of the day's top stories and headlines. For all of us here at CBS News Prime Time, I'm John Dickerson. That's our report. Thank you for spending the hour with us. Okay, so let's just start at the beginning. Well, let me start with this. What is at stake here? What is the answer then? Do you know why? You want me to just keep going? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Were there death threats? How is this possible? What's wrong with that argument? Are you saying they lied? Have you told the government that? Why won't you say the word crisis? You're not answering my question. This really is that scary? Does that make sense? What do you mean? What does that mean? In Did any of that make what sense? You What's your response? What happened? Why? 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 It's time for the CBS News Original 60 Minutes, Sunday on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. There is no more room in our city. New York City is receiving record numbers of migrants. Today, we're going to have more than 500 adults and children come through that door. Tensions rise as shelters reach max capacity. We don't have to take care of them. CBS Reports goes inside a crisis cities and families are facing as they fight to survive. The United States still has that glimmer of hope for people to come here. Fighting for a future. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. On Face the Nation, the way to learn is to listen. We may have a recession. Listening to how someone explains themselves is so key to understanding their perspective. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Since you started La Soup in 2014, do you have any sense as to how much food you've rescued from the landfill? We've rescued four and a half million pounds. I can't even fathom how much food that is. And that's one little person in one little city in America. We're going to call this chicken piccata. We did 450 of these meals today. This is the exact dish that you and I are going to have. Yep. Oh, my God. Is it good? Mm-hmm. Having a plan of how to keep people fed should be in every single city. So if we eliminated food waste, could we eliminate hunger? Yes. Eating Trash, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. This is CBS. Listen to the My Life of Crime podcast with me, Erin Moriarty. We aim every night to be factual and fair. That's our goal. Sunday morning, actor Kirsten Dunst, plus Wayne Brady on Broadway, and a beloved cherry tree named Stumpy. All right, friends, welcome back to CBS News. I'm Errol Barnett. Here's a recap of the top stories we're tracking for you right now. Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida is at the White House today for an official state visit with President Biden. The White House calls Japan the pivotal member of the Quad. That's the nickname for the informal alliance between the U.S., Japan, Australia, and India. High-level talks this afternoon will be followed by a formal state dinner at the White House tonight. A New York judge sentenced former Trump CFO Alan Weisselberg to five months behind bars for perjury. He admitted to lying while testifying on behalf of the former president in the company's civil fraud trial. Weisselberg served 100 days in prison last year for tax evasion. Consumer inflation rose higher than expected. The CPI is up uh, less than half a percent from last month, but it also rose three and a half percent from this time last year. Experts say the stubborn rise in prices may prompt the Federal Reserve to hold off on plans to begin lowering interest rates this year.
All right, another wave of severe weather right now is sweeping through parts of the south and the Mississippi Valley. Look at that. This will continue throughout the afternoon. In fact, we have some video to show you from Jackson, Mississippi. Um, harsh thunderstorms there, are downing trees and utility poles. That's happening beneath the radar images you're seeing. Some homes have been destroyed, and while around thousands of people in Mississippi uh, at this moment also are without power. CBS News correspondent Tom Hansen is covering the storm in Jackson, Mississippi, getting soaked. Tom, what else are you feeling and seeing on the ground there? Errol, this storm has been powerful and fast moving. You know, I flew through this storm, in fact, last night as I was getting into Jackson. It tossed our plane around like a toy. Now we are seeing some of the impacts on the ground. I want you to take a look around me. You can see that there are downed power lines, something that is happening in many neighborhoods across Jackson. You can see the yards here littered with branches. And then take a look at this house. A massive tree fell on this house, essentially splitting the house in two. Now, we've talked with emergency management here in Jackson. They say that they are watching the Pearl River very closely. The primary concern here, of course, is flooding. Elsewhere, the concern are those powerful tornadoes that we have already seen, one overnight in Houston that leveled a church, and then another tornado in Louisiana. So this storm is packing a punch, certainly nothing to balk at. Errol? Yeah, and with those down power lines, uh uh, also provide a danger. We want everyone to remain safe, including you and the crew there. We know the power is out, but how long will folks in this part of the country experience this severe weather, Tom? We are nowhere near out of the woods just yet. This storm system is expected to last throughout the day, possibly into the night. And if you zoom out, just to get a context of how powerful this storm system is and how much of a concern there should be, if you look at the Torcon map, there is a large portion of pink in southern Louisiana, southern Alabama, Mississippi, uh, and that is a level seven. That basically means that there is a very strong likelihood of tornadoes, not just in that area that is pink, but also in a 50 mile radius surrounding that area. Officials are urging people not to go out in this storm and to seek shelter if there is a tornado on the ground. We've already seen other precautions being taken. Louisiana closing all state offices today and schools here in Jackson are remote. So people are taking this storm very seriously, Errol, and we are certainly nowhere near out of the woods just yet. All right, great warning there, Tom. We want everyone there to stay safe. Thank you very much. Former exchange student Amanda Knox is on trial once again in Italy, this time for slander. She's charged with wrongly accusing a Congolese man of murdering her roommate back in 2007. Now, you may remember Knox was convicted for that murder and uh, served four years in prison for being, before being exonerated. During her interrogation, Knox pointed the finger at the owner of the bar where she worked. She later recanted that claim in a note she wrote the following afternoon. CBS News foreign correspondent Chris Livesay joins us now from Rome with the latest on this. Chris, I think I've basically tried to give the broad brush strokes, but explain better in detail what this trial is really about. Hey, Errol. Yeah, you know, you have to remember this happened when Amanda Knox was just 20 years old. Uh, she barely spoke Italian at the time. She was living in Perugia on, on a college study abroad program. Just imagine the circumstances. She finds out that her housemate, her, her roommate, has been murdered. And then after sleepless nights, she has to give testimony. And then in the midst of that testimony, speaking in very broken Italian, sometimes without an official interpreter on hand, she wrongly accuses somebody, uh, putting them at the scene of the crime who absolutely was not there. But that person still had to spend two weeks under arrest as a result of that accusation. So this is what this case is all about. She was found guilty of slandering this other person. Now is an opportunity for her to finally clear her name and, and set the record straight as she sees it and show the circumstances that she was under. At the time she issued, there was a four page statement that was taken by police, but that's since been ruled inadmissible because of those circumstances. Now she has an opportunity to submit a 20 page letter that she's written herself, we can only presume in perfect Italian because she was able to perfect her Italian in the four years that she had to spend in prison.
I bet, and that's a really interesting uh, detail. We know that Knox is not in court for this. What do we know about how she's living her life now? Yeah, you know, so ever since then, she's been able to pull the pieces of her life back together and, uh, you know, start a family. She's married. She has two children. She's 36 years old. And today she works mostly as an advocate, uh, specifically for people who are caught up in the same types of circumstances that she was, you know, wrong people who have been wrongly accused or people who have been victims of forced confessions. Um, you know, she's also spoken out about this at length. Uh, she has made a podcast. Uh, she continues to work on a podcast with her husband. Uh, she's also made uh, a series on a meditation app where she talks about resilience. So she's definitely not gone anywhere. She seems to have turned this massive setback into something that gives her more and more energy to move forward and turn it into a strength. And perhaps next she'll do a language translation app. Who knows? Uh, Chris Livesay, appreciate the update on this. Thank you very much. A whistleblower who came forward after a Boeing jet lost a door panel midair is raising safety questions about a different Boeing jet. Sources tell CBS News federal regulators are now looking into his claims, which the company strongly denies. CBS News senior transportation correspondent Chris Van Cleve brings us this story. The FAA is investigating claims by a Boeing quality engineer that he observed shortcuts during the production of the 787 Dreamliner. He worries they could lead to structural integrity issues years down the line as the jet ages. His concerns were spelled out in a letter by his attorney to the FAA in January, following the door panel that blew out of a 737 MAX mid-flight. His lawyer urged the FAA to widen its probe of Boeing to focus on the company's entire production process, not just the 737. But Boeing is pushing back strongly, saying, We are fully confident in the 787 Dreamliner. These claims about the structural integrity of the 787 are inaccurate and do not represent the comprehensive work Boeing has done to ensure the quality and long-term safety of the aircraft. The whistleblower letter cites concerns from 2021, around the same time when Boeing paused 787 deliveries for over a year to address quality control issues, a process the FAA signed off on. Officials in Chicago have released body cam video that shows officers firing 96 times at a driver who they pulled over. We have to give you a warning here. This video is disturbing. Initial evidence from an independent investigation shows the driver, a 26-year-old named Dexter Reed, fired the first shot. Reed was killed and one officer was injured. The plainclothes officer says they'd stopped Reed on suspicion of not wearing a seatbelt. Reed's family is calling for charges to be filed. Chicago's mayor says the footage is deeply disturbing. I'm personally devastated to see yet another young black man lose his life during an interaction with the police. I've also been praying for the full recovery of the officer who was shot during this interaction. Now, the Chicago Fraternal Order of Police has not responded to CBS News' request for comment on this. Six Mississippi law enforcement officers who tortured and abused two black men learned their sentences in their state courses to, uh, court cases today. The members of the so-called Goon Squad received sentences ranging from 15 to 45 years. They'll serve those concurrently with the federal prison sentences they received last month. If you remember, I was in Jackson, Mississippi reporting on that. The attack happened in January of last year after a white person called a deputy to complain. Two black men were staying with a white woman. The six former officers tortured and humiliated the men with various objects. A new report suggests some of the nation's biggest companies are discriminating against black job applicants. In the largest of its kind study, a group from the National Bureau of Economic Research sent out 80,000 resumes to 97 companies over a three-year span between 2019 and 2021. They use fake resumes, but with equal qualifications, changing only personal details to imply an applicant's race, age, and gender. Overall, researchers found employers contacted white applicants, more than black ones, with the widest gap being between companies' genuine parts and auto nation. So far, neither company has responded to our requests for comment. However, genuine parts did tell the New York Times, quote, we are always evaluating our practices to ensure inclusivity and break down barriers, and we will continue to do so. AutoNation did not respond to the New York Times. 
Let's bring in Evan Rose now. He is a co-author of this report and is an assistant economics professor at the University of Chicago. Evan, great to have you with us on this topic. I'm just wondering from your point of view, with all the research you've done, what were the most significant findings and what it tells us about the U.S. labor market as a whole? Great, yeah, thanks so much for having me. Um, so this was uh, a, a huge study, as you mentioned. We sent thousands and thousands of resumes to many hundreds of companies. And I think the most important thing that we learned from the study is that companies seem to really differ in the extent to which they discriminate based on the characteristics uh, that we're looking at, which is both both race and gender. You highlighted the fact that two companies appear to discriminate much more than the other companies in our study. I think it's also important to recognize that some companies appear to discriminate a, uh, quite a bit less or, or even not at all in our study. It's just massive heterogeneity in the economy and the extent to which we see this discrimination against distinctively black names. Now, importantly, that discrimination doesn't seem to be random. It's concentrated in particular industries for race discrimination, for example, firms that do things with cars and car parts like AutoNation and Genuine Parts, which owns the Napa, Napa Auto Parts brand seem to discriminate much more than firms in other industries, including industries like uh, food stores and grocery stores, for example. So we think this is important because I think it means, first of all, there might be something we could do about this from an enforcement perspective. We also think it might be it might mean that there are things firms can do themselves that might mitigate or exacerbate the type of discrimination that you could see in their organization. The fact that all firms don't seem to discriminate in the same way suggests that this is just an inevitable feature of the labor market, that there's going to be discrimination out there always. Instead, it may be that policies and practices that firms can, can adopt, how they structure hiring, the type of training they give people might actually have an impact on these on these measures. And we hope that by releasing these data, we can start to learn some of those uh, policies and practices and share those across firms in a way that can help reduce the type of discrimination that we're seeing here. It's a fascinating study, extensive research that you've done. We mentioned areas in which we're more likely to discriminate, which companies and which areas were less likely. Yeah, so we see less discrimination on the basis of race against our distinctively black names and these fictional applications we sent in the food store industries, which I mentioned earlier. You can think about that like grocery stores. Uh, we see less discrimination in freight and transport, which include companies like FedEx and UPS, um, as well as some in other utility companies uh, and communications companies like Charter and, and, and Spectrum. So again, it's not a universal phenomenon. It's not sort of inevitable that there's going to be discrimination in, in the types of job we're studying here. It does seem to have strong concentration in particular firms and, and among firms that are concentrated in these particular industries. And again, for our viewers, the resumes were identical. The qualifications and the skills were the same. It was the personal information that you changed. How then, if, if companies are watching this, people who can actually Im, you know, Im, uh, impact change, what can companies do to address discrimination and, and you know, extinguish this type of behavior? Yeah, that's a great, great question. And, and hopefully, hopefully something that we can continue to work on in, in future research. You know, the short answer is we don't really know what's going on behind the scenes at these companies. We see what our, uh, our experiment is establishing is that companies do differ in the extent of discrimination that they exhibit as measured in an experiment like ours. We have some clues about what policies and practices might matter here, including things like how centralized their HR operation seems to be. Some companies, it seems that many individuals are involved in making hiring decisions at a single establishment. So it might be four or five different people calling back job applications at one store. At other companies, it looks like there might be just one person who's overseeing hiring for a couple a couple different stores across a broad, broader set of establishments. And what we infer from that is that it seems like companies where maybe they've invested a little bit more in professionalizing the hiring function and offered some kind of training, maybe that's one way in which you can mitigate the type of discrimination that you'd measure in a, in a study like ours. But you know, one of the reasons why we wanted to do this project and release these names and talk about the, which companies are actually in our list is to open the way for other researchers and policymakers and everyone to dig into what policies and practices really do seem to differ across these firms and think about what we can learn about how to, how to address this problem at a more systematic level. Yeah, it's a sobering report, but hopefully it's just part of a step in the right direction. Evan Rose, we really appreciate you discussing your findings with us, uh, joining us from Chicago. Okay, thanks so much. All right, at this point, we're gonna take a very short break. Stay with us, you're streaming CBS News. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. Oh! 
<laughs> and reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da -da -da. and truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday morning. At this moment, terrorists could be plotting another attack. 9-11 triggered a counter-terrorist system that included a secret database. This person needs a closer look. A growing list of nearly 2 million people, including some Americans who say they're innocent. For one hour flight, I have to spend six hours to go and come back. CBS Reports explores the system, the people responsible for it, and those pushing for change. I'm not fighting against them. I'm fighting for them to do the right thing. The Watch List, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Don't miss true crime anytime you want, anywhere you go. With the 48 Hours Podcast. Real crimes, real lives, real justice. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Listen to 48 Hours on Apple Podcasts. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Imagine yourself in Manhattan with no police, no army, no mayor. The people of Haiti stare down poverty, corruption, natural disasters, and violence. 90% of the guns that are used by gangs in Haiti are American guns. But with an unbreakable spirit and eternal optimism. There are days where I cry, but we can't be discouraged. We still believe in Haiti. They're still able to look ahead with hope. Haiti is on the brink of transformation, a radical shift. Haitians are coming together and saying things must change. Fighting for Haiti, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Everybody wakes up in the morning and they are pelted with alerts that frighten them, news that agitates them. With this show, we have the time to explain what's going on. These migrants, they've been released. Explain the status that allows them to be released, to slow things down a little bit. What are the big sets of questions for China and its ambitions? Hackers are stepping up their attacks to extort victims. Let's start with easy. Who's attacking? Here's a deeper understanding of what's happening. Prime Time with John Dickerson. Stream on the free CBS News app. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. On our places, bright, shiny faces. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. Exit polls are suggesting South Korea's liberal opposition could win today's parliamentary election by a landslide. South Korean media reports the opposition is forecasted to win 197 seats in the 300-member National Assembly. Now, this would be a major blow to South Korea's conservative president, essentially making him a lame duck for his remaining three years in office. The Environmental Protection Agency has issued groundbreaking regulations designed to make drinking water safer for people all over the United States. Now, the agency is requiring public water utilities to test for six different types of substances known as PFAS to reduce people's exposure to them in drinking water. PFAS, also commonly known as forever chemicals, are found in a wide variety of products. And that's despite a growing body of research demonstrating their negative health effects on all of us. This new effort marks the first ever national regulations for PFAS in drinking water. These new standards really are a breakthrough because what they do is they will address six of these forever toxic chemicals, um, six of the ones that we know are pretty common and are extremely toxic. So by regulating those, EPA's estimate is that as many as 105 million people have these chemicals in their water right now. That stuff is getting into people's bodies and is threatening their health. CBS News Senior National and Environmental Correspondent Ben Tracy joins us now to dive into this historic announcement. And Ben, I feel like there's two reactions to this. On one side, it sounds like an encouraging development that we're better protected. But on the other side, it's only six of these so-called forever chemicals. Help us understand why they're so dangerous and how long they really do last. 
So these are really incredibly strong man-made chemicals. They're resistant to heat and water and oil and dirt. And that makes them great for all the products that they're used in. You saw some of those products up on the screen. It's everything from nonstick cookware to water-resistant clothing. But the problem is they're very hard to break down. They can last for thousands of years in the environment. And they have been linked to serious health issues. Everything from you know liver damage and immune system damage to certain forms of cancer and then developmental issues with children. So that is the concern that this stuff is in the water supply that nearly 2 million, um, 200 million Americans are drinking. And how exactly, Ben, will the EPA try to enforce these regulations? Well, these are legally enforceable. Basically, water, public water utilities around the country are going to have to make changes to comply with these new rules. They have some time to do it. They have about three years to monitor their water system, find out how much PFAS is actually in their system, report that to the public, make that public so people know what they're drinking, and then they get about two years to comply with these rules. So they're going to have to install equipment to basically bring those levels down if they exceed these new EPA rules to the levels that would comply. And as I mentioned, and as we spoke about coming into this, uh, the EPA is restricting the use of a total of six uh, PFASs in, in drinking water. But what, there are more than 15,000 of these kinds of chemicals. So how significant from your point of view, Ben, on reporting on environmental and climate issues, how significant are these regulations specifically? It's still really significant. Yes, you hear six versus the 15,000, but the reason they're focusing on those six are those are the six that are really toxic. Those are the ones that are causing the really significant health issues and ones that have found to be prevalent in drinking water systems. So the thought is by going after those and forcing these systems to reduce those to near zero levels that you really will mitigate some of the health risks uh, that currently exist. And for folks watching who, you know, want to follow better guidance and reduce their risk and exposure to any type of forever chemicals, what would you recommend? Well, we got to be honest, this is this is not easy. I mean, this is not as simple as, you know, running your water through a Brita filter at your house or something like that. You'd have to install basically a reverse osmosis system the kind of thing that goes underneath your sink. It costs a lot of money. So what EPA is doing is they're saying, we would rather do this at the utility level so you folks at home, when you turn on your tap, you don't have to worry about it. You can actually trust what is coming out of there. So some of that technology will be installed at these water treatment plants, and therefore you wouldn't have to worry about it as much when it comes out of your tap. All right, it'll take some time for this to kick in, but at least it seems like a step in the right direction. Ben Tracy, thanks for joining us. Thanks, Errol. The summer travel season is almost here, and to ease the stress of flying, one airport is helping travelers relax with the help of some furry friends. CBS News' Ian Lee. These reports. pups are on patrol at Istanbul Airport. They're not sniffing out drugs, but searching for tense travelers passing through Turkey. This dog handler says, we see a lot of demand for therapy dogs. They help people to relax. Border Collie Alida leads the pack of this pilot project, giving kisses and comfort. After your long flight or your gas stressful or you lost something, you need something like can keep you calm down and uh, something that's like the dog is wonderful. Italian retriever Cookie loves belly rubs. I think it looks nice to how like friendly dogs in the airports. And research shows this positive approach has health benefits reducing stress, raising feel-good hormones, and lowering blood pressure. They stop people worrying, and, and they make people happy. The idea is being unleashed at airports around the world, from the UK to Miami International. He's here to keep you happy and de-stress. He's doing a great job. Is he? <laughs> He's doing a great job, hey, bro. It's dogs doing what they do best. This is Brody. See how soft he is? Being hey, our Brody. best friends. Ian Lee, CBS News, London. For one family in Texas, the excitement of Monday's total eclipse was outdone by an even bigger event, the birth of their baby. And as CBS News' as Brooke Rogers tells us, this little girl will have a story to tell the rest of her life with a name to match. So congratulations, Mom. Meet Sol Celeste Alvarez, who came into the world at six pounds, nine ounces, and nine days early. So I started feeling contractions around four. I didn't think in my wildest dream that she would be born. That was very, very close. When Alicia's labor pains picked up, their only concern about time was making it to the hospital. 
But we ran into mm -hmm. a lot of traffic just because yeah. everybody was going to the um, eclipse, like wanted to see the eclipse. So it took us about an hour and 30 or 30, 30 minutes to get here. Sol Celeste, whose name means celestial sun in Spanish, made her appearance just as the sun was disappearing. And then I just saw, you know, while she was in the bat in the bassinet that it started turning dark. The Alvarez's actually decided they were going to name her Soul months ago, and they chose that because they had named her big sister Luna, which means the moon. So I wanted something that they could share together. So I love the continuous name of um, Sun and Moon, and it was just a continuous love. Dad Carlos, an Army veteran, says he's still marveling at her timely arrival. It was really surprising, I think, that um, I didn't wake up that day thinking it was going to be this plus a baby at the same time. But they know that somehow the stars aligned to give them the sun. When it did, you're like, OK, there must be a better purpose behind it or something that's going on maybe that I'm out of my control. And the fact that I have a moon already mm -hmm. and now I have a sun and a moon and then she was born during the eclipse, that's just, you just can't, the odds of that is just crazy. Brooke Rogers, CBS News, Texas. All right, at this point, we're going to take a very short break. Stay with us. You're streaming CBS News. Okay, so let's just start at the beginning. Well, let me start with this. What is at stake here? What is the answer then? Do you know why? You want me to just keep going? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Were there death threats? How is this possible? What's wrong with that argument? Are you saying they lied? Have you told the government that? Why won't you say the word crisis? You're not answering my question. This really is that scary? Does that make sense? What do you mean? What does that mean in Did any of that make what sense? You What's your response? What happened? Why? 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 It's time for the CBS News Original 60 Minutes, Sunday on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. There is no more room in our city. New York City is receiving record numbers of migrants. Today, we're going to have more than 500 adults and children come through that door. Tensions rise as shelters reach max capacity. We don't have to take care of them. CBS Reports goes inside a crisis cities and families are facing as they fight to survive. The United States still has a glimmer of hope for people to come here. Fighting for a future. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. On Face the Nation, the way to learn is to listen. We may have a recession. Listening to how someone explains themselves is so key to understanding their perspective. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Since you started La Soup in 2014, do you have any sense as to how much food you've rescued from the landfill? We've rescued four and a half million pounds. I can't even fathom how much food that is. And that's one little person in one little city in America. We're going to call this chicken piccata. We did 450 of these meals today. This is the exact dish that you and I are going to have. Yep. Oh, my really good. Is it good? Mm-hmm. Having a plan of how to keep people fed should be in every single city. So if we eliminated food waste, could we eliminate hunger? Yes. Eating Trash, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education. Both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bringing you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. This This is a devastating decision that will have 
huge consequences. I thought that the ruling was asinine, um, but it's up to Arizona to fix it, and it sounds like they're going to uh, to do that. This is about restoring stability in the region, and I think we have a chance of doing that. Hello, I'm Ed O'Keefe, CBS News in Washington. Welcome to America Decides. The Arizona Supreme Court's decision to let a Civil War era ban on abortion services take effect is earning bipartisan condemnation. The Democratic Governor Katie Hobbs, President Biden, and former President Donald Trump all say they don't like it. The Grand Canyon State's High Court upheld an 1864 law that allows for abortions to save the life of the mother, but not in cases of rape or incest. Hobbs called on the state's legislature to repeal the ban during an appearance on CBS Mornings. Arizonans across the state are reeling from this devastating decision that reinstates a near total ban, a ban that was passed in 1864, before Arizona was even a state, before uh, women had the right to vote. We have a team of journalists on the story tonight across the country with a look at the fallout from the ruling and the politics of abortion rights. We begin with Elizabeth Campbell in Phoenix. Elizabeth, good to see you. You spoke with an abortion provider in the state about the ruling, as well as an attorney for an anti-abortion rights organization. What did they tell you? Good to be with you, Ed. And fallout is right as people try to regroup and figure out where they're going to go from here. Now, it's important to emphasize that we do not yet know when this ruling will go into effect. There's at least 45 more days before that happens. I talked to one provider. They perform about 100 abortions a week, both by the pill and the procedure. Take a listen to the concern she has now that this has passed. Increased maternal mortality, forced pregnancy, increased infant mortality, and just this despair and the devastation that people feel when they find out that they don't have bodily autonomy and they don't have the ability to access abortion. Forced pregnancy is real and pregnancy is really hard on the body and there's so many risks. It is riskier to go through an entire pregnancy than to have an abortion and it will just have a devastating effect on the people of Arizona. Now, that clinic does promise me that they will perform procedures up until the day that the law goes into effect. On the flip side, also keeping up that fight with a possible ballot measure coming down this fall, is the law firm that took this case to the Supreme Court. Take a listen to what their lead lawyer had to say today as well. Life is always worth protecting. Think about everything we've learned over the past 50 years. Unborn children start having a heartbeat at six weeks, fingers and toes at eight weeks, and unique fingerprints at 10 weeks. Uh, a people does well when they uh, elect officials that work vigorously to protect life from the moment of conception. Now, as you said, this is the Grand Canyon State, and it's also a swing state, Ed. So this debate is not going anywhere come the fall. You took the words right out of my mouth, Elizabeth, in Phoenix. Thank you for that. Thanks to those that you spoke with today. Now on to another battleground state. Shana Mazel is in Charlotte, North Carolina, where the Biden campaign is holding events focused on abortion rights across the Tar Heel state. Shana, you were there as two women affected by abortion bans campaigned for the president today. What did they have to say? That's right, Ed. So they started out this morning in Durham. They went to the Winston-Salem and they ended in Charlotte. They both spoke about their personal experiences in Louisiana and in Texas being impacted by the restrictive abortion bans that both states have. And they really shared that personal experience during roundtables with physicians, medical professionals, but as well as state lawmakers. And they're sending a similar message that we've seen from the Biden campaign. And that is laying the blame at the feet of former President Donald Trump for those restrictive abortion bans. Now, the Biden campaign featured one of the two women in a new ad. What did she have to tell you? Correct. Amanda. I spoke with her and I asked her why it was important for her to share her story and repeat it so often and even on large platforms like the Biden campaign ad. Here's what she had to say. I think my greatest fear is that what happened to me will happen to other people. And if we don't reelect President Biden and Vice President Harris in November, that will be the reality of this country. And it's really difficult to relive this over and over again. But there's nothing more important to me right now than this campaign and making sure that President Biden is reelected. Shana so that's Amanda from Texas. And she tells me 
that she has plans to continue what she's been doing, hitting the campaign trail. She'll be in Milwaukee next week. Ed? Uh, Shana Mazel in Charlotte, thank you so much. This is what former President Donald Trump had to say about the controversial abortion ruling today while campaigning in Georgia. Oh, yeah, they did, and that'll be straightened out. And uh, as you know, it's all about states' rights. That'll be straightened out. And I'm sure that the governor and everybody else are going to bring it back into reason, and that will be taken care of, I think, very quickly. Saying that it'll be straightened out. He was also asked whether he would sign a national abortion ban if he's elected president again, and if such a ban ever passes Congress. He shook his head in response and said no. We're joined now by Molly Ball and Deepa Shivran. Molly is a senior political correspondent for The Wall Street Journal. Deepa is a White House correspondent for NPR. Good to see both of you this afternoon. I know both of you have been tracking this quite closely as well uh, from a national political perspective. Uh, Talk about the Department of Odd Timing. The former president comes out with this abortion announcement earlier this week, uh, seems to try to brush it off and say states will deal with this, and then Arizona goes and drops this huge ruling that now upends the politics of that battleground state. Absolutely. This is now the most restrictive abortion law in any of the uh, swing states, uh, and it goes all the way back to the 19th century. I think that uh, it was a big surprise to a lot of people, including in Arizona, uh, that the Supreme Court made this decision and reactivated this very old law. And it does uh, really underscore, I think, the Biden campaign couldn't have asked for a better confluence of events to underscore uh, the message that they're trying to send, which is not only the, you know, the side that he's on on this important issue, but putting it on the top of voters' minds. You know, we have seen in a lot of polls uh, that uh, this is really the only top issue on which the president is trusted over Donald Trump. And when voters are asked what's the most important issue, they tend to say immigration, they say the economy, they say a lot of other things. Uh, and those are issues where Trump does better. This is the issue that the Biden campaign hopes will decide the election because it is an issue where voters take his side. And in Arizona, the fact that uh, it's likely to be on the ballot this November uh, makes it that much more of what Democrats hope will be a driver of turnout in their favor. If anything, that's what brings people to the polls and then they'll conceivably vote hoping, for the president. Yeah. Now, Deepa, as someone tracking the Biden campaign, talk about how they're recalibrating now in the wake of this decision, especially in Arizona. I mean, the almost immediately you saw the vice president's team, Kamala right. Harris, who has been the lead spokesperson on this issue for the administration, immediately announced that she's headed to Tucson later this week. She'll be there on Friday. That really utilizes that kind of shoot out of the cannon uh, effort that she usually does with these very hot button issues, abortion included. And th she'll be on the ground. She'll be rallying with voters. Um, this is exactly the kind of momentum that they're hoping to carry into November. And not only did, did that happen this week, but as you see Trump's announcements playing out and, and whether or not he'll, you know, sign a national abortion ban, things like that, the Biden campaign is very much trying to remind reporters and also remind uh, voters right now, you know, Trump is someone who has toggled a lot on this issue. And even though he's saying something right now, you know, look back at everything else he's done when it comes to this issue and, and really trying to keep that top of mind, like you said. Both of you uh, and this reporter have been around these campaigns long enough to observe <laughs> in the last few days, at least I did, that they seemed to anticipate this quite well, the Biden campaign, between last week when there was that ad they released uh, with the woman in Texas uh, in response to President Trump saying that he was going to go down this road and introduce this decision to then anticipating this Arizona ruling, the vice president had pre-taped a bunch of things that they released on social media, immediately announced that they're going to Tucson. They seem to be ready for this one in ways that we don't always see, especially national campaigns, ready to react quickly to something. Well, what I'm hearing from Democratic sources is that the ads that they are, of course, producing on this issue are among the best testing ads in their arsenal. Mm. And they are very effective because, as we know, this is a, an election that a lot of voters are not excited about. Right. These are two candidates that a lot of voters are not excited about. And so it is incumbent on the campaigns to remind them of the stakes, remind them of the policies that are at stake and the potential consequences of your vote. So I think we can expect both campaigns uh, to be hammering on the policy stakes of that election of this election. And for the Biden campaign, that is going to mean, as we've heard repeatedly from them, democracy and Dobbs. They see those as the winning issues and they're, they're They are, of course, prepared to hammer them home. So when these new developments reinforce their message and unfortunately for former President Trump, there are going to continue to be new developments. This is the meaning 
uh, you know, when he said this is up to the states, this is federalism, this is states' rights, this is what that means. It means states are constantly going to making these kinds of moves. We're going to constantly be seeing new uh, cases reminding people of of the unsettled abortion regime when it comes to policy. And there's going to continue to be uh, ways to remind voters of, of the importance of this issue. And keep in mind, this is an issue that has been a winning issue for Democrats ever since the Dobbs decision came out. I mean, Democrats, Biden, Harris, right. they have that on their side, right? They, they've seen in states across the country and even conservative states, right, where voters have come out and said, no, we want to protect abortion rights. So it kind of helps in that regard to have all of this stock piled up. Like you said, they're ready to go because they've seen it work in the past several months and years. And Although I would, I would quibble ahead. with that just a little bit to say the abortion has been a winning issue for abortion. It hasn't necessarily been a winning issue for Democrats. We have yet to see a Republican gubernatorial or Senate candidate lose because of the abortion issue or at all since since Roe was overturned. And, and you this mean is an incumbent? Exactly. Okay. Because Daniel Cameron, of course, struggled in the gubernatorial race in Kentucky. We have seen it be that. an issue in right. some races. Uh, but we have not seen it defeat incumbents, and we have never seen it play in a presidential race. This That's is right. the first presidential race since the overturning of Roe. Uh, and so I think Deepa's right. It certainly has a lot of potential for Democrats, but we don't yet know how it's going to interact with the presidential when so much else is on voters' minds. And when we have so much time to go, because it right. is just April. But uh, certainly uh, this week's zig is uh, to the benefit of the Democrats. We'll see uh, where the zags are going forward. Molly Ball, Deepa Shivram, so great to have both of you here. Thank you because you both know what you're talking about, and that's, uh, that's helpful. Today, President Biden tried to focus attention on what the U.S. is doing across Asia and the Indo-Pacific region. Coming up, we head to the White House for the latest on the president's big meetings with the Prime Minister of Japan and learn more about who's joining them tomorrow. You're streaming America Decides. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Nate has one of the quickest minds I've ever seen. Tony has a way of making people feel comfortable. Gail has this unbelievable knack to ask the question that you're asking at home. I've been told I could talk to a tree, and that's pretty much true. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. It didn't seem like anything could happen because nothing ever happens in East Palestine, but it did. Authorities released toxic fumes from five derailed train cars. Resident, please evacuate. Acute bronchitis due to chemical fumes. Did you ever have these problems before the derailment? No, ma'am. This neighborhood's not safe no more. We can assure the community that there's not vinyl chloride entering their communities. Then why are there so many people feeling these various symptoms of bloody noses or difficulty breathing and bronchitis? That's a hard question to answer. We're talking about one of the most blatant releases of a mixture of some of the most toxic chemicals that we've seen in America. I feel like now I have a duty to warn other communities. If my daughter has to watch me die of cancer, at least it saves someone else. This case. It's like a screenplay, something straight out of Hollywood. But it's not fiction. It's 48 hours. Human remains found this week. Four families shattered. There's no physical evidence. The mystery would haunt investigators for years. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Get it, it! Like a John Grisham novel. A gripping true crime original, 48 Hours, now streaming on the free CBS News app. This is CBS. Here in space. 
sightseers in space, the thrill of a lifetime. Seeing the Earth from space, it was so exhilarating. But the risks that come with the territory. There have been four fatal accidents. That's a 1% fatal accident rate. Might make you look before you launch. If you had one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, we'd have a public crisis. Space Tourism, now streaming on the free CBS News app. President Biden and Japanese Prime Minister Fumio Kishida announced plans today for closer military and intelligence cooperation. The president called the U.S.-Japan alliance a beacon to the entire world. CBS's Weisha Zhang joins us now from the White House. Weisha, good to see you. How exactly do the United States and Japan plan on working together to counter China? Well, Ed, the announcements today really center around these two countries' militaries and finding ways that they can cooperate better so that they can fend off a potential uh, adversary. Although I should say that the president did not explicitly talk about China or its president Xi Jinping at length, uh, those two topics were certainly the backdrop and the entire undercurrent of this uh, discussion today. And so to that end, they are looking for ways to, as an example, produce a defense weapons together. They are also trying to bolster their military command center in that region to see if there are new ways that they can collaborate. And so all of this, as you mentioned it, is because, as we very well know, every piece of the president's foreign policy is attached to Beijing. And so as Beijing continues its offensive, especially in the South China Sea, the president wants to show that it is getting as many allies as possible in the region and sort of sending a message without saying it that we're prepared in case we have to be. And, and to that point, they're, they're having a, a third leader join them tomorrow, right? That's right. This is going to be the president of the Philippines, Marcos Tomorrow, Fernandez Marcos Jr., and he will be here for a trilateral meeting. This comes as in that South China Sea I was just talking about, China has been aggressive towards Philippines Coast Guard, and they're also worried about how China could try to control the seas there. And they're really focused on economic uh, collaboration and growth in the area. But again, Ed, as you know, this points back to China and what they can do as a show of force, if you will, uh, before anything actually happens. And while the president wants to keep as much focus as possible on Asia and the Indo-Pacific, he did have to talk today about the war in Gaza. What did he have to say about ceasefire negotiations? Well, it's really interesting, Ed, because just yesterday here at the White House, hostage families expressed frustration that they seem to that, you know, when people mentioned ceasefires and a temporary ceasefire, they were not hearing that being linked back to their loved ones, hostages being released. And so that is exactly what we heard from President Biden today, reminding everyone what's at stake. Take a listen. The new proposal on the table, uh, Bill Burns led the effort to uh, for us. We're grateful for his work. There's a now up to Hamas. They need to move on the proposal that's been made. And as I said, uh, we'll get these hostages home where they belong, but also bring back a six-week ceasefire that we need now. President Biden was also asked about recent comments he made during an interview that Netanyahu is making a mistake in his handling of the war in Gaza. And he was asked explicitly whether the U.S was prepared to condition aid. But the president sort of talked around it. He talked about all the things Netanyahu is doing to open more humanitarian corridors, all the promises he has made to better protect civilians and humanitarian aid workers. So President Biden said, we'll see. We Zhang at the White House. I guess the other interesting thing is that the Japanese prime minister brought along, what, 200 more cherry blossom trees to be planted here in Washington? And That's then two, right. And two Japanese astronauts get to go to the moon with the U.S. whenever we get back there. So it's a pretty extensive day for them. Yes. And it will be capped off with a very extravagant state dinner tonight where Paul Simon is performing. So, you know, a lot of work and a lot of pomp and circumstance, which is why we love covering state dinners, Ed. Don't we? That's right. One day we'll get invited to one. Lisa Zhang, good to see you over there at the White House. Thank you. For decades, politicians have used the threat of crime to try to win over voters. Next, we explore its effectiveness, even when crime rates start dropping. You're streaming America Decides. places.
Right, shiny faces? When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Nate has one of the quickest minds I've ever seen. Tony has a way of making people feel comfortable. Gail has this unbelievable knack to ask the question that you're asking at home. I've been told I could talk to a tree, and that's pretty much true. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. It didn't seem like anything could happen. Because nothing ever happens in East Palestine. But it did. Authorities released toxic fumes from five derailed train cars. Acute bronchitis due to chemical fumes. Did you ever have these problems before the derailment? No, ma'am. This neighborhood's not safe no more. We can assure the community that there's not vinyl chloride entering their communities. Then why are there so many people feeling these various symptoms of bloody noses or difficulty breathing and bronchitis? That's a hard question to answer. We're talking about one of the most blatant releases of a mixture of some of the most toxic chemicals that we've seen in America. I feel like now I have a duty to warn other communities. If my daughter has to watch me die of cancer, at least it saves someone else. This case. It's like a screenplay, something straight out of Hollywood. But it's not fiction. It's 48 hours. Human remains found this week. Four families shattered. There's no physical evidence. The mystery would haunt investigators for years. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Get it, it! Like a John Grisham novel. A gripping true crime original. 48 hours. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. This is CBS. Dukakis not only opposes the death penalty, he allowed first-degree murderers to have weekend passes from prison. One was Willie Horton, who murdered a boy in a robbery, stabbing him 19 times. Despite a life sentence, Horton received 10 weekend passes. Welcome back to America Decides. Those who've long followed politics on the impact of ads promising to fight crime, including the infamous Willie Horton ad you just saw there. Violent crime is down. Republicans continue campaigning on concerns about crime and violence. A recent poll found Latino voters, for example, gave former President Donald Trump an 11-point advantage over President Biden on fighting crime, but that gap is actually starting to narrow. Both the Democratic and Republican candidates in a recent race to replace Congressman George Santos out on Long Island campaigned on crime and immigration as well. Swazi and Biden's deep fund the police agenda has led to more crime and violence. I'll work across the aisle to do what our leaders haven't, secure our border. Close the routes used for illegal immigration. Let's bring in Insha Rockman. She serves as vice president of advocacy and partnerships at the Vera Institute of Justice. The organization says its mission is to end the over-criminalization and mass incarceration of people of color, immigrants, and the poor. Uh, thank you so much for being with us. Now, look, despite violent crime being down... Why is it that Republicans, you think, continue to win on this issue of crime and violence? So I'm going to challenge one thing you just said, Ed, which is that Republicans continue to win on this issue. So we just saw the Willie Horton ad. That was from 1988. And back then, indeed, running on crime was a winning issue. The GOP started hitting Michael Dukakis on crime and Willie Horton, and we saw Dukakis's multi-digit lead drop. And yet, what we see now is that voters have actually evolved since 1988, but the political strategy that both parties, the GOP runs hard on crime, they spend millions and millions of dollars on ads hitting Democrats on crime, and Democrats either run away from the issue or they run to the right thinking that's the best we can do. Turns out that voters aren't buying either strategy. And so I actually challenge uh, the notion that Republicans are winning on this issue because we have examples. We just saw 
uh, Swazi win in Long Island. Uh, he's a Democrat. He actually fought off the soft on crime attacks, the soft on the border attacks. And he did it actually not by running away from the issue or running to the right, but running on a new message, which is we can be serious about the things the American public cares about, which is safety, security, and stability. It's not about being tough or soft on crime or being tough or soft on the border. It's actually being serious about the issues that voters care about. So I actually think we've got to let go of that conventional political wisdom that tough on crime always works, that Democrats always lose. They lose when they are silent on the issue and they run away. They lose when they sound just like their opposition. They run to the right. But they win, like Tom Suozzi demonstrated, like many other Democrats have demonstrated in the past couple of years, when they turn the narrative away from right. tough or soft to actually serious. I, I want to show you something that's been airing, or at least a montage of things that have been airing uh, on Fox News in the last few days, and then we'll chat about it on the other side. Tonight, we will show you the latest record-breaking crime statistics, uh, the latest big crime carjackings. President Biden is staring down a raging border crisis that's bringing violent crime to America. New York City, the overrun of hotels and high schools, the organized crime gangs, the beating of cops, the squatting in homes, the revolving Rikers Island door. Part of this is, is that they're hearing a lot about this in the conservative media, right, or that it gets it gets brought up a lot there. And, and so these Republican candidates feel the need to talk about it. Your argument is, OK, fine. If that's what they're talking about, Democrats shouldn't shirk from that fight, shouldn't shirk from that conversation, should try to take it on, right? That's right. So Republicans have already signaled they're going to spend millions and millions of dollars on ads attacking Democrats for being soft on crime. We just saw President Trump last week in Michigan saying, you know, the border's out of control. Migrant crime is out of control. There's blood on the streets. What did you hear from President Biden and the Democrats? Pretty much nothing other than, well, there was a tough on the border deal that the GOP walked away from. But there's no multi-million dollar ad talking about what actually makes communities safe. So Democrats are unfortunately doing the thing that they often do, which is to run away from the issue or sort of run to the right. And it turns out, again, as I mentioned, uh, Swazi winning in Long Island, defeating literally millions and millions of dollars of ads calling him the defund candidate or calling him soft on crime. He did it not by going to the right and sounding just like his opposition, but you heard his first sentences, which is, we can find common ground, we can address the issues that matter to voters. And Ed, I want to point out in that stat you just showed about Latino voters, 31 percent prefer Trump on crime to 20 yep. percent. Biden. The most important thing to take away there is neither party is above majority. Neither party is above water. Voters actually think both parties are doing a bad job on this issue. Inter Rockman, thank you so much. That does it for today. We'll be back with another edition of America Decides tomorrow at 5 p.m. Eastern. You're streaming CBS News. Washington is the seat of power. Um, national security, foreign policy, global economics, every story comes through Washington in some way. We bring some of the most powerful voices in America to the table. We don't just ask the questions, you have to go deeper. We try to understand what's at the heart of the issue we're talking about to then come forward with solutions. Face the Nation on CBS. The justices ruled that Harvard and the University of North Carolina violated the Constitution. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to end affirmative action in college admissions, uncertainty sets in for some students of color. Affirmative action really gave us an equal opportunity. CBS Reports explores the historic decision and what it means for those chasing an opportunity to change their lives. I knew that college was the ticket to break this cycle. The end of affirmative action, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Sunday morning, Oscar winner Michael Douglas is Ben Franklin, plus the Who's Tommy on Broadway, and on the hunt for Thunder Eggs. Listen for the trumpet. I have a dorky look to me. I don't look like a criminal at all. 60 Minutes has reported on fraudsters, criminals, and hoodlums, but what this minor league thief was able to do surprised even us. These are Yogi Berra's World Series rings. A sports story you'll have to see to believe.
Welcome to CBS News Prime Time. I'm John Dickerson. Inflation is the house guest that won't leave. The more money you have, the more money you're inclined to spend, the more demand sort of supports high prices. Can't keep them down. Prices rise amid strong economic growth. Welcome, partner. Biden hosts Japan's leader, cementing ties to counter a rising China. Together, our countries are taking significant steps to strengthen defense security cooperation. Our ties have never been more robust. And 211, how the Americans who dial that number fit into our economic story. Hello, thank you for joining us. We begin our report at the grocery store, the gas pump, and the leasing office. All places where the Labor Department says you're spending more money than you were a year ago. Prices rose at an annual rate of 3.5% last month. That's the highest since September when inflation was at 3.7%. The cost of food is up 2.2% year over year. Gas prices rose 1.3% and housing costs are up 5.7%. The Federal Reserve now has to figure out how those numbers fit into its larger strategy to bring inflation down to just 2%. That could mean delaying interest rate cuts. CBS News senior business and technology correspondent Jolene Kent reports. For the third straight month, prices have gone up more than expected, from the rising cost of car insurance and repairs to how much you're paying at the grocery store every week. Do you know how much one of these costs? Two freaking dollars. This? was $200. We supposed to skip the power bill this month so we can buy groceries or the mortgage. Before the pandemic, all of these groceries, about 30 items, cost $100 on average. Now, five years later, according to Nielsen IQ, all this costs 33% more, meaning you'd have to skip about 10 items, like chicken, bread, milk, and bananas to make your $100 budget. Five years ago versus today, the difference is remarkable. Is that normal? Oh goodness, it's not normal at all. So that's why really consumers are really, really scrutinizing their behaviors because you know prices are leveling off, but they're leveling off at these record high levels. Higher gas prices and rent also helped push inflation up three and a half percent over the last year. Also more expensive, baby food and formula spiking nearly 10 percent, elder care up over 14 percent, and veterinary care jumping almost 10 percent. President Biden responding today. We're better situated than, than we were when we took office, where we, inflation was skyrocketing, and we have a plan to deal with it. But until then, shoppers continue to cut corners where they can. We asked Americans, have you changed your behavior? And 87% of Americans have said yes to that. We may be seeing more, you know, white meat on the barbecue than red meat this um, summer because beef prices have gone up 9%. Everybody's been impacted by this. There's no way you can get around it. The good news is that wage growth did outpace inflation last month, but the inflation number we saw in March was the biggest jump we've seen on an annual basis in six months, and that makes it very unlikely that the Federal Reserve will be cutting rates anytime soon. John. Jolene Kent in Los Angeles. Thank you. Later this hour, we'll take a deeper look at the inflation numbers and explore what it means for the Fed and the broader economy. Republican state lawmakers in Arizona blocked efforts by Democrats Wednesday to overturn a near-total abortion ban. The state policy is derived from a Civil War-era law from 1864. It comes as a number of national Republican leaders are now attempting to distance themselves from the move. CBS News Chief White House correspondent Nancy Cordes has the latest. Angry, let down. Frustrated. Anxiety in Arizona tonight after the state Supreme Court upheld an 1864 law that bans nearly all abortions and criminalizes those who perform the procedure. It's really upsetting that our politicians who are supposed to represent us are doing this. Democrats protested on the floor of the state legislature today. And with swing state Arizona up for grabs in November, some Republicans are slamming the ruling too, including former President Donald Trump, who just two days ago said abortion should be left to the states. 
today. He said Arizona went too far. And I'm sure that the governor and everybody else are going to bring it back into reason, and that will be taken care of. President, President Biden, who has vowed to restore Roe v. Wade, was asked today what his message is to Arizonans. Elect me. I'm in the 20th, 20th century, 21st century. The controversial law could go into effect in Arizona this summer forcing patients to travel to neighboring states with less restrictive laws. At the Camelback Family Planning Clinic in Phoenix, phones were ringing off the hook today. Calls from women concerned about abortion access. As long as we can pr practice medicine here, we will continue to provide services, whether that means that people need ultrasounds to see how far along they are to see if they do need to go to a different state. Arizona's highest court warned yesterday that doctors who perform the procedure could face between two to five years in prison, though the state's Democratic attorney general says she won't prosecute them. You are now having physicians who are scared to do their job that they did without batting an eye before the overturn of Roe. The uproar in Arizona is reigniting this issue at a national level, with Trump saying that he would not sign a national abortion ban if he were president, even if Congress sent one to his desk. But Democrats cast major doubt on that claim, noting, John, that he has repeatedly endorsed a ban at 20 weeks in the past. Nancy Cordes in Washington, thank you. CBS News producer Elizabeth Campbell joins us now from Phoenix. Elizabeth, you spoke recently with that uh, Arizona abortion provider, and let's play a little more of that real quick. It really makes me angry that we've been fighting this fight for so long. You know, we're tired. The folks like myself and my fellow abortion providers, the nurses, the front desk, our patient techs, all of us have been fighting day in and day out. Elizabeth, what more can you tell us about what providers in the state are dealing with? Well, the biggest thing they're dealing with, John, is just uncertainty. As you heard in Nancy's piece just then, there's still days before this could take effect. The attorney general here says that she won't prosecute any doctors who may perform abortions, but it still does become illegal. And that doctor told me she can't risk it. This is still her job. She still has her bills to pay. And so they're just dealing with the uncertainty of what happens next and will anything change. I appreciate your reporting, Elizabeth Campbell in Phoenix. Thank you. Police say at least three people were shot at an event celebrating the end of Ramadan in West Philadelphia Wednesday afternoon. Five people are in custody. The victims are a 22-year-old man and two juveniles. That includes an armed 15-year-old suspect who was shot by police. They are in stable condition. An eyewitness described the scene earlier. I was standing there. I walked in to go charge my phone. Everybody started running everywhere. Oh my gosh, they're shooting, they're shooting. Everybody's running over each other. I'm helping people up. It was crazy. A child who was near the shooting also broke his leg after being accidentally hit by a police car that was responding to the incident. The FBI is on its way to investigate alongside local police. Severe storms are sweeping across the southeast where residents are being warned about the possibility of hail and even tornadoes. Damage has already been reported in Texas and Louisiana. Strong winds have damaged strip malls and power lines in both states. New Orleans is seeing flooding. We're also monitoring potential tornadoes in Alabama, Mississippi, and Louisiana, which is where our Mark Strassman reports. Wow! As many as three tornadoes may have touched down in and around Slidell, Louisiana. Wind gusts of up to 110 miles per hour tore through the city, just north of New Orleans. It came too fast, it did a lot of damage, and it left fast. About 50 people needed rescuing after winds sheared the roof off an apartment building. And it happened really fast. Um, while we were trying to pack a few things, his, my ceiling caved in, his ceilings caved in. The damage is unbelievable. Officials in St. Tammany Parish reported the impact was catastrophic and extensive, with more than 100 buildings damaged. This storm was no joke. It's something that we haven't seen here in Slido in, in a very long time. Flash flooding in New Orleans swelled roads, overwhelming drivers, and marooning vehicles. As the storm moved east, this was the scene on I-10 in Mobile, Alabama. Water everywhere, flooding highways and causeways. 
It's the same storm system that lit up the sky overnight and brought heavy rain and hail to East Texas. In Port Arthur, a tornado flattened this church and another shredded this strip mall outside Houston. More than a foot of rain fell in some parts of the state and in Dallas, a month's worth of rain fell in just three hours. One death from the storm has been reported in Mississippi outside Jackson, where the storm churned a swath of downed trees and power lines. And Mark joins us now. Uh, Mark, tell us about what you're seeing on the ground and where are you? What's all that behind you? Uh, this is uh, Slidell, Louisiana, just outside New Orleans. This is a ruined uh, general contracting business. Uh, I talked to the wife of the owner who said that, you know, she had seen tornado damage only on television before, but it doesn't begin to compare with the power of the storm. And you see that it has ruined the business that you've put your, your, your heart and life into. Uh, we, the initial estimate here, John, is an EF1 tornado that winds up to 110 miles an hour. So what you're seeing here is a scarred landscape and a lot of shocked people walking around just like that woman who can't believe the damage that and how powerful um, nature can be. Yeah, it's shocking to look at what's behind you. What are the biggest areas that are, or the threats, I should say, heading into the area on Thursday? Okay, good news here, John, is that the damage, horrific as it is, is done. The threat is lifted, but the storm has moved east. And so, you know, the, that, that little corner of the world where Florida and Georgia and Alabama come together, they're under a tornado watch until 9 o'clock Eastern tonight. Mark Strassman in Slidell, Louisiana. Thank you so much, Mark. Wednesday marks the end of Ramadan with the prospect of an Israeli invasion of Rafa in southern Gaza looming as it was when the Muslim holy month started. A top Hamas leader says an Israeli airstrike killed three of his own sons. Meanwhile, an Israeli official tells CBS News Hamas has not been able to locate 40 Israeli hostages that would have been released in a potential ceasefire deal. CBS News foreign correspondent Deborah Pata reports. Palestinians pray amidst the rubble and ruin of Gaza, marking the end of Ramadan with the Muslim holiday of Eid al-Fitr. For many, the day was spent in mourning at the grave sites of loved ones killed in over half a year of war. It's enough, God, Anam Abda sobbed, enough with war. Instead of a joyful occasion filled with children's laughter, for this grandmother, it was a day of heartbreak, as she said a final farewell to her grandchildren while their father cradles the body of his youngest son. His wife and three children were killed in central Gaza. And for Hamas chief Ishmael Haniyeh, the conflict became personal. This is the moment he received the news that his three adult sons and four grandchildren were killed in an Israeli airstrike. As the war drags on and the humanitarian crisis worsens, the wider the rift grows between the U.S. and Israel, with President Biden yesterday sharply criticizing the way Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu was conducting this war. I think what he's doing is a mistake. And today reiterating that he expected Netanyahu to make good on his promise to flood Gaza with aid. And the fact is that we're, uh, we're getting in somewhere in the last three days over 100 trucks. It's not enough. The rift between the U.S. and Israel comes at a precarious time. Tonight, we are learning that the commander of U.S. forces in the Middle East is heading to Israel amid increasing concerns that Iran is preparing to launch a major attack against Israel in retaliation for last week's bombing of the Iranian consulate in Damascus. John? Deborah Pata in Tel Aviv. Thank you. Forever chemicals are linked to cancer and developmental harm in kids. They've gotten into the water supply and the government is now stepping in. New standards will mean many towns and cities will need to make some upgrades. Plus, what do Jeff Bezos, Bill Clinton and Robert De Niro all have in common? Well, they're all eating ribeye at the White House with Japan's prime minister. More on the state visit ahead. You're streaming CBS News Primetime.
Mr. President, there's a lot to talk about. A lot to talk about. Does this carrier strike group stand ready? It's just incredible to see there's an active search and rescue operation going on 12 hours after this accident. The CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. I had progressively fallen deeper into the world of online sports betting. The risk is the rush. What do you think is driving the spike in popularity? I think it's legality. If it's legal, I'm going to use it. There are ways to bet when you are 18. We've created an epidemic of child gambling. You can't walk into a male dormitory in a college campus without sports betting happening. It's America's most neglected problem. I use sports betting as a way to escape, when in reality, I'm choosing self-destruction. Whatever I had left, it was gone. The purpose of the industry is to get you to play to extinction. And that means until all your money is gone. Stories start with the who, what, when, and where. But it's why it's important to you that matters most. Knowing what to ask is how you open the door to a deeper understanding. See you on Primetime, streaming free everywhere. An original documentary from CBS Reports. That desired farm is a wonderful place to raise children, and it still is. Promises broken. Black Americans have been the target of racism and discrimination pretty much from the time they acquired ownership in the land. Costing black farmers hundreds of billions in generational wealth. They did everything to make sure we were run off that land. But communities are uniting to continue the fight. Collective ownership is powerful to keep their land and their dreams alive. To watch my children play on land that we own means everything. To land is power. Most definitely. 40 Acres and a Mule, now streaming on the free CBS News app. People with developmental disabilities were once sequestered by the hundreds of thousands in institutions. Many of our fellow citizens are suffering tremendously because lack of attention, lack of imagination, lack of uh, adequate manpower. Disability activists have since torn down barriers blocking them from living at home or in the community. We conclude that Title II of the ADA requires states to provide community-based treatment for persons with mental disabilities. But of the 16,000 people who remain in state-operated institutions, half are in five states, and Illinois is one of them. I don't want to live in the institution. It makes me feel discriminated against. Do you think there are people living in institutions in Illinois that don't need to be living there? Yeah, because they're proving it as soon as they get out. Former Trump Organization CFO Alan Weisselberg has been sentenced to five months in a New York jail as a part of a plea agreement. Weisselberg pleaded guilty to two felony counts of perjury in March he admitted to providing false testimony on the size of the former president's New York apartment. The 76-year-old served 100 days in jail last year for evading taxes on $1.7 million in Trump company perks. As a part of this deal in the perjury case, prosecutors have agreed not to call Weisselberg as a witness in the former president's criminal hush money trial that's beginning on Monday. Prosecutors say they will delay the bribery trial of New Jersey Senator Bob Menendez. The Democratic lawmaker asked to push back his May 6th trial, citing unspecified health concerns with his wife, who will need surgery in the coming weeks. Prosecutors want to try Menendez, his wife, and three other co-defendants together. Menendez is facing federal bribery and obstruction charges for allegedly accepting gifts in exchange for political favors to foreign governments. He has pleaded not guilty. Kevin McCarthy is blaming one of his former colleagues for being ousted from his role as House Speaker. I'll give you the truth why I'm not Speaker. It's because one person, a member of Congress, wanted me to stop an ethics complaint because he slept with a 17-year-old. An ethics complaint that started before I ever became Speaker, and that's illegal, and I'm not going to get in the middle. The former speaker is referring to Florida Representative Matt Gates, who has been accused of having sex with a minor. If you'll remember, Gates led the successful effort to remove McCarthy from the speakership last October. Gates responded to the comments calling McCarthy a, quote, liar. President Biden used all of the tools of hospitality to announce deeper ties with Japan. He welcomed Prime Minister Fumio Kishida. 
to the White House Wednesday for a day of meetings capped with a lavish state dinner. The two leaders announced plans to upgrade military command and control operations, integrate their air defense networks, and bring Japan along for a U.S. mission to the moon. Together, our countries are taking significant steps to strengthen defense security cooperation. We're modernizing command and control structures, and we're increasing the interoperability and planning of our militaries so they can work together in a seamless and effective way. This is the most significant upgrade in our alliance since the end of, since it was first established. CBS News senior White House correspondent Weijia Zhang joins me now from the White House. Weijia, much of this visit is about bolstering military cooperation between the U.S. and Japan, but the two countries already have a relationship. So what's changing now? Well, this is exactly how they are framing it, John, that this is really upgrading the existing relationship between these two militaries. And so there will be uh, more of an integration between the two militaries. The Pentagon will work out those details, especially to upgrade the current U.S. command center in Japan, which hosts about 54,000 U.S. troops. And they also have plans to work with Australia to establish a joint air defense system, as well as look at ways to produce defense weapons together. So it's all about expanding on what already exists. And the two leaders, as I understand it, are having, meeting with, are having a meeting with the Philippines on Thursday. So what's, what's everybody meeting about and having all these defense arrangements about? Well, John, they're going to make announcements to talk about strategic partnerships, about the economy, about the South China Sea. And that really is what all of this hinges on, even though the president didn't talk at length about Beijing. It certainly was the undercurrent and the backdrop of both today's meeting and tomorrow's trilateral meeting, because it's all about showing a uh, stance together. It's about showing cooperation and that there is an alliance between these countries as China continues to ramp up its aggression in the South China Sea, especially when it comes to the Philippines. There have been several physical encounters with the Chinese Coast Guard and uh, vessels that belong to the Philippines. And so they want to send a message that they are essentially teammates and they are watching very closely what happens uh, in that part of the region with China. It, it, and John, I have to say, the Japanese prime minister almost summed it up perfectly when he said, uh, you know, they were talking about the conflict in Ukraine. He said today it could be Ukraine and yeah. tomorrow it could be the East, East Asia. And, and so they are eyeing this very closely. And speaking of backdrop, we should let our viewers know that while you were giving that wonderful answer, behind you was both the Honor Guard and the president's own Marine Band, which is all there for uh, the state dinner tonight, I would imagine. That's why everybody's there. Um, let me ask you the last question, uh, Weijia, which is that um, there is this uh, Nippon Steel deal to buy um, U.S. Steel, uh, Japanese company. Was there discussion of that? It's a political, the president is against that deal, we should note. And um, was there any uh, discussion of that in uh, today's meeting? Well, both leaders were asked directly about this, and they tried to brush it off. The Japanese uh, prime minister saying that he believes the parties are still talking about it, and he hopes that it will ultimately result in a union that benefits both the U.S. and Japan. The president just said that he reaffirmed his commitment to American workers. You're right in that he opposed this deal because Japan would be acquiring U.S. steel, which really has a legacy here in the United States. And of course, uh, Biden, especially candidate Biden, um, has pledged so much support for steel workers to stay in this country. And so even though the company itself would remain headquartered in Pittsburgh, um, there are a lot of questions about how that might influence labor agreements, for example, and how, you know, day-to-day -day life is for those workers. So um, surely they talked about it in public. They didn't want to draw too much attention to this uh, tension as they talked in public, because you're right, John, when there is a state visit, there is a lot of diplomacy, there's a lot of work behind the scenes, and to your point, a lot of pomp and circumstance, because of course it all ends in a fancy state dinner happening here at the White House. That's right, and if you're, you're lucky, the U.S. Marine Corps Band will strike up and practice, and uh, you'll get to hear it. <laughs> Weijia Zhang at the White House, thank you so much. Thanks.
And just across the Korea Strait, from Japan, South Korea's liberal opposition parties are expected to win a majority of seats in the country's parliamentary election on Wednesday. If they succeed, conservative president Yoon suk Yeol could spend his last three years in office as a lame duck. Exit polls by South Korea's three major TV stations forecast the liberal opposition will win up to 170, excuse me, 197 seats in the 300-member National Assembly. Another new Liberal Party is expected to win up to 14 seats. With that, the opposition will have legislative powers to pass bills vetoed by the president and can even impeach him. We're still learning about how the human race reacted to the eclipse. Tuesday, we told you that some people did not listen to their mothers and looked directly into the sun. That may be where the fun is, but internet searches for eye pain informed us that the moment was long-lasting. Some people, however, were not searching for anything online at all. According to Cloudfare, in comparison to the week prior, total U.S. internet traffic along the path of the totality was down 12 percent at 3 p.m. Eastern, proving that mankind can pull itself away from the machines when wonder arises. On the other hand, it took the movement of celestial bodies to do it, and we won't have the same chance for another 20 years. Markets turning red over the latest inflation numbers. Coming up, why prices are still rising and what the Fed might or might not do about it. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. Nate has one of the quickest minds I've ever seen. Tony has a way of making people feel comfortable. Gail has this unbelievable knack to ask the question that you're asking at home. I've been told I could talk to a tree, and that's pretty much true. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings, weekdays at 7. It didn't seem like anything could happen because nothing ever happens in East Palestine, but it did. Authorities released toxic fumes from five derailed train cars. Acute bronchitis due to chemical fumes. Did you ever have these problems before the derailment? No, ma'am. This neighborhood's not safe no more. We can assure the community that there's not vinyl chloride entering their communities. Then why are there so many people feeling these various symptoms of bloody noses or difficulty breathing and bronchitis? That's a hard question to answer. We're talking about one of the most blatant releases of a mixture of some of the most toxic chemicals that we've seen in America. I feel like now I have a duty to warn other communities. If my daughter has to watch me die of cancer, at least it saves someone else. This case. It's like a screenplay, something straight out of Hollywood. But it's not fiction. It's 48 hours. Human remains found this week. Four families shattered. There's no physical evidence. The mystery would haunt investigators for years. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Get it, like a John Grisham novel. A gripping true crime original. 48 hours. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. This is CBS. The thrill of a lifetime. Seeing the Earth from space, it was so exhilarating. But the risks that come with the territory. There have been four fatal accidents. That's a 1% fatal accident rate. Might make you look before you launch. If you had one out of 100 airplanes falling out of the sky, we'd have a public crisis. Space Tourism, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Welcome back to CBS News Primetime. I'm John Dickerson. Here are some additions to our top stories. Donald Trump's third attempt at trying to delay his upcoming criminal trial in New York has been rejected. 
He asked for a delay because the judge won't recuse and has refused to put the case on hold while the Supreme Court weighs in on his immunity claim. The hush money trial is set to begin on Monday. Georgia Republican Congresswoman Marjorie Taylor Greene met with House Speaker Mike Johnson Wednesday. It was their first meeting since Greene introduced a resolution to remove him from office. Over the Speaker's handling of Ukraine aid, which she opposes, and reauthorization of Foreign National Security Surveillance Authority, which she believes threatens Americans. Green said she left the talks with no guarantees on those issues. The annual inflation rate hit 3.5% last month. That's the highest it's been since September. With prices on the rise, it could mean the Federal Reserve will hold off on cutting interest rates. The Dow Jones fell 400 points on Wednesday. Let's bring in Martin Backerdax. He's the senior editor and chief markets correspondent at The Street. Oh, Martin, why'd it go up? <laughs> That's a great question. John, we saw a massive bet in the bond futures market yesterday, and that usually means that someone is trying to hedge themselves against a surprise. So we were braced for this kind of movement to the upside, but I don't think anybody expected it to be this fast, and I think that's why you see the reaction. If you're digging into the numbers, though, essentially what we're seeing is that the quicker inflation is tied to a stronger economy. There's no question about that. But we are seeing price pressures in things like hospital services, uh, in insurance and in rents. And those are things that don't necessarily have much of an influence with respect to Fed interest rates. So they could stay hot for a number of months now. And that really what ha that's sort of what has markets worried right now. And so so that's really interesting. So what do you think this means for the Federal Reserve, particularly if it's items that Federal Reserve policy doesn't maybe necessarily affect directly? This is where they find themselves, John, and it really is a difficult situation because they had primed the markets for three rate cuts this year. And as we sit now, it's very likely that we're going to have the longest gap between the last rate hike and the first rate cut on record. And that's, of course, if we get something in July. It might be September. It might be beyond. So the Fed is going to have to sit tight, preach more patience to an impatient market as it looks to see how some of these influences filter through into the economy. Gratefully, growth is still solid. We're adding jobs. Activity is quite strong. And we're seeing a decent amount of consumer spending. But all of that, John, comes with a price. And in this case, it is that faster inflation. And so everybody's impatient for the rate cuts. Uh, remind us why it's a bad idea or to cut rates too early or why it could be a bad idea to cut rates too early. There's an old joke, John, that says the Fed tends to go up the escalator when it comes to raising rates and down the elevator when it comes to cutting them. In other words, they like to be in a singular direction, and therefore they are quite careful when they pivot. They don't want to pivot and then have to raise again if it turns out that they were incorrect about inflation. And they've already been caught on the back foot with that transitory debacle from a couple of years ago as we exited the pandemic. So they do want to be absolutely precise as to the timing of the cuts, but as I say, they are having to speak to a market which has been betting on six cuts, pared those bets down to three, and now is likely looking at two and maybe even one. And John, one of them is very likely to come smack in the middle of the presidential campaign in the fall. Which will have its own, uh, the, the market will belch a couple of times if that happens. What it, Help us think about the broader economy here, um, what the Fed's action or lack of action will mean for the broader economy. As you say, the economy is quite strong. Um, so what, how should we think through this next period now that we have these new numbers? And as you've so clearly laid out, we might not have cuts for a while. This is just it. I, I think, John, that you're serving two masters at the point if you're the Fed. Firstly, you have to deal with market anticipation and their assumption that a rate cut is going to come in the fall. But at the same time, if a rate cut does come more quickly, that's probably not going to be good news for most Americans because it would suggest that the economy is slowing into the second half of the year. There isn't much signal to that effect at the moment. As you noted, 303,000 new jobs were added to the economy last month. Activity benchmarks are, are looking strong and consumers are relatively confident. But if there is a change and there are some cracks deep underneath that economists are warning about and we start to get a slowdown into the second half of the year, then the Fed might find itself in a very difficult quandary where inflation is still high, mm. but growth is slowing. And no longer do we have a soft landing, but we have the specter of stagflation. And that's absolutely something no one wants. Right. Exactly. The worst of all worlds. Martin Backerdax with The Street. Thank you so much. 
Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas spent the day on Capitol Hill Wednesday discussing funding for his department. He urged the passing of President Biden's 2025 budget proposal, which includes billions in emergency funds for border security. Mayorkas also called on Congress to work on a bipartisan border agreement after Republicans blocked a deal earlier this year. Our administration worked closely with a bipartisan group of senators to reach agreement on a national security supplemental package, one that would make the system changes that are needed and give DHS the tools and resources needed to meet today's border security challenges. We remain ready to work with you to pass this tough, fair, bipartisan agreement. Illegal border crossings have gone down. Border Patrol apprehended around 137,000 people last month, a drop from nearly 141,000 in February. House Republicans plan on sending articles of impeachment against Mayorkas to the Senate next week over his handling of the border. In 1955, Mamie Till opened her murdered son Emmett's casket because she said she wanted the world to see what was going on in Mississippi. Nearly 70 years later, on Wednesday, the world saw a reckoning with what is still going on in the state of Mississippi. One former police officer and five former sheriff's deputies were sentenced to jail time, ranging from 15 to 45 years for an attack on two black men they were sworn to protect. The Justice Department says the officers kicked in the door of the victim's home. The probable cause? They lived with a white woman. The officers called the men racial slurs, tased them, and assaulted them. One of the men was shot in the mouth. The officers later pleaded guilty to state and federal charges for their crimes. They'll serve the time for the state offenses alongside their federal sentences, which range from 10 to 40 years. Amanda Knox, the American jailed, then cleared of killing her roommate while studying abroad in Italy in 2007, is back on trial. Knox and her then-boyfriend served four years in an Italian prison for the murder of British student Meredith Kircher. They were both exonerated in 2015. However, Knox was convicted of slander for falsely accusing a local bar owner in Perugia, Italy, of killing Kircher. She is hoping this trial will remove any doubt about her innocence, and Knox's lawyers say she does plan on testifying at some point. For the first time, the Biden administration has laid out federal standards to limit so-called forever chemicals in the drinking water. As our Ben Tracy explains, the move is an effort to prevent serious illness and death. Everyone should be able to turn on their tap and trust that the water that they're drinking and giving their children is safe. EPA Administrator Michael Regan announced a new drinking water standard in North Carolina where in 2017 it was discovered a chemical plant had been contaminating the local water supply by dumping PFAS into a nearby river. It was gut-wrenching to when we first learned about our contamination crisis. Emily Donovan lives near the river and has been fighting for PFAS regulations for years. How concerned have you been about the water you and your children have been drinking all these years? I mean, I've been terrified. No mother wants to be told that she contaminated her children. An estimated 200 million Americans are exposed to PFAS chemicals through drinking water. These forever chemicals last for thousands of years and are used in everything from food packaging to water-resistant clothing and cosmetics. They've been linked to certain cancers, liver damage, and developmental issues in children. You can't smell these chemicals, you can't taste them, you can't see them. So that's why these new rules are so important. Now, water utilities must reduce PFAS levels to near zero in the next five years. The EPA says 6 to 10 percent of the 66,000 public drinking water systems will likely need to make changes to comply. That could cost billions of dollars. The American Water Works Association, which represents the utilities, says polluters, not communities, should be held responsible. But for Emily Donovan... This, I think, is a, is a monumental... Um, change in how we look at public water in America. What matters is making the water safe to drink. Ben Tracy, CBS News, Los Angeles. The federal poverty line for a family of four is roughly $31,000, but United Way says that same family may need quadruple that amount just to get by. 
The disparity leaves many Americans in search of financial assistance. Ahead, we'll tell you about the workers who answer their calls for help. You're streaming CBS News Primetime. Washington is the seat of power. Um, national security, foreign policy, global economics, every story comes through Washington in some way. We bring some of the most powerful voices in America to the table. We don't just ask the questions, you have to go deeper. We try to understand what's at the heart of the issue we're talking about to then come forward with solutions. Face the Nation on CBS. The justices ruled that Harvard and the University of North Carolina violated the Constitution. In the aftermath of the Supreme Court decision to end affirmative action in college admissions, uncertainty sets in for some students of color. Affirmative action really gave us an equal opportunity. CBS Reports explores the historic decision and what it means for those chasing an opportunity to change their lives. I knew that college was the ticket to break this cycle. The end of affirmative action, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Okay, let's go. You guys good? Hey. All right, we good? Keep going. It's the clock, it's ticking. Off we go. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. 60 minutes. <laughs> it's time for 60 Minutes, Sundays on CBS. An original documentary from CBS Reports. AI is among the most world-changing technologies ever. Curing diseases, scientific breakthroughs, making lives better. It can help us with medical discovery, scientific discoveries, doing better agriculture, having cures for things like Alzheimer's. It's also going to really transform the way we work. The uplifting potential of artificial intelligence is limitless. It gives you a friend, somebody to chat with 24-7 that is non-judgmental. He makes me feel loved and desired. And so are its downfalls. The problem with all this AI is that it's unpredictable and uncontrollable. The choices we make now will have lasting effects for decades, maybe even centuries. The ChatGPT revolution, now streaming on the free CBS News app. We are about to see American weapons in the hands of Mexican cartels. A gun pipeline to Mexico. We are arming the cartels. 100%, no doubt about it. Happening right under our noses. Uh, who's doing something about this? Nobody. A CBS Reports exclusive. Most Americans have no idea that we are effectively arming the enemy next door. This is the story the American people need to know. Arming cartels, now streaming on the free CBS News app. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education, both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bring you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides, Monday through Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. When you have a medical emergency, you call 911. But what happens in an economic emergency when you have to choose between paying your hospital bill and groceries for your family? The Wall Street Journal reports Americans are turning to 211, a social service helpline. Rachel Wolf spoke to some of those who work that help uh, that line. She is a consumer trends reporter for the Wall Street Journal. Thank you so much for joining us. It was such a fascinating story. What can you tell us about 211 and why people are turning to it? People are not able to make ends meet at levels far higher than what the federal poverty line represents, these call center operators were telling me. I got the chance to spend the day at a call center outside Hartford. And it was really staggering to hear the types of things that people were calling in about, just utterly unable to afford their basic needs at a time when the federal poverty line indicates that people should be getting by okay. The number of people under it really hasn't budged. So, Rachel, when they were calling in, what were some of the, um, what were some of the, the, the balances they were trying to, to meet or some of the challenges they were trying to meet? So people call in to two-on-one about all sorts of different things, people experiencing homelessness who need to find a caretaker for their medical needs, 
What I've focused on for my story, though, is the population of people who are calling in in increasing and very large numbers who live above the federal poverty line of $31,200, but under what they call this ALICE line, or Asset Limited Income Constrained Employed. And these are people who are working, but still unable to pay their rent and their car payment and everything else, and still have anything left over at the end of the month. So that's essentially what what's sometimes called the, the working poor, uh, who are, um, and, and what kind of a position, if you are in the working poor, what is that, how do, what kind of a fix does that put you in if you are not below the federal poverty line, but um, based on this, this Alice threshold, you're not living a life that anybody would, would define as kind of being out of poverty. Right. It's hard because most people in this group are not eligible for any services whatsoever. Most federal and state assistance is based on the federal poverty line. And again, according to the federal poverty line, there aren't more families living in poverty than there were 10 years ago. There are, however, way more Alice families. And again, these people are not eligible for the types of services that people under the poverty line are. They could be making $1 above the poverty line, or they could be making, in Connecticut, the bare minimum cost of living is as high as $126,000 for a family of four with two young kids having to pay for childcare. So it's a pretty big range. Uh, and it's, again, all people who are working very hard and just can't make it make it work. And and one of the things that's so interesting about the 211 calls is that, you know, navigating, even if there are uh, benefits that might be available to you, navigate, navigating them while you're trying to hold down a job or or find housing is itself a nightmare. Um, were there, for some of the callers, were there some um, help that, that the, those who answered the phone were able to get them to? Or, in other words, was it a lack of um, knowledge of what was out there? Uh, or was it mostly what, you've been, what we've been talking about, which is really they just don't qualify because of the income? It's really that they just don't qualify. 211 is amazing. They're able to route people to thousands of different services and providers. There are local 211s all across the country, and they help with truly anything you can possibly imagine, including people calling in about tax questions, identity theft. and But the people who they are really struggling to help are those who are not eligible for benefits. Where benefits exist, 211 operators are able to connect people to them. It's this group that's calling in, out of millions of calls that they receive every year, they said that this is really becoming one of the biggest shares, and they're hard-pressed to help. Rachel Wolf, Consumer Trends reporter for The Wall Street Journal, thank you so much for your reporting. A new survey finds Americans estimate they'll need to save $1.46 million to retire comfortably. But that same survey by Northwestern Mutual finds people have an average of $88,400 in their retirement accounts. According to our business analyst, Jill Schlesinger, some tips for retirement include this mildly complicated math. Calculate your current spending level and your future expenses, and then how long you think you'll live. Then subtract any income assistance you may receive, like Social Security and pensions. If there are still expenses left over after that subtraction, and what you're saving and investing won't cover those expenses, you have a few options. Two options, really. You can spend less now or work longer later. You could also plan a post-retirement career that provides additional income, low stress, and hopefully a little joy as well. They stepped up to the plate when the men went to war. Up next, we meet the real-life Rosie the Riveters as they receive a special honor in Washington. You're streaming CBS News Primetime.
Sunday morning, actor Kirsten Dunst, plus Wayne Brady on Broadway, and a beloved cherry tree named Stumpy. Go to the ends of the earth. Right now. We got something crazy. <laughs> and reach for the stars. Here we are. <laughs> Tom. Yes, it's my comeback. <laughs> <laughs> hey, this is pretty fun. But wait, there's more. Experience thought-provoking. Welcome to the idea of being a human being. Innovative da -da -da. and truly original That's reporting. Great. Look through a telescope and go, wow. Because there's always something new under the sun on CBS Sunday Morning. At this moment, terrorists could be plotting another attack. 9-11 triggered a counter-terrorist system that included a secret database. This person needs a closer look. A growing list of nearly 2 million people, including some Americans who say they're innocent. For one hour flight, I have to spend six hours to go and come back. CBS Reports explores the system, the people responsible for it, and those pushing for change. I'm not fighting against them. I'm fighting for them to do the right thing. The Watch List, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Don't miss true crime anytime you want, anywhere you go. With the 48 Hours Podcast. Real crimes, real lives, real justice. There's some questions that have to be asked and need to be answered. Listen to 48 Hours on Apple Podcasts. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Imagine yourself in Manhattan with no police, no army, no mayor. The people of Haiti stare down poverty, corruption, natural disasters, and violence. 90% of the guns that are used by gangs in Haiti are American guns. But with an unbreakable spirit and eternal optimism. There are days where I cry, but we can't be discouraged. We still believe in Haiti. They're still able to look ahead with hope. Haiti is on the brink of transformation, a radical shift. Asians are coming together and saying things must change. Fighting for Haiti, now streaming on the free CBS News app. Everybody wakes up in the morning and they are pelted with alerts that frighten them, news that agitates them. With this show, we have the time to explain what's going on. These migrants, they've been released. Explain the status that allows them to be released, to slow things down a little bit. What are the big sets of questions for China and its ambitions? Hackers are stepping up their attacks to extort victims. Let's start with easy. Who's attacking? Here's a deeper understanding of what's happening. Prime Time with John Dickerson. Stream on the free CBS News app. When you wake up in the morning, we want to be your go-to team. On our places, bright, shiny faces. I don't go to work in the morning. I go for coffee with my two good friends, and we talk about the world. Your morning routine just got better. CBS Mornings. Tara Vanderveer, the NCAA's winningest basketball coach, is retiring after a legendary 45-year career. Vanderveer won three national championships as head coach of the Stanford women's team. She also won over 1,200 games. She was inducted into both the Naismith and Women's Basketball Halls of Fame. She also won five National Coach of the Year awards. We all know the image of Rosie the Riveter flexing her muscles in her polka dot bandana. She represented the more than six million women who joined the workforce during World War II. On Wednesday, the real-life Rosies were honored with the Congressional Gold Medal. Here's Natalie Brand. It's an honor decades in the making. I'm so proud to be able to symbolically accept this medal for all of you. This group of women bonded through their work during World War II, recognized today by congressional leaders for their initiative and patriotism. We felt it was very important work at that time. Dorothy Boggess of Washington, D.C., who turns 107 next month, worked as a typist and correspondence clerk for the Department of Defense. We were answering letters from families who were concerned about their families overseas. Sylvia Tannis of Michigan, just shy of 99, lied about her age during the war to get a job at a Ford plant working on the B-25 bomber. I was putting the, the what was called the de-icer on the B-25, it was all women, I and mean, we didn't know we were Rosies. We were just 
Riveters. <laughs> Ernestine Ween of California, one of the youngest Rosies at 96, labored in agriculture while still in high school. I says, what did I do? And, uh, but I thought, well, I'm out here and I'm working for the war effort, so that's important and I'm sticking it out. What does it mean to get that gold medal? It means I did my country good during the war, that I helped somehow. The women also share a bond of having loved ones, husbands and brothers who served. Women particularly hadn't been noticed as much as the men that were into service. The Rosies say their work on the home front made a difference too. Natalie Brand, CBS News, Washington. The CBS Evening News streams after a break. I'm John Dickerson. You're streaming CBS News. Sunday morning, actor it. Kirsten Dunst, plus Wayne Brady on Broadway, and a beloved cherry tree named Stumpy. Okay, so let's just start at the beginning. Well, let me start with this. What is at stake here? What is the answer then? Do you know why? You want me to just keep going? Is that a good thing or a bad thing? Were there death threats? How is this possible? What's wrong with that argument? Are you saying they lied? Have you told the government that? Why won't you say the word crisis? You're not no. answering my question. This really is. is that scary? Does that make sense? What do you mean? What does that mean? Did any of that make what sense? You What's your response? What happened? Why? 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 It's time for the CBS News Original 60 Minutes, Sunday on CBS and streaming on Paramount+. Plus. There is no more room in our city. New York City is receiving record numbers of migrants. Today, we're going to have more than 500 adults and children come through that door. Tensions rise as shelters reach max capacity. We don't have to take care of them. CBS Reports goes inside a crisis cities and families are facing as they fight to survive. The United States still has that glimmer of hope for people to come here. Fighting for a future. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. On Face the Nation, the way to learn is to listen. We may have a recession. Listening to how someone explains themselves is so key to understanding their perspective. An original documentary from CBS Reports. Since you started La Soup in 2014, do you have any sense as to how much food you've rescued from the landfill? We've rescued four and a half million pounds. I can't even fathom how much food that is. And that's one little person in one little city in America. We're going to call this chicken piccata. We did 450 of these meals today. This is the exact dish that, that you and I are going to have. Yep. Oh my god. Is it good? Mm-hmm. Having a plan of how to keep people fed should be in every single city. So if we eliminated food waste, could we eliminate hunger? Yes. Eating trash. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. America decides, taking you inside American democracy. The most important stories on a day-to-day, hour-to-hour basis. You're going to hear a lot of reporting. It is clearly a pivotal moment. Gun control, the economy, education. Both sides of the political aisle fight it out for power. Bringing you the analysis that you need. Thoughtfully, with context. Be part of the conversation. On CBS News Streaming. Welcome to America Decides. This is CBS. 